Preface of Korea and Her Neighbors. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in September 2020. Korea and Her Neighbors. A narrative of travel with an account of the recent vicissitudes and present position of the country by Isabella Bird Bishop, Fellow of the Royal Geographic Society, author of Unbeaten Tracks in Japan, etc. With a preface by Sir Walter C. Hillier, Knight Commander of the Order of St. Michael and St. George, late British Consul General for Korea. Preface I have been honoured by Mrs. Bishop with an invitation to preface her book on Korea with a few introductory remarks. Mrs. Bishop is too well known as a traveller and a writer to require any introduction to the reading public, but I am glad to be afforded an opportunity of endorsing the conclusions she has arrived at after a long and intimate study of a people whose isolation during many centuries renders a description of their character, institutions and peculiarities especially interesting at the present stage of their history. Those who, like myself, have known Korea from its first opening to foreign intercourse will thoroughly appreciate the closeness of Mrs. Bishop's observation, the accuracy of her facts and the correctness of her inferences. The facilities enjoyed by her have been exceptional. She has been honoured by the confidence and friendship of the King and the late Queen in a degree that has never before been accorded to any foreign traveller and has had access to valuable sources of information placed at her disposal by the foreign community of Seoul, official, missionary, and mercantile, while her presence in the country during and subsequent to the war between China and Japan, of which Korea was, in the first instance, the stage, has furnished her the opportunity of recording with accuracy and impartiality many details of an episode in far eastern history which have hitherto been clouded by misstatement and exaggeration the hardships and difficulties encountered by mrs bishop during her journeys into the interior of korea have been lightly touched upon by herself admire the courage patience and endurance that enabled her to overcome them it must be evident to all who know anything of korea that a condition of tutelage, in some form or another, is now absolutely necessary to her existence as a nation. The nominal independence won for her by the force of Japanese arms is a privilege she is not fitted to enjoy while she continues to labour under the burden of an administration that is hopelessly and superlatively corrupt. The role of mentor and guide exercised by China with that lofty indifference to local interests that characterizes her treatment of all her tributaries, was undertaken by Japan after the expulsion of the Chinese armies from Korea. The efforts of the Japanese to reform some of the most glaring abuses, though somewhat roughly applied, were undoubtedly earnest and genuine, but, as Mrs. Bishop has shown, experience was wanting, and one of the Japanese agents did incalculable harm to his country's cause by falling a victim to the spirit of intrigue, which seems almost inseparable from the diplomacy of Orientals. Force of circumstances compelled Russia to take up the task begun by Japan, the king having appealed in his desperation to the Russian representative for rescue from a terrorism which might well have cowed a stronger and a braver man. The most partial of critics will admit that the powerful influence which the presence of the king in the house of their representative might have enabled the Russian government to exert has been exercised through their minister with almost disappointing moderation. Nevertheless, through the instrumentality of Mr. Mlevy Brown, Doctor of Laws, head of the Korean Customs and financial adviser to the government, an Englishman whose great ability as an organiser and administrator is recognised by all residents in the farther east, the finances of the country have been placed in a condition of equilibrium that has never before existed. 
while numerous other reforms have been carried out by Mr. Brown and others with the cordial support and cooperation of the Russian minister, irrespective of the nationality of the agent employed. Much, however, still remains to be done, and the only hope of advance in the direction of progress, initiated, it is only fair to remember, by Japan, and continued under Russian auspices, is to maintain an iron grip which the Russian agents so far have been more careful than their Japanese predecessors to conceal beneath a velvet glove. The condition of Korean settlers in Russian territory described by Mrs. Bishop shows how capable these people are of improving their condition under wise and paternal rule, and, setting all political considerations aside, there can be no doubt that the prosperity of the people and their general comfort and happiness would be immensely advanced under an extension of this patronage by one or other civilized power. Without some form of patronage or control, call it by what name we will, a lapse into the old groove of oppression, extortion, and its concomitant miseries is inevitable. Mrs. Bishop's remarks on missionary work in China and Korea, based as they are on personal and sympathetic observation, will be found of great value to those who are anxious to arrive at a correct appreciation of Christian enterprise in these remote regions. Descriptions of missionaries and their doings are too often marred by exaggerations of success on the one hand, which are perhaps the natural outcome of enthusiasm, and harsh and frequently unjust criticisms on the other, commonly indulged in by those who base their conclusions upon observation of the most superficial kind. Speaking from my own experience, I have no hesitation in saying that closer inquiry would dispel many of the illusions about the futility of missionary work that are, unfortunately, too common, and that missionaries would, as a rule, welcome sympathetic inquiry into their methods of work, which most of them will frankly admit to be capable of improvement. But, while courting friendly criticism, they may reasonably object to be judged by those who have never taken the trouble to study their system, or to interest themselves in the objects they have in view. In Mrs. Bishop they have an advocate whose testimony may be commended to the attention of all who are disposed to regard missionary labor as, at the best, useless or unnecessary. In Korea, at all events, to go no farther, it is to missionaries that we are assuredly indebted for almost all we know about the country. It is they who have awakened in the people the desire for material progress and enlightenment that has now happily taken root, and it is to them that we may confidently look for assistance in its farther development. The unacknowledged, but nonetheless complete, religious toleration that now exists throughout the country affords them facilities which are being energetically used with great promise of future success. I am tempted to call attention to another point in connection with this much abused class of workers, that is, I think, often lost sight of, namely, their utility as explorers and pioneers of commerce. They are always ready, at least such has been my invariable experience, to place the stores of their local knowledge at the disposal of any one, whether merchant, sportsman, or traveller, who applies to them for information, and to lend him cheerful assistance in the pursuit of his objects. I venture to think that much valuable information as to channels for the development of trade could be obtained by chambers of commerce if they were to address specific inquiries to missionaries in remote regions. Manufacturers are more indebted to missionaries than perhaps they realize for the introduction of their goods and wares, and the creation of a demand for them, in places to which such would never otherwise have found their way. It is fortunate that Mrs. Bishop's visit to Korea was so opportunely timed. At the present rate of progress, much that came under her observation will, before long, be improved out of existence, and though no one can regret the disappearance of many institutions and customs that have nothing but their antiquity to recommend them, she has done valuable service in placing on record so graphic a description of experiences that future travellers will probably look for in vain. Walter C. Hillier, 
October 1897. Author's Prefatory Note my four visits to Korea between January 1894 and March 1897 formed part of a plan of study of the leading characteristics of the Mongolian races. My first journey produced the impression that Korea is the most uninteresting country I ever traveled in, but during and since the war its political perturbations, rapid changes and possible destinies have given me an intense interest in it while Korean character and industry, as I saw both under Russian rule in Siberia, have enlightened me as to the better possibilities which may await the nation in the future. Korea takes a similarly strong grip on all who reside in it sufficiently long to overcome the feeling of distaste which at first it undoubtedly inspires. It is a difficult country to write upon, from the lack of books of reference by means of which one may investigate what one hopes are facts, the two best books on the country having become obsolete within the last few years, in so far as its political condition and social order are concerned. The traveller must laboriously disinter each fact for himself, usually through the medium of an interpreter, and as five or six versions of each are given by apparently equally reliable authorities, frequently the teachers of the foreigners, the only course is to hazard a bold guess as to which of them has the best chance of being accurate. Accuracy has been my first aim, and my many foreign friends in Korea know how industriously I have labored to attain it. It is by these who know the extreme difficulty of the task that I shall be the most leniently criticized wherever, in spite of carefulness, I have fallen into mistakes. Circumstances prevented me from putting my travelling experiences, as on former occasions, into letters. I took careful notes, which were corrected from time to time by the more prolonged observations of residents, and as I became better acquainted with the country. But, with regard to my journey up the south branch of the Han, as I am the first traveller who has reported on the region, I have to rely on my observation and inquiries alone, and there is the same lack of recorded notes on most of the country on the upper Taidong. My notes furnish the travel chapters as well as those on Seoul, Manchuria and Primorsk, and the sketches in contemporary Korean history are based partly on official documents and are partly derived from sources not usually accessible. I owe very much to the kindly interest which my friends in Korea took in my work, and to the encouragement which they gave me when I was disheartened by the difficulties of the subject and my own lack of skill. I gratefully acknowledge the invaluable help given me by Sir Walter C. Hillier, Knight Commander of the Order of St. Michael and St. George, His British Majesty's Consul General in Korea, and Mr. J. Mlevy Brown, Doctor of Laws, Chief Commissioner of Korean Customs, also the aid generously bestowed by Mr. Weber, the Russian minister, and the Rev. G. Haber Jones, the Rev. James Gale, and other missionaries. I am also greatly indebted to a learned and careful volume on Korean government by Mr. W. H. Wilkinson, His British Majesty's acting vice-consul at Chemul Po, as well as to the Korean Repository and the Seoul Independent, for information which has enabled me to correct some of my notes on Korean customs. Various repetitions occur, for the reason that it appears to me impossible to give sufficient emphasis to certain facts without them, and several descriptions are loaded with details, the result of an attempt to fix on paper customs and ceremonies destined shortly to disappear. The illustrations, with the exceptions of three, are reproductions of my own photographs. The sketch map, in so far as my first journey is concerned, is reduced from one kindly drawn for me by Mr. Weber. The transliteration of Chinese proper names was kindly undertaken by a well-known Chinese scholar, but unfortunately the actual Chinese characters were not in all cases forthcoming. In justice to the kind friends who have so generously aided me, I am anxious to claim and accept the fullest measure of personal responsibility for the opinions expressed, which, whether right or wrong, are wholly my own. 
I am painfully conscious of the demerits of this work, but believing that, on the whole, it reflects fairly faithfully the regions of which it treats, I venture to present it to the public, and to ask for it the same kindly and lenient criticism with which my records of travel in the East and elsewhere have hitherto been received, and that it may be accepted as an honest attempt to make a contribution to the sum of the knowledge of Korea and its people, and to describe things as I saw them, not only in the interior, but in the troubled political atmosphere of the capital. Isabella L. Bishop November 1897 End of Author's Prefatory Note Section 1 of Korea and Her Neighbors by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Hawaii in September 2020. Introductory Chapter in the winter of 1894, when I was about to sail for Korea, to which some people erroneously give the name of THE Korea, many interested friends hazarded guesses at its position, the equator, the Mediterranean, and the Black Sea being among them, a hazy notion that it is in the Greek archipelago cropping up frequently. It was curious that not one of these educated and, in some cases, intelligent people came within 2,000 miles of its actual latitude and longitude. In truth, there is something about this peninsula which has repelled investigation, and until lately, when the establishment of a monthly periodical, carefully edited, the Korean Repository, has stimulated research, the one authority of which all writers, with and without acknowledgment, have availed themselves, is the introduction to Père Dallet's Histoire de l'Église de Corée, a valuable treatise, many parts of which, however, are now obsolete. If in this volume I present facts so elementary as to provoke the scornful comment, every schoolboy knows that, I venture to remind my critics that the larger number of possible readers were educated when Korea was little more than a geographical expression, and had not the advantages of the modern schoolboy whose up-to-date geographical textbooks have been written since the treaties of 1883 opened the hermit nation to the world. And I will ask the minority to be patient with what may be to them twice-told tales, for the sake of the majority, especially in this introduction, which is intended to give something of lucidity to the chapters which follow. The first notice of Korea is by Kordat B, an Arab geographer of the ninth century AD, in his Book of Roads and Provinces, quoted by Baron Richhofen in his work on China, page 575. Legends of the aboriginal inhabitants of the peninsula are too mythical to be noticed here, but it is certain that it was inhabited when Kid Tse or Ki Jia, who will be referred to later, introduced the elements of Chinese civilization in the 12th century BC. Naturally, that conquest and subsequent immigrations from Manchuria have left some traces on the Koreans, but they are strikingly dissimilar from both their nearest neighbors, the Chinese and the Japanese, and there is a remarkable variety of physiognomy among them, all the more noticeable because of the uniformity of costume. The difficulty of identifying people which besets and worries the stranger in Japan and China does not exist in Korea. It is true that the obliquity of the Mongolian eye is always present, as well as a trace of bronze in the skin, but the complexion varies from a swarthy olive to a very light brunette. There are straight and aquiline noses, as well as broad and snub noses with distended nostrils, and though the hair is dark, much of it is so distinctly a russet brown as to require the frequent application of lamp black and oil to bring it to a fashionable black while in texture it varies from wiriness to silkiness. Some men have full moustaches and large goatees. On the face of others a few carefully tended hairs, as in China, do duty for both, while many have full, strong beards. 
the mouth is either the wide full-lipped gaping cavity constantly seen among the lower orders or a small though full feature or thin-lipped and refined as is seen continually among patricians the eyes though dark vary from dark brown to hazel the cheekbones are high the brow so far as fashion allows it to be seen is frequently lofty and intellectual and the ears are small and well set on the usual expression is cheerful with a dash of puzzlement the physiognomy indicates in its best aspect quick intelligence rather than force or strength of will the koreans are certainly a handsome race the physique is good the average height of the men is five feet four and a half inches that of the women cannot be ascertained and is disproportionately less while their figureless features the faults of which are exaggerated by the ugliest dress on earth are squat and broad the hands and feet of both sexes and all classes are very small white and exquisitely formed and the tapering almond-shaped fingernails are carefully attended to the men are very strong and as porters carry heavy weights a load of one hundred pounds being regarded as a moderate one they walk remarkably well whether it be the studied swing of the patrician or the short firm stride of the plebeian when on business the families are large and healthy if the government estimate of the number of houses is correct the population taking a fair average is from twelve to thirteen millions females being in the minority mentally the koreans are liberally endowed especially with that gift known in scotland as gleg at the uptuck the foreign teachers bear willing testimony to their mental adroitness and quickness of perception and their talent for the rapid acquisition of languages which they speak more fluently and with a far better accent than either the chinese or japanese they have the oriental vices of suspicion cunning and untruthfulness and trust between man and man is unknown women are secluded and occupy a very inferior position the geography of korea or chao xian morning calm or fresh morning is simple it is a definite peninsula to the northeast of china measuring roughly six hundred miles from north to south and one hundred thirty five from east to west the coastline is about one thousand seven hundred forty miles it lies between thirty four degrees seventeen minutes north to forty three degrees northern latitude and one hundred twenty four degrees thirty eight minutes east to one hundred thirty degrees thirty three minutes eastern longitude and has an estimated area of upwards of eighty thousand square miles being somewhat smaller than great britain bounded on the north and west by the tu men and amnok or yalu rivers which divide it from the russian and chinese empires and by the yellow sea its eastern and southern limit is the sea of japan a silver streak which has not been its salvation its northern frontier is only conterminous with that of russia for eleven miles both boundary rivers rise in paik tu san the white-headed mountain from which runs southwards a great mountain range throwing off numerous lateral spurs itself a rugged spine which divides the kingdom into two parts the eastern division being a comparatively narrow strip between the range and the sea of japan difficult of access but extremely fertile while the western section is composed of rugged hills and innumerable rich valleys and slopes well watered and admirably suited for agriculture craters of volcanoes long since passed into repose lava beds and other signs of volcanic action are constantly met with the lakes are few and very small and not many of the streams are navigable for more than a few miles from the sea the exceptions being the noble amnok the tai dong the naktong the mokpo and the han which last rising in kangwon do thirty miles from the sea of japan after cutting the country nearly in half falls into the sea at chemulpo on the west coast 
and, in spite of many and dangerous rapids, is a valuable highway for commerce for over 170 miles. Owing to the configuration of the peninsula, there are few good harbours, but those which exist are open all the winter. The finest are Husan and Wonsan on Broughton Bay. Chemulpo, which, as the port of Seoul, takes the first place, can hardly be called a harbour at all, the outer harbour, where large vessels and ships of war lie, being nothing better than a roadstead, and the inner harbour, close to the town, in the fierce tideway of the estuary of the Han, is only available for five or six vessels of small tonnage at a time. The east coast is steep and rocky, the water is deep, and the tide rises and falls from one to two feet only. On the southwest and west coasts, the tide rises and falls from 26 to 38 feet. Of the latter coasts, there is a remarkable archipelago. Some of the islands are bold masses of arid rock, the resort of sea fowl. Others are arable and inhabited, while the actual coast fringes off into innumerable islets, some of which are immersed by the spring tides. In the channels scoured among these by the tremendous rush of the tide, navigation is oft times dangerous. Great mud banks, especially near the mouths of the rivers, render parts of the coastline dubious. Korea is decidedly a mountainous country and has few plains deserving the name. In the north there are mountain groups with definite centers, the most remarkable being Paik Tu San which attains an altitude of over 8,000 feet, and is regarded as sacred. Farther south, these settle into a definite range, following the coastline at a moderate distance, and throwing out so many ranges and spurs to the west as to break up northern and central Korea into a congeries of corrugated and precipitous hills, either denuded or covered with chaparral, and narrow, steep-sided valleys, each furnished with a stony stream. The great axial range, which includes the Diamond Mountain, a region containing exquisite mountain and sylvan scenery, falls away as it descends towards the southern coast, disintegrating in places into small and often infertile plains. The geological formation is fairly simple. Mesozoic rocks occur in Huanghai Do, but granite and metamorphic rocks largely predominate. Northeast of Seoul are great fields of lava, and lava and volcanic rocks are of common occurrence in the north. The climate is undoubtedly one of the finest and healthiest in the world. Foreigners are not afflicted by any climatic maladies, and European children can be safely brought up in every part of the peninsula. July, August, and sometimes the first half of September are hot and rainy, but the heat is so tempered by sea breezes that exercise is always possible. For nine months of the year the skies are generally bright, and the Korean winter is absolutely superb, with its still atmosphere, its bright, blue, unclouded sky, its extreme dryness without asperity, and its crisp, frosty nights. From the middle of September till the end of June, there are neither extremes of heat nor cold to guard against. The summer mean temperature at Seoul is about 75 Fahrenheit, that of the winter about 33 degrees. The average rainfall 36.03 inches in the year and the average of the rainy season 21.86 inches. July is the wettest month and December the driest. The result of the abundant rainfall, distributed fairly through the necessitous months of the year, is that irrigation is necessary only for the rice crop. The fauna of Korea is considerable and includes tigers and leopards in great numbers, bears, antelopes, at least seven species of deer, foxes, beavers, otters, badgers, tiger cats, pigs, several species of marten, a sable, not of much value, however, and striped squirrels. Among birds there are black eagles, found even near Seoul, harriers, peregrines, largely used for hawking, pheasants, swans, geese, spectacled and common teal, 
mallards, mandarin ducks, turkey buzzards, very shy, white and pink ibis, sparrow hawks, kestrels, imperial cranes, egrets, herons, curlews, nightjars, redshanks, buntings, magpies, common and blue, orioles, woodlarks, thrushes, redstarts, crows, pigeons, doves, rooks, warblers, wagtails, cuckoos, halcyon and bright blue kingfishers, jays, snipes, nuthatches, grey shrikes, pheasants, hawks and kites. But until more careful observations have been made, it is impossible to say which of the smaller birds actually breed in Korea and which make it only a halting place in their annual migrations. The denudation of the hills in the neighborhood of Seoul, the coasts, the treaty ports and the main roads is impressive and helps to give a very unfavorable idea of the country. It is to the dead alone that the preservation of anything deserving the name of timber in much of southern Korea is owing. But in the mountains of the northern and eastern provinces, and especially among those which enclose the sources of the two men, the Amnok, the Taidong, and the Han, there are very considerable forests, on which up to this time the woodcutter has made little apparent impression, though a good deal of timber is annually rafted down these rivers. Among the indigenous trees are the Abis excelsa, Abis microsperma, Pinus sinensis, Pinus pinea, three species of oak, the lime, ash, birch, five species of maple, the Acanthopanax ricinifolia, Rus semipinata, Elegnus, juniper, mountain ash, hazel, Tuya orientalis, willow, Zophora japonica, hornbeam, plum, beech, Oionimus alatus, etc. The flora is extensive and interesting, but, with the exception of the azalea and rhododendron, it lacks brilliancy of color. There are several varieties of showy clematis, and the millfleur rose smothers even large trees, but the climber par excellence of Korea is the Ampelopsis vaichi. The economic plants are few, and, with the exception of the Panax quinquefolia, ginseng, the wild roots of which are worth fifteen dollars per ounce, are of no commercial value. The mineral wealth of Korea is a vexed question. Probably between the view of the country as an El Dorado and the skepticism as to the existence of underground treasure at all, the mean lies. Gold is little used for personal ornaments or in the arts, yet the Korean declares that the dust of his country is gold, and the unquestionable authority of a customs report states that gold dust to the amount of $1,360,279 was exported in 1896, and that it is probable that the quantity which left the country undeclared was at least as much again. Silver and galena are found, copper is fairly plentiful, and the country is rich in undeveloped iron and coal mines, the coal being of excellent quality. The gold-bearing quartz has never been touched, but an American company, having obtained a concession, has introduced machinery and has gone to work in the province of Pyongan. The manufacturers are unimportant. The best productions are paper of several qualities made from the Brusonetia papyrifera, among which is an oiled paper, like vellum in appearance, and so tough that a man can be raised from the ground on a sheet of it lifted at the four corners, fine grass mats and split bamboo blinds. The arts are nil. Korea, or Chao Xian, has been ruled by kings of the present dynasty since 1392. The monarchy is hereditary, and though some modifications in a constitutional direction were made during the recent period of Japanese ascendancy, the sovereign is still practically absolute, his edicts, as in China, constituting law. The suzerainty of China, recognized since very remote days, 
was personally renounced by the king at the altar of the spirits of the land in january eighteen ninety five and the complete independence of korea was acknowledged by china in the treaty of peace signed at shimonoseki in may of the same year there is a council of state composed of a chancellor five councillors six ministers and a chief secretary the decree of september eighteen ninety six which constitutes this body announces the king's absolutism in plain terms in the preamble there are nine ministers the prime minister minister of the royal household of finance of home affairs foreign affairs war justice agriculture and education but the royal will or whim overrides their individual or collective decisions the korean army consists of four thousand eight hundred men in seoul drilled by russians and one thousand two hundred in the provinces the navy of two small merchant steamers korea is divided into thirteen provinces and three hundred sixty magisterial districts the revenue which is amply sufficient for all legitimate expenses is derived from customs duties under the able and honest management of officers lent by the chinese imperial maritime customs a land tax of six dollars on every fertile kiel a fertile kiel being estimated at about six one-third acres and five dollars on every mountain kiel a household tax of sixty cents per house houses in the capital enjoying immunity and a heavy excise duty of sixteen dollars per catty on manufactured ginseng up to eighteen seventy six korea successfully preserved her isolation and repelled with violence any attempt to encroach upon it in that year japan forced a treaty upon her and in eighteen eighty two china followed with trade and frontier regulations the united states negotiated a treaty in eighteen eighty two great britain and germany in eighteen eighty four russia and italy in eighteen eighty six and austria in eighteen ninety two in all which though under chinese suzerainty korea was treated with as an independent state by these treaties seoul and the ports of chemul po jen chuan husan and wonsan gensan were opened to foreign commerce and this year eighteen ninety seven mokpo and chinampo have been added to the list after the treaties were signed a swarm of foreign representatives settled upon the capital where three of them are housed in handsome and conspicuous foreign buildings the british minister at peking is accredited also to the korean court and britain has a resident consul general japan russia and america are represented by ministers france by a charge d'affaires and germany by a consul china which has been tardy in entering upon diplomatic relations with korea since the war placed her subjects under the protection of the british consul-general until recently the coinage of korea consisted of debased copper cash five hundred to the dollar a great check on business transactions but a new fractional coinage of which the unit is a twenty cent piece has been put into circulation along with five cent nickel five cash copper and one cash brass pieces the fine japanese yen or dollar is now current everywhere the daiichi ginko and fifty-eighth banks of japan afford banking facilities in seoul and the open ports in the treaty ports of fusan wonsan and chemulpo there were in january eighteen ninety seven eleven thousand three hundred eighteen foreign residents and two hundred sixty six foreign business firms the japanese residents numbered ten thousand seven hundred eleven and their firms two hundred thirty the great majority of the american and french residents are missionaries and the most conspicuous objects in seoul are the roman cathedral and the american methodist episcopal church the number of british subjects in korea in january eighteen ninety seven was sixty five and an agency of a british firm in nagasaki has recently been opened at chemulpo 
The approximate number of Chinese in Korea at the same time was 2,500, divided chiefly between Seoul and Chimulpo. There is a newly instituted postal system for the interior, with postage stamps of four denominations, and a telegraph system, Seoul being now in communication with all parts of the world. The roads are infamous, and even the main roads are rarely more than rough bridle tracks. Goods are carried everywhere on the backs of men, bulls and ponies, but a railroad from Chemulpo to Seoul, constructed by an American concessionaire, is actually to be opened shortly. The language of Korea is mixed. The educated classes introduce Chinese as much as possible into their conversation, and all the literature of any account is in that language, but it is of an archaic form, the Chinese of 1,000 years ago, and differs completely in pronunciation from Chinese as it is now spoken in China. Enmun, the Korean script, is utterly despised by the educated, whose sole education is in the Chinese classics. Korean has the distinction of being the only language of Eastern Asia which possesses an alphabet. Only women, children, and the uneducated used the Enmun till January 1895, when a new departure was made by the official gazette, which for several hundred years had been written in Chinese, appearing in a mixture of Chinese characters and Enmun, a resemblance to the Japanese mode of writing, in which the Chinese characters, which play the chief part, are connected by kana syllables. A further innovation was that the king's oath of independence and reform was promulgated in Chinese, pure enmun, and the mixed script, and now the latter is regularly employed as the language of ordinances, official documents, and the gazette, royal rescripts as a rule, and dispatches to the foreign representatives still adhering to the old form. This recognition of the Korean language by means of the official use of the mixed, and in some cases of the pure script, the abolition of the Chinese literary examinations as the test of the fitness of candidates for office, the use of the vulgar script exclusively in the independent, the new Korean newspaper, the prominence given to Korean by the large body of foreign missionaries, and the slow creation of scientific textbooks and a literature in Enmun are tending not only to strengthen Korean national feeling, but to bring the masses, who can mostly read their own script, into contact with Western science and forms of thought. There is no national religion. Confucianism is the official cult, and the teachings of Confucius are the rule of Korean morality. Buddhism, once powerful but disestablished three centuries ago, is to be met with chiefly in mountainous districts and far from the main roads. Spirit worship, a species of shamanism, prevails all over the kingdom, and holds the uneducated masses and the women of all classes in complete bondage. Christian missions, chiefly carried on by Americans, are beginning to produce both direct and indirect effects. Ten years before the opening of Korea to foreigners, the Korean king, in writing to his suzerain, the Emperor of China, said, The educated men observe and practice the teachings of Confucius and Wen Wang, and this fact is the key to anything like a correct estimate of Korea. Chinese influence in government, law, education, etiquette, social relations and morals is predominant. In all these respects, Korea is but a feeble reflection of her powerful neighbor, and though since the war the Koreans have ceased to look to China for assistance, their sympathies are with her, and they turn to her for noble ideals, cherished traditions and moral teachings. Their literature, superstitions, system of education, ancestral worship, culture, and modes of thinking are Chinese. Society is organized on Confucian models, and the rights of parents over children and of elder over younger brothers are as fully recognized as in China. It is into this archaic condition of things, this unspeakable grooviness, 
this irredeemable, unreformed Orientalism, this parody of China without the robustness of race which helps to hold China together, that the ferment of the Western leaven has fallen, and this feeblest of independent kingdoms, rudely shaken out of her sleep of centuries, half frightened and wholly dazed, finds herself confronted with an array of powerful, ambitious, aggressive, and not always over-scrupulous powers, bent, it may be, on overreaching her and each other, forcing her into new paths, wringing with rude hands the knell of time-honoured custom, clamouring for concessions, and bewildering her with reforms, suggestions, and panaceas, of which she sees neither the meaning nor the necessity. And so the old order changeth, giving place to new, and many indications of the transition will be found in the later of the following pages. End of section 1 Section 2 of Korea and Her Neighbors by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Abai in September 2020. Chapter 1 First Impressions of Korea. It is but 15 hours steaming from the harbor of Nagasaki to Husan in southern Korea. The island of Tsushima, where the Higomaru calls, was, however, my last glimpse of Japan, and its reddening maples and blossoming plums, its temple-crowned heights, its stately flights of stone stairs leading to Shinto shrines in the woods, the blue-green masses of its pines, and the golden plumage of its bamboos, emphasized the effect produced by the brown, bare hills of Fusan, pleasant enough in summer, but grim and forbidding on a sunless February day. The island of the interrupted shadow, Chol Yong To, Deer Island, high and grassy, on which the Japanese have established a coaling station and a quarantine hospital, shelters Fusan Harbor. It is not Korea but Japan which meets one on anchoring. The lighters are Japanese. An official of the Nippon Yusen Kaisha, Japan Mail Steamship Company, to which the Higomaru belongs, comes off with orders. The tide waiter, however, is English, one of the English employees of the Chinese Imperial Maritime Customs, lent to Korea, greatly to her advantage, for the management of her customs revenue. The foreign settlement of Fusan is dominated by a steep bluff with a Buddhist temple on the top, concealed by a number of fine cryptomeria, planted during the Japanese occupation in 1592. It is a fairly good-looking Japanese town, somewhat packed between the hills and the sea, with wide streets of Japanese shops and various Anglo-Japanese buildings, among which the consulate and the bank are the most important. It has substantial retaining and sea walls, and draining, lighting and road-making have been carried out at the expense of the municipality. Since the war, waterworks have been constructed by a rate of 100 cash levied on each house, and it is hoped that the present abundant supply of pure water will make an end of the frequent epidemics of cholera. Above the town, the new Japanese military cemetery, filling rapidly, is the prominent object. Considering that the creation of a demand for foreign goods is not 13 years old, it is amazing to find how the Koreans have taken to them, and that the foreign trade of Fusan has developed so rapidly that, while in 1885 the value of exports and imports combined only amounted to £77,850, in 1892 it has reached £346,608. Unbleached shirtings, lawns, muslins, cambrics, and turkey reds for children's wear have all captivated Korean fancy. But the conservatism of wadded cotton garments in winter does not yield to foreign woolens, of which the importation is literally nil. The most amazing stride is in the importation of American kerosene oil, which has reached 71,000 gallons in a quarter, 
and which, by displacing the fish oil lamp and the dismal rushlight in the paper lantern, is revolutionizing evening life in Korea. Matches, too, have caught on wonderfully, and evidently have come to stay. Hides, beans, dried fish, beche de mer, rice, and whale's flesh are among the principal exports. It was not till 1883 that Husan was officially opened to general foreign trade, and its rise has been most remarkable. In that year its foreign population was 1,500, in 1897 it was 5,564. In the first half of 1885, the Japan Mail Steamship Company ran only one steamer, calling at Fusan to Vladivostok every five weeks, and a small boat to Chemulpo, calling at Fusan once a month. Now not a day passes without steamers, large or small, arriving at the port, and in addition to the fine vessels of the Nippon Yuzen Kaisha, running frequently between Kobe and Vladivostok, Shanghai and Vladivostok, Kobe and Tientsin, and between Kobe Chefu and Nuchang, all calling at Husan, three other lines, including one from Osaka direct, and a Russian mail line running between Shanghai and Vladivostok, make Fusan a port of call. It appears that about one-third of the goods imported is carried inland on the backs of men and horses. The taxes levied and the delays at the barriers on both the overland and river routes are intolerable to traders, a hateful custom prevailing under which each station is controlled by some petty official, who, for a certain sum paid to the government in Seoul, obtains permission to levy taxes on all goods. Footnote. According to Mr. Hunt, the Commissioner of Customs at Fusan, in the Kyongsang province alone there are seventeen such stations. Husan is hedged round by a cordon of them within a ten-mile radius, and on the Naktong, which is the waterway to the provincial capital, there are four in a distance of twenty-five miles. End footnote. The Naktong River, the mouth of which is seven miles from Fusan, is navigable for steamers drawing five feet of water as far as Miryang, fifty miles up, and for junks drawing four feet as far as Samun, one hundred miles farther, from which point their cargoes, transshipped into light draft boats, can ascend to Sangchin, one hundred seventy miles from the coast. With this available waterway, and a hazy prospect that the much disputed Seoul Fusan Railway may become an accomplished fact, Fusan bids fair to become an important centre of commerce, as the Kyongsang province, said to be the most populous of the eight, now for administrative purposes thirteen, is also said to be the most prosperous and fruitful, with the possible exception of Tulla. Barren as the neighbouring hills look, they are probably rich in minerals. Gold is found in several places within a radius of fifty miles, copper quite near, and there are coal fields within one hundred miles. To all intents and purposes, the settlement of Fusan is Japanese. In addition to the Japanese population of 5,508, there is a floating population of 8,000 Japanese fishermen. A Japanese consul general lives in a fine European house. Banking facilities are furnished by the Daiichi Ginko of Tokyo, and the post and telegraph services are also Japanese. Japanese, too, is the cleanliness of the settlement and the introduction of industries unknown to Korea, such as rice husking and cleaning by machinery, whale fishing, sake making, and the preparation of shark fins, beche de mer, and fish manure, the latter an unsavory fertilizer, of which enormous quantities are exported to Japan. But the reader asks impatiently, where are the Koreans? I don't want to read about the Japanese. Nor do I want to write about them, but facts are stubborn, and they are the outstanding Fusan fact. As seen from the deck of the steamer, a narrow up-and-down path keeping at some height above the sea skirts the hillside for three miles from Fusan, passing by a small Chinese settlement with official buildings, 
uninhabited when I last saw them, and terminating in the walled town of Fusan proper, with a fort of very great antiquity outside it, modernized by the Japanese after the engineering notions of three centuries ago. Seated on the rocks along the shore were white objects resembling pelicans or penguins, but as white objects with the gait of men moved in endless procession to and fro between old and new Fusan, I assumed that the seated objects were of the same species. The Korean makes upon one the impression of novelty, and while resembling neither the Chinese nor the Japanese, he is much better looking than either, and his physique is far finer than that of the latter. Though his average height is only five feet four and a half inches, his white dress, which is voluminous, makes him look taller, and his high-crowned hat, without which he is never seen, taller still. The men were in winter dress, white cotton-sleeved robes, huge trousers and socks, all wadded. On their heads were black silk wadded caps with pendant sides edged with black fur, and on the top of these, rather high-crowned, somewhat broad-brimmed hats of black crinoline or horsehair gauze, tied under the chin with crinoline ribbon. The general effect was grotesque. There were a few children on the path, bundles of gay clothing, but no women. I was accompanied to old Fusan by the charming English Una, who, speaking Korean almost like a native, moved serenely through the market-day crowds, welcomed by all. A miserable place, I thought it, and later experience showed that it was neither more nor less miserable than the general run of Korean towns. Its narrow, dirty streets consist of low hovels built of mud-smeared wattle without windows, straw roofs and deep eaves, a black smoke hole in every wall two feet from the ground, and outside most are irregular ditches containing solid and liquid refuse. Mangy dogs and blear-eyed children, half or wholly naked and scaly with dirt, roll in the deep dust or slime, or pant and blink in the sun, apparently unaffected by the stenches which abound. But market day hid much that is repulsive. Along the whole length of the narrow, dusty, crooked street, the wares were laid out on mats on the ground, a man or an old woman, bundled up in dirty white cotton, guarding each. And the sound of bargaining rose high, and much breath was spent on beating down prices, which did not amount originally to the tenth part of a farthing. The goods gave an impression of poor buyers and small trade. Short lengths of coarse white cotton, skeins of cotton, straw shoes, wooden combs, tobacco pipes and pouches, dried fish and seaweed, cord for girdles, paper rough and smooth, and barley sugar nearly black were the contents of the mats. I am sure that the most valuable stock in trade there was not worth more than three dollars. Each vendor had a small heap of cash beside him, an uncouth bronze coin with a square hole in the center, of which at that time three thousand two hundred nominally went to the dollar, and which greatly trammelled and crippled Korean trade. A market is held in Fusan and in many other places every fifth day. On these, the country people rely for all which they do not produce, as well as for the sale or barter of their productions. Practically, there are no shops in the villages and small towns, their needs being supplied on stated days by travelling peddlers who form a very influential guild. Turning away from the bustle of the main street into a narrow, dirty alley, and then into a native compound, I found the three Australian ladies who were the objects of my visit to this decayed and miserable town. Except that the compound was clean, it was in no way distinguishable from any other, being surrounded by mud hovels. In one of these, exposed to the full force of the southern sun, these ladies were living. The mud walls were concealed with paper, and photographs and other European knick-knacks conferred a look of refinement. But not only were the rooms so low that one of the ladies could not stand upright in them, but privacy was impossible, 
invasions of Korean women and children succeeding each other from morning to night, so that even dressing was a spectacle for the curious. Friends urged these ladies not to take this step of living in a Korean town three miles from Europeans. It was represented that it was not safe, and that their health would suffer from the heat and fetid odors of the crowded neighborhood, etc. In truth, it was not a conventional thing to do. On my first visit, I found them well and happy. Small children were clinging to their skirts, and a certain number of women had been induced to become cleanly in their persons and habits. All the neighbors were friendly, and rude remarks in the streets had altogether ceased. Many of the women resorted to them for medical help, and the simple aid they gave brought them much good will. This friendly and civilizing influence was the result of a year of living under very detestable circumstances. If they had dwelt in grand houses two and a half miles off upon the hill, it is safe to say that the result would have been nil. Without any fuss or blowing of trumpets, they quietly helped to solve one of the great problems as to missionary methods, though why it should be a problem I fail to see. In the East, at least, every religious teacher who has led the people has lived among them, knowing, if not sharing, their daily lives, and has been easily accessible at all times. It is not easy to imagine a Buddha, or one greater than Buddha, only reached by favor of, and possibly by feeing, a gatekeeper or servant. On visiting them a year later, I found them still well and happy. The excitement among the Koreans consequent on the Tonghak rebellion and the war had left them unmolested. A Japanese regiment had encamped close to them, and, by permission, had drawn water from the well in their compound, and had shown them nothing but courtesy. Having in two years gained general confidence and good will, they built a small bungalow just above the old native house, which has been turned into a very primitive orphanage. The people were friendly and kind from the first. Those who were the earliest friends of the ladies are their staunchest friends now, and they knew them and their aims so well when they moved into their new house that it made no difference at all. Some go there to see the ladies, others to see the furniture or hear the organ, and a few to inquire about the Jesus doctrine. The mission work now consists of daily meetings for worship, classes for applicants for baptism, classes at night for those women who may not come out in the daytime, a Sunday school with an attendance of eighty, visiting among the people, and giving instruction in the country and surrounding villages. About forty adults have professed Christianity, and regularly attend Christian worship. I mention these facts not for the purpose of glorifying these ladies, who are simply doing their duty, but because they fall in with a theory of my own as to methods of mission work. There is a very small Roman Catholic mission house, seldom tenanted, between the two Husans. In the province of Gyeongsang, in which they are, there are Roman missions which claim 2,000 converts, and to promulgate Christianity in 30 towns and villages. There are two foreign priests who spend most of the year in teaching in the provincial villages, living in Korean huts, in Korean fashion, on Korean food. A coarse ocean with a distinct line of demarcation between the blue water of the Sea of Japan and the discoloration of the Yellow Sea, harsh, grim, rocky, brown islands, mostly uninhabited, two monotonously disagreeable days, more islands, muddier water, an estuary and junks, and on the third afternoon from Fusan, the Higomaru anchored in the roadstead of Chemulpo, the seaport of Seoul. This cannot pretend to be a harbor. Indeed, most of the roadstead, such as it is, is a slimy mud flat for much of the day, the tide rising and falling thirty-six feet. The anchorage, a narrow channel in the shallows, can accommodate five vessels of moderate size. Yet though the mud was en évidence, and the low hill behind the town was dull brown, and a drizzling rain was falling, 
I liked the look of Chemulpur better than I expected, and after becoming acquainted with it in various seasons and circumstances, I came to regard it with very friendly feelings. As seen from the roadstead, it is a collection of mean houses, mostly of wood, painted white, built along the edge of the sea and straggling up a verdureless hill, the whole extending for more than a mile from a low point on which are a few trees, crowned by the English vice-consulate, a comfortless and unworthy building, to a hill on which are a large decorative Japanese tea-house, a garden, and a Shinto shrine. Salient features there are none, unless the house of a German merchant and English church, the humble buildings of Bishop Corfi's mission on the hill, the large Japanese consulate, and some new municipal buildings on a slope may be considered such. As at Fusan, an English tide waiter boarded the ship, and a foreign harbour master berthed her, while a Japanese clerk gave the captain his orders. Mr. Wilkinson, the acting British vice consul, came off for me, and entertained me then and on two subsequent occasions with great hospitality. But as the vice consulate had at that time no guest room, I slept at a Chinese inn, known as Stewart's, kept by Itai, an honest and helpful man who does all he can to make his guests comfortable and partially succeeds. This inn is at the corner of the main street of the Chinese quarter, in a very lively position, as it also looks down the main street of the Japanese settlement. The Chinese settlement is solid, with a handsome yamen and guild hall, and rows of thriving and substantial shops. Busy and noisy with the continual letting off of crackers and beating of drums and gongs, the Chinese were obviously far ahead of the Japanese in trade. They had nearly a monopoly of the foreign custom, their large houses in Chemulpo had branches in Seoul, and if there were any foreign requirement which they could not meet, they procured the article from Shanghai without loss of time. The haulage of freight to Seoul was in their hands, and the market gardening, and much besides. Late into the night they were at work, and they used the roadway for drying hides and storing kerosene tins and packing cases. Scarcely did the noise of night cease when the din of morning began. To these hard-working and money-making people, rest seemed a superfluity. The Japanese settlement is far more populous, extensive, and pretentious. Their consulate is imposing enough for a legation. They have several streets of small shops, which supply the needs chiefly of people of their own nationality, for foreigners patronize Ah Wong and Itai, and the Koreans, who hate the Japanese with a hatred three centuries old, also deal chiefly with the Chinese. But though the Japanese were outstripped in trade by the Chinese, their position in Korea, even before the war, was an influential one. They gave postal facilities between the treaty ports and Seoul, and carried the foreign mails, and they established branches of the First National Bank in the capital and treaty ports, with which the resident foreigners have for years transacted their business, and in which they have full confidence. I lost no time in opening an account with this bank in Chemulpo, receiving an English checkbook and passbook, and on all occasions courtesy and all needed help. Partly owing to the fact that English cottons for Korea are made in bales too big for the Lilliputian Korean pony, involving reduction to more manageable dimensions on being landed, and partly to causes which obtain elsewhere, the Japanese are so successfully pushing their cottons in Korea that while they constituted only 3% of the imports in 1887, they had risen to something like 40% in 1894. There is a rapidly growing demand for yarn to be woven on native looms. The Japanese are well to the front with steam and sailing tonnage. Of 198 steamers entered inwards in 1893, 132 were Japanese and out of 325 sailing vessels, 232 were Japanese. It is on record that an English merchantman was once seen in Chemulpo Roads, 
but actually the British mercantile flag, unless on a chartered steamer, is not known in Korean waters. Nor was there in 1894 an English merchant in the Korean treaty ports, or an English house of business, large or small, in Korea. Just then, rice was in the ascendant. Japan, by means of pressure, had induced the Korean government to consent to suspend the decree forbidding its export, and on a certain date the sluices were to be opened. Stacks of rice bags covered the beach, rice in bulk being measured into bags was piled on mats in the roadways, ponies and coolies rice-laden filed in strings down the streets, while in the roadstead a number of Japanese steamers and junks awaited the taking off the embargo at midnight on 6th March. A regular rice babel prevailed in the town and on the beach, and much disaffection prevailed among the Koreans at the rise in the price of their staple article of diet. Japanese agents scoured the whole country for rice, and every catty of it which could be spared from consumption was bought in preparation for the war of which no one in Korea dreamed at that time. The rice bustle gave Chimul Po an appearance of a thriving trade, which it is not wont to have except in the Chinese settlement. Its foreign population in 1897 was 4,357. The reader may wonder where the Koreans are at Chimul Po, and in truth I had almost forgotten them, for they are of little account. The increasing native town lies outside the Japanese settlement on the Seoul Road, clustering round the base of the hill on which the English church stands, and scrambling up it, mud hovels planting themselves on every ledge, attained by filthy alleys, swarming with quiet, dirty children, who look on the high road to emulate the do-lessness of their fathers. Korean, too, is the official yamen at the top of the hill, and Korean its methods of punishment, its brutal flagellations by yamen runners, its beating of criminals to death, their howls of anguish penetrating the rooms of the adjacent English mission, and Korean, too, are the bribery and corruption which make it, and nearly every yamen, sinks of iniquity. The gate, with its double-curved roofs and drum chamber over the gateway, remind the stranger that though the capital and energy of Chemulpo are foreign, the government is native. Not Korean is the abode of mercy on the other side of the road from the Yamen, the hospital connected with Bishop Corfi's mission, where in a small Korean building the sick are received, tended, and generally cured by Dr. Landis, who himself lives as a Korean, in rooms eight feet by six, studying, writing, eating, without chair or table, and accessible at all times to all comers. The 6,700 inhabitants of the Korean town, or rather the male half of them, are always on the move. The narrow roads are always full of them, sauntering along in their dress hats, not apparently doing anything. It is old Fusan over again, except that there are permanent shops with stocks in trade worth from one to twenty dollars, and as an hour is easily spent over a transaction involving a few cash, there is an appearance of business kept up. In the settlement, the Koreans work as porters and carry preposterous weights on their wooden pack saddles. End of section two. Section 3 of Korea and Her Neighbors by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in September 2020. Chapter 2 First Impressions of the Capital. Chemulpo, being on the island studded estuary of the Han, which is navigable for the 56 miles up to Mapu, the river port of Seoul. It eventually occurred to some persons more enterprising than their neighbors to establish steam communication between the two. Manifold are the disasters which have attended this simple undertaking. Nearly every passenger who has entrusted himself to the river has a tale to tell of the boat being deposited on a sandbank 
and of futile endeavours to get off, of fretting and fuming, usually ending in hailing a passing sampan and getting up to Mapu many hours behind time, tired, hungry, and disgusted. For the steam launches are only half powered for their work, the tides are strong, the river shallows often, and its sandbanks shift almost from tide to tide. Hence, this natural highway is not much patronized by people who respect themselves, and all sorts of arrangements are made for getting up to the capital by road. There is, properly speaking, no road, but the word serves. Mr. Gardner, the British acting consul general in Seoul, kindly arranged to escort me the twenty-five miles, and I went up in seven hours in a chair with six bearers, jolly fellows who joked and laughed and raced the consul's pony. Traffic has worn for itself a track, often indefinite, but usually straggling over and sterilizing a width enough for three or four highways, and often making a new departure to avoid deep mud holes. The mud is nearly bottomless. Bullock carts owned by Chinese attempt the transit of goods, and two or three embedded in the mud till the spring showed with what success. Near Mapu, all traffic has to cross a small plain of deep sand. Pack bulls, noble animals, and men are the carriers of goods. The redoubtable Korean pony was not to be seen. Foot passengers in dress hats and wadded white garments were fairly numerous. The track lies through rolling country, well cultivated. There are only two or three villages on the road, but there are many, surrounded by fruit trees, in the folds of the adjacent low hills. Stunted pines, Pinus sinensis, abound, and often indicate places of burial. The hillsides are much taken up with graves. There are wooden signs or distant posts, with grotesque human faces upon them, chiefly that of Chang Sun, a traitor, whose misdemeanors were committed one thousand years ago. The general aspect of the country is bare and monotonous. Except for the orchards and the spindly pines, there is no wood. There is no beauty of form, nor any of those signs of exclusiveness, such as gates or walls, which give something of dignity to a landscape. These were my first impressions. But I came to see on later journeys that even on that road there can be a beauty and fascination in the scenery when glorified and idealized by the unrivaled atmosphere of a Korean winter, which it is a delight even to recall, and that the situation of Seoul for a sort of weird picturesqueness compares favorably with that of almost any other capital, but its Orientalism, a marked feature of which was its specially self-asserting dirt, is being fast improved off the face of the earth. From the low pass known as the Gap, there is a view of the hills in the neighborhood of Seoul, and before reaching the Han, these, glorified and exaggerated by an effect of atmosphere, took on something of grandeur. Crossing the Han in a scow, to which my chair accommodated itself more readily than Mr. Gardner's pony, and encountering ferry boats full of pack bowls bearing the night soil of the city to the country, we landed on the rough, steep, filthy, miry river bank, and were at once in the foul, narrow, slimy, rough street of Mapu, a twisted alley full of mean shops for the sale of native commodities, of bulls carrying mountains of brushwood which nearly filled up the roadway, and with a crowd, masculine solely, which swayed and loafed and did nothing in particular. Some quiet agricultural country and some fine trees, a resemblance to the land of the Bactiari Lurs in the fact of one man working a spade or shovel while three others helped him to turn up the soil by an arrangement of ropes, then two chairs with bearers in blue uniforms, carrying Mrs. and Miss Gardner, accompanied by Bishop Corfi, Mr. Mlevy Brown, the Chief Commissioner of Korean Customs, and Mr. Fox, the Assistant Consul, then the hovels and alleys became thick, and we were in extra-moral soul. A lofty wall, pierced by a deep double-roofed gateway, was passed, and ten minutes more of miserable alleys brought us to a breezy hill, 
crowned by the staring red brick buildings of the English legation and consular offices. The Russian legation has taken another, and a higher, and its lofty tower and fine façade are the most conspicuous objects in the city, while a third is covered with buildings, some Korean and tasteful, but others in a painful style of architecture, a combination of the factory with the meeting-house, belonging to the American Methodist Episcopal Mission, the American Presbyterians occupying a humbler position below. A hill on the other side of the town is dedicated to Japan, and so in every part of the city the foreigner, shut out till 1883, is making his presence felt, and is undermining that which is Korean in the Korean capital by the slow process of contact. One of the most remarkable indications of the change which is stealing over the hermit city is that a nearly finished Roman Catholic cathedral, of very large size, with a clergy house and orphanages, occupies one of the most prominent positions in Seoul. The king's father, the Taiwan Kun, still actively engaged in politics, is the man who, thirty years ago, persecuted the Roman Christians so cruelly and persistently as to raise up for Korea a noble army of martyrs. I know Seoul by day and night, its palaces and its slums, its unspeakable meanness and faded splendours, its purposeless crowds, its medieval processions, which for barbaric splendour cannot be matched on earth, the filth of its crowded alleys and its pitiful attempt to retain its manners, customs and identity as the capital of an ancient monarchy in face of the host of disintegrating influences which are at work, but it is not at first that one takes it in. I had known it for a year before I appreciated it, or fully realized that it is entitled to be regarded as one of the great capitals in the world, with its supposed population of a quarter of a million, and that few capitals are more beautifully situated. One hundred and twenty feet above the sea, in latitude thirty-seven degrees thirty-four minutes north, and longitude one hundred twenty-seven degrees six minutes east, mountain girdled, for the definite peaks and abrupt elevation of its hills give them the grandeur of mountains, though their highest summit, San Kak San, has only an altitude of 2,627 feet. Few cities can boast, as Seoul can, that tigers and leopards are shot within their walls. Arid and forbidding these mountains look at times, their ridges broken up into black crags and pinnacles, oft times rising from among distorted pines, but there are evenings of purple glory when every forbidding peak gleams like an amethyst with a pink translucency, and the shadows are cobalt and the sky is green and gold. Fair are the surroundings too in early spring, when a delicate green mist veils the hills, and their sides are flushed with the heliotrope azalea and flame of plum and blush of cherry, and tremulousness of peach blossom appear in unexpected quarters. Looking down on this great city, which has the aspect of a lotus pond in November, or an expanse of overripe mushrooms, the eye naturally follows the course of the wall, which is discerned in most outlandish places, climbing Namsan in one direction, and going clear over the crest of Pukhan in another, enclosing a piece of forest here and a vacant plain there, descending into ravines, disappearing and reappearing when least expected. This wall, which contrives to look nearly as solid as the hillsides which it climbs, is from twenty-five to forty feet in height and fourteen miles in circumference, according to Mr. Fox of His British Majesty's Consular Service, battlemented along its entire length and pierced by eight gateways, solid arches or tunnels of stone, surmounted by lofty gatehouses with one, two, or three curved tiled roofs. These are closed from sunset to sunrise by massive wooden gates, heavily bossed and strengthened with iron, bearing, following Chinese fashion, high-sounding names such as the Gate of Bright Amiability, the gate of high ceremony, the gate of elevated humanity. 
The wall consists of a bank of earth faced with masonry, or of solid masonry alone, and is on the whole in tolerable repair. It is on the side nearest the river, and onwards in the direction of the Peking Pass, that extra mural soul has expanded. One gate is the gate of the dead, only a royal corpse being permitted to be carried out by any other. By another gate criminals passed out to be beheaded, and outside another their heads were exposed for some days after execution, hanging from camp kettle stands. The north gate, high on Puk Han, is kept closed, only to be opened in case the king is compelled to escape to one of the so-called fortresses on that mountain. Outside the wall is charming country, broken into hills and wooded valleys, with knolls sacrificed to stately royal tombs with their environment of fine trees and villages in romantic positions among orchards and garden cultivation. Few eastern cities have prettier walks and rides in their immediate neighborhood, or greater possibilities of rapid escape into sylvan solitudes, and I must add that no city has environs so safe, and that ladies without a European escort can ride, as I have done, in every direction outside the walls without meeting with the slightest annoyance. I shrink from describing intramural soul. I thought it the foulest city on earth till I saw Peking, and it smells the most odious till I encountered those of Shaoxing. For a great city and a capital its meanness is indescribable. Etiquette forbids the erection of two-storied houses. Consequently, an estimated quarter of a million people are living on the ground, chiefly in labyrinthine alleys, many of them not wide enough for two loaded bulls to pass, indeed barely wide enough for one man to pass a loaded bull, and further narrowed by a series of vile holes or green, slimy ditches, which receive the solid and liquid refuse of the houses, their foul and fetid margins being the favourite resort of half-naked children, begrimed with dirt, and of big, mangy, blear-eyed dogs which wallow in the slime or blink in the sun. There, too, the itinerant vendor of small wares and candies dyed flaring colours with aniline dyes establishes himself, puts a few planks across the ditch, and his goods, worth perhaps a dollar, thereon. But even Seoul has its spring cleaning, and I encountered on the sand plain of the Han, on the ferry, and on the road from Mapu to Seoul, innumerable bulls carrying panniers laden with the contents of the city ditches. The houses abutting on these ditches are generally hovels with deep eaves and thatched roofs, presenting nothing to the street but a mud wall, with occasionally a small paper window just under the roof, indicating the men's quarters, and, invariably, at a height varying from two to three feet above the ditch, a blackened smoke hole, the vent for the smoke and heated air, which have done their duty in warming the floor of the house. All day long bulls laden with brushwood to a great height are entering the city, and at six o'clock this pine brush, preparing to do the cooking and warming for the population, fills every lane in Seoul with aromatic smoke, which hangs over it with remarkable punctuality. Even the superior houses, which have curved and tiled roofs, present nothing better to the street than this debased appearance. The shops partake of the general meanness. Shops with a stock in trade which may be worth six dollars abound. It is easy to walk in Seoul without molestation, but any one standing to look at anything attracts a great crowd, so that it is as well that there is nothing to look at. The shops have literally not a noteworthy feature. Their one characteristic is that they have none. The best shops are near the great bell, beside which formerly stood a stone, with an inscription calling on all Koreans to put intruding foreigners to death. So small are they that all goods are within reach of the hand. In one of the three broad streets there are double rows of removable booths, in which now and then a small box of Korean niello work, iron inlaid with silver, may be picked up. In these and others the principal commodities are white cottons, straw shoes, bamboo hats, coarse pottery, candlesticks with draught screens, 
combs, glass beads, pipes, tobacco pouches, spittoons, horn-rimmed goggles, much worn by officials, paper of many kinds, wooden pillow ends, decorated pillow cases, fans, ink cases, huge wooden saddles with green leather flaps bossed with silver, laundry sticks, dried persimmons, loathsome candies dyed magenta, scarlet and green, masses of dried seaweed and fungi, and ill-chosen collections of the most trumpery of foreign trash, such as sixpenny kerosene lamps, hand mirrors, tinsel vases, etc., the genius of bad taste presiding over all. Plain brass dinner sets and other brass articles are made, and some mother-of-pearl inlaying in black lacquer from old designs is occasionally to be purchased, and embroideries in silk and gold thread, but the designs are ugly and the colouring atrocious. Foreigners have bestowed the name Cabinet Street on a street near the English legation, given up to the making of bureaus and marriage chests. These, though not massive, look so, and are really handsome, some being of solid chestnut wood, others veneered with maple or peach, and bossed, strapped, and hinged with brass, besides being ornamented with great brass hasps and brass padlocks six inches long. These, besides being thoroughly Korean, are distinctly decorative. There are few buyers, except in the early morning, and shopping does not seem a pastime, partly because none but the poorest class of women can go out on foot by daylight. In the booths are to be seen tobacco pipes, pipe stems and bowls, coarse glazed pottery, rice bowls, Japanese lucifer matches, aniline dyes, tobacco pouches, purses, flint and tinder pouches, rolls of oiled paper, tassels, silk cord, nuts of the edible pine, rice, millet, maize, peas, beans, string shoes, old crinoline hats, bamboo and reed hats in endless variety, and coarse native cotton, very narrow. In this great human hive the ordinary sightseer finds his vocation gone. The inhabitants constitute the sight of soul. The great bronze bell, said to be the third largest in the world, is one of the few sights usually seen by strangers. It hangs in a bell tower in the centre of the city and bears the following inscription. Se Cho the Great, Twelfth Year Man Cha, Year of the Cycle, and Moon, the Fourth Year of the Great Ming Emperor Hu Hua, A.D. 1468, the head of the Bureau of Royal Dispatches, Se Kong Cheng, bearing the title Sa Kang Cheng, had this pavilion erected and this bell hung. This bell, whose dull heavy boom is heard in all parts of Seoul, has opened and closed the gates for five centuries. The grand triple gateway of the royal palace with its double roof, the old audience hall in the Mulberry Gardens and the decorative roofs of the gate towers are all seen in an hour. There remains the marble pagoda, seven centuries old, so completely hidden away in the backyard of a house in one of the foulest and narrowest alleys of the city that many people never see it at all. As I was intent on photographing some of the reliefs upon it, I visited it five times, and each time with fresh admiration, but so wedged in is it that one can only get any kind of view of it by climbing on the top of a wall. Every part is carved, and the flat parts richly so, some of the tablets representing Hindu divinities, while others seem to portray the various stages of the soul's progress towards nirvana. The designs are undoubtedly Indian, modified by Chinese artists, and this thing of beauty stands on the site of a Buddhist monastery. It is a thirteen-storied pagoda, but three stories were taken off in the Japanese invasion three centuries ago and placed on the ground, uninjured. So they remained, but on my last visit children had defaced the exquisite carving and were offering portions for sale. Not far off is another relic of antiquity, a decorated and inscribed tablet, standing on the back of a granite turtle of prodigious size. Outside the west gate, on a plain near the Peking Pass, 
was a roofed and highly decorated arch of that form known as the Pylov, and close by it a sort of palace hall in which every new sovereign of Korea waited for the coming of a special envoy from Peking, whom he joined in the Pylov, accompanying him to the palace, where he received from him his investiture as sovereign. On the slope of Namsan, the white wooden buildings, simple and unpretentious, of the Japanese legation are situated, and below them a Japanese colony of nearly 5,000 persons, equipped with tea houses, a theatre, and the various arrangements essential to Japanese well-being. There, in acute contrast to everything Korean, are to be seen streets of shops and houses, where cleanliness, daintiness, and thrift reign supreme, and unveiled women and men in girdled dressing gowns and clogs move about as freely as in Japan. There also are to be seen minute soldiers or military police, and smart besordered officers, who change guard at due intervals. Nor are such precautions needless, for the heredity of hate is strong in Korea, and on two occasions the members of this legation have had to fight their way down to the sea. The legation was occupied at the time of my first visit by Mr. Otori, an elderly man with pendulous white whiskers, who went much into the little society which Seoul boasts, talking nothings, and gave no promise of the rough vigour which he showed a few months later. There also are the Japanese bank and post office, both admirably managed. The Chinese colony was in 1894 nearly as large, and differed in no respect from such a colony anywhere else. The foreigners depend for many things on the Chinese shops, and, as the Koreans like the Chinese, they do some trade with them also. The imposing element connected with China was the Yamen of Yuan, the minister resident and representative of Korea's suzerain, by many people regarded as the power behind the throne, who is reported to have gone more than once unbidden into the king's presence, and to have reproached him with his conduct of affairs. Great courtyards and lofty gates on which are painted the usual guardian gods, and a brick dragon screen, seclude the palace in which Yuan lived with his guards and large retinue, and the number of big, supercilious men, dressed in rich brocades and satins, who hung about both this palace and the consulate, impressed the Koreans with the power and stateliness within. The Americans were very severe on Yuan, but so far as I could learn, his chief fault was that he let things alone, and neglected to use his unquestionably great power in favour of reform and common honesty, but he was a Chinese Mandarin. He possessed the power of life and death over Chinamen, and his punishments were often to our thinking barbarous, but the Chinese feared him so much that they treated the Koreans fairly well, which is more than can be said of the Japanese. One of the sights of Seoul is the stream or drain or water course, a wide, walled, open conduit, along which a dark-coloured, festering stream slowly drags its malodorous length among manure and refuse heaps, which cover up most of what was once its shingly bed. There, tired of crowds masculine solely, one may be refreshed by the sight of women of the poorest class, some ladling into pails the compound which passes for water, and others washing clothes in the fetid pools which pass for a stream. All wear one costume, which is peculiar to the capital, a green silk coat, a man's coat with the neck put over the head and clutched below the eyes, and long wide sleeves falling from the ears. It is as well that the Korean woman is concealed, for she is not a houri. Washing is her manifest destiny so long as her lord wears white. She washes in this foul river, in the pond of the Mulberry Palace, in every wet ditch, and outside the walls in the few streams which exist. Clothes are partially unpicked, boiled with lay three times, rolled into hard bundles and pounded with heavy sticks on stones. After being dried, they are beaten with wooden sticks on cylinders, till they attain a polish resembling dull satin. 
the women are slaves to the laundry and the only sound which breaks the stillness of a sole night is the regular beat of their laundry sticks from the beautiful hill nam san from the lone tree hill and from a hill above the old mulberry palace seoul is best seen with its mountainous surroundings here and there dark with pines but mostly naked falling down upon the city in black arid corrugations these mountains enclose a valley about five miles long by three broad into which two hundred thousand people are crammed and wedged the city is a sea of low brown roofs mostly of thatch and all but monotonous no trees and no open spaces rising out of this brown sea there are the curved double roofs of the gates and the grey granite walls of the royal palaces and within them the sweeping roofs of various audience halls cutting the city across by running from the east to the west gate is one broad street another striking off from this runs to the south gate and a third sixty yards wide runs from the great central artery to the palace this is the only one which is kept clear of encumbrance at all times the others being occupied by double rows of booths leaving only a narrow space for traffic on either side when i first looked down on seoul early in march one street along its whole length appeared to be still encumbered with the drift of the previous winter's snow it was only by the aid of a glass that i discovered that this is the great promenade and that the snowdrift was just the garments of the koreans whitened by ceaseless labor with the laundry sticks in these three broad streets the moving crowd of men in white robes and black dress hats seldom flags they seem destitute of any object many of them are of the young bun or noble class to whom a rigid etiquette forbids any but official or tutorial occupation and many of whom exist by hanging on to their more fortunate relatives young men of the middle class imitate their nonchalance and swinging gait there too are to be seen officials superbly dressed mounted on very fat but handsome ponies with profuse manes and tails the riders sitting uneasily on the tops of saddles with showy caparisonings a foot high holding on to the saddle-bow two retainers leading the steed and two more holding the rider in his place or officials in palanquins with bearers at a run amid large retinues in the more plebeian streets nothing is to be seen but bulls carrying pine brush strings of ponies loaded with salt or country produce water carriers with pails slung on a yoke splashing their contents and coolies carrying burdens on wooden pack saddles but in the narrower alleys of which there are hundreds further narrowed by the low deep eaves and the vile ditches outside the houses only two men can pass each other and the noble red bull with his load of brushwood is rarely seen between these miles of mud walls deep eaves green slimy ditches and blackened smoke holes few beside the male inhabitants and burden-bearers are seen to move they are the paradise of mangy dogs every house has a dog and a square hole through which he can just creep he yelps furiously at a stranger and runs away at the shaking of an umbrella he was the sole scavenger of soul and a very inefficient one he is neither the friend nor companion of man he is ignorant of korean and every other spoken language his bark at night announces peril from thieves he is almost wild when young he is killed and eaten in spring i have mentioned the women of the lower classes who wash clothes and draw water in the daytime many of these were domestic slaves and all are of the lowest class Korean women are very rigidly secluded, perhaps more absolutely so than the women of any other nation. In the capital a very curious arrangement prevailed. About eight o'clock the great bell told a signal for men to retire into their houses, and for women to come out and amuse themselves and visit their friends. The rule which clears the streets of men occasionally lapses, and then some incident occurs which causes it to be rigorously reinforced. 
so it was at the time of my arrival and the pitch-dark streets presented the singular spectacle of being tenanted solely by bodies of women with servants carrying lanterns from its operation were exempted blind men officials foreigner servants and persons carrying prescriptions to the druggists these were often forged for the purpose of escape from durance vile and a few people got long staffs and personated blind men at twelve the bell again boomed women retired and men were at liberty to go abroad a lady of high position told me that she had never seen the streets of seoul by daylight the nocturnal silence is very impressive there is no human hum throb or gurgle the darkness too is absolute as there are few if any lighted windows to the streets upon a silence which may be felt the deep penetrating boom of the great bell breaks with a sound which is almost ominous end of section three section four of korea and her neighbors by isabella l bird this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by abai in october two thousand twenty chapter three the kurudong before leaving england letters from korea had warned me of the difficulty of travelling in the interior of getting a trustworthy servant and above all a trustworthy interpreter weeks passed by and though bishop corfi and others exerted themselves on my behalf these essential requisites were not forthcoming for to find a reliable english-speaking korean is well-nigh impossible there are english-speaking koreans who have learned english some in the government school and others in the methodist episcopal school and many of these i interviewed the english of all was infirm and they were all limp and timid a set of poor creatures some of them seemed very anxious to go with me and were partially engaged and the next day came looking uneasy and balancing themselves on the edge of their chairs told me that their mothers said they must not go because there were tigers or that three months was too long a journey or that they could not go so far from their families etc at last a young man came who really spoke passable english but on entering the room with a familiar nod he threw himself down in an easy chair swinging his leg over the arm he asked many questions about the journey said it was very long to be away from seoul and that he should require one horse for his baggage and another for himself i remarked that in order to get through the difficulties of the journey it would be necessary to limit the baggage as much as possible he said he could not go with fewer than nine suits of clothes i remarked that a foreigner would only take two and that i should reduce myself to two yes he replied but foreigners are so dirty in their habits this from a korean so once more i had to settle down and accept the kindly hospitality of my friends trusting that something would turn up by this delay i came in for the kurudong one of the most remarkable spectacles i ever saw and it had the added interest of being seen in its splendour for probably the last time as circumstances which have since occurred and the necessity for economy must put an end to much of the scenic display the occasion was a visit of the king in state to sacrifice in one of the ancestral temples of his dynasty members of which have occupied the korean throne for five centuries living secluded in his palace guarded by one thousand men his subjects forbidden to pronounce his name which indeed is seldom known in total ignorance of any other aspect of his kingdom and capital than that furnished by the two streets through which he passes to offer sacrifice the days on which he performs this pious act offer to his subjects their sole opportunities of gazing on his august countenance as the queen's procession passed by on the day of the duke of york's marriage i heard a working man say it's we as pays and we likes to get the valley for our money 
the korean pays in another and heavier mm -hmm. sense and as in tens of thousands he crowds in reverential silence the root of the kurudong he is probably glad that the one brilliant spectacle of the year should be as splendid as possible the monotony of soul is something remarkable brown mountains picked out in black brown mud walls brown roofs brown roadways whether mud or dust while humanity is in black and white always the same bundled up women clutching their green coats under their eyes always the same surge of young buns and their familiars swinging along south street the same strings of squealing ponies spoiling for a fight the same processions of majestic red bulls under towering loads of brushwood the same coolies in dirty white forever carrying burdens the same joyless dirty children getting through life on the gutter's edge and the same brownish dogs feebly wrangling over offal on such monotony and colorlessness the kurdong bursts like the sun alas for this mean but fascinating capital that the most recent steps towards civilization should involve the abolition of its one spectacle by six in the morning of the looked-for day we were on our way from the english legation to a position near the great bell all the male population of the alleys taking the same direction along with children in colours and some of the poorer class of women with gay handkerchiefs folded roman fashion on their hair for the first time i saw the grand proportions of the road called by foreigners south street the double rows of booths had been removed the night before and along the side of the street at intervals of twenty yards torches ten feet high were let into the ground to light the king on his return from sacrifices it is only by its imposing width that this great street lends itself to such a display for the houses are low and mean and on one side at least are only superior hovels in place of the booths the subjects were massed twelve deep the regularity of the front row being preserved by a number of yamen runners who brought down their wooden paddles with an unmerciful whack on any one breaking the line the singular monotony of baggy white coats and black crinoline hats was relieved by boy bridegrooms in yellow hats and rose pink coats by the green silk coats of women and the green pink heliotrope and turkey red dresses of children the crowd had a quietly pleased but very limp look there was no jollity or excitement no flags or popular demonstrations and scarcely a hum from a concourse which must have numbered at least one hundred fifty thousand half the city together with numbers from the country who had walked three and four days to see the spectacle squalid and mean is ordinary korean life and the king is a myth for most of the year no wonder that the people turn out to see as splendid a spectacle as the world has to show its splendour centring round their usually secluded sovereign it is to the glory of a dynasty which has occupied the korean throne for five centuries as well as in honour of the present occupant the hour of leaving the palace had been announced as six a m but though it was seven thirty before the boom of a heavy gun announced that a procession was in motion the interest never flagged the whole time hundreds of coolies sprinkled red earth for the width of a foot along the middle of the streets for hypothetically the king must not pass over soil which has been trodden by the feet of his subjects squadrons of cavalry with coolies leading their shabby ponies took up positions along the route and in a great mass in front of us the troopers sat on the ground smoking till a very distrait bugle call sent them to their saddles the ponies bit kicked and squealed and the grotesque and often ineffectual attempts of the men to mount them provoked the laughter of the crowd as one trooper after another with one foot in the stirrup and the other on the ground hopped round at the pleasure of his steed after all with the help of their coolies were mounted 
wax secretly administered by the men in the crowd nearly unhorsed many of them but they clung with both hands to their saddle bows and eventually formed into a ragged line among the very curious sights were poles carried at measured distances supporting rectangular frames resembling small umbrella stands filled with feathered arrows and messengers dashing along as if they had been shot and were escaping from another shaft for from the backs of their collars protruded arrows which had apparently entered obliquely either on the back or breast or both of the superb dresses of officials were satin squares embroidered in unique designs representing birds and beasts storks indicating civil and tigers military rank while the number of birds or animals on the lozenge denoted the wearer's exact position though there were long stretches of silence scarcely broken by the hum of a multitude there were noisy interludes novel in their nature produced by men sometimes fifteen in a row who carried poles with a number of steel rings loosely strung upon them which they tossed into the air and allowed to fall against each other with a metallic clink loud and strident likewise the trains of servants in attendance on mandarins emitted peculiar cries sounding g in unison then raising their note and singing c three times afterwards with a falling cadence singing g again but of the noises which passed for music the most curious as to method was that made by the drummers who marched irregularly in open order in lines extending across the broad roadway these carried bowl-shaped kettle drums slung horizontally and bass drumsticks mainly hidden by their voluminous sleeves in time with the marching the right hand stick rose above the drummer's head then the left stick in like manner but both fell again nearly to the drum without emitting a sound the next act of the performance consisted in lifting both sticks above the head together and again bringing them down silently finally the sticks were crossed and during two marching steps rose feebly and as feebly fell on the ends of the drum producing a muffled sound and this program was repeated during the duration of the march soldiers in rusty black belted frocks wide trousers bandaged into padded socks and straw shoes stacked arms in a side street closed black and colored chairs went past at a trot palace attendants in hundreds in brown glazed cotton sleeved cloaks blue underrobes tied below the knee with bunches of red ribbon and stiff black hats with heavy fan-shaped plumes of peacock's feathers rode ragged ponies in gay saddles of great height without bridles the animals being led by coolies high officials passed in numbers in chairs or on pony back each with from twenty to thirty gay attendants running beside them and a row of bannermen extending across the broad street behind him each man with a silk banner bearing the cognomen of his lord these officials were superbly dressed and made a splendid show they wore black high-crowned hats with long crimson tassels behind and heavy black ostrich plumes falling over the brim in front mazarine blue silk robes split up to the waist behind with orange silk under robes and most voluminous crimson trousers loosely tied above the ankles with knots of sky-blue ribbon while streamers of ribbon fell from throats and girdles and the hats were secured by throat lashes of large amber beads each carried over his shoulder a yellow silk banneret with his style in chinese characters in crimson upon it and in the same hand his baton of office with a profusion of streamers of rich ribbons depending from it the sleeves were orange in the upper part and crimson in the lower and very full the overfed and self-willed ponies chiefly roan and grey are very handsome and showily caparisoned the heads covered with blue red and yellow balls and surmounted with great crimson silk pompons 
the bridles a couple of crimson silk scarves, the saddles a sort of leather-covered padded pack saddle twelve inches above the animal's back, with wide, deep flaps of bright green, silver-bossed leather hanging down on either side, the cruppers folded white silk, and the breastplate shields of gold embroidery. The gorgeous rider lifted by his servants upon this elevation stands erect in his stirrups, with his feet not halfway down his pony's sides, his left hand clutching, rather than holding, an arch placed for this purpose at the bow of the saddle. These officials made no attempt to hold their own bridles. Their ponies were led by servants, retainers supported them by the feet on either side, and as their mounts showed their resentment of the pace and circumstances by twistings and strugglings with their grooms, the faces of the riders expressed a fearful joy, if joy it was. Waves of colour and Korean grandeur rolled by, official processions, palace attendants, bannermen with large silk banners trailing on the stiff breeze, each flagstaff crested with a tuft of pheasant's feathers, the king's chief cook with an enormous retinue, more palace servants smoking long pipes, drummers, fifers, couriers at a gallop, with arrows stuck into the necks of their coats, holding on to their saddles and rope bridles, mixed up with dishevelled ponies with ragged pack saddles, carrying cushions, lacquer boxes, eatables, cooking utensils, and smoking apparatus, led caparisoned ponies, bowmen, soldiers strangling loosely, armed with matchlock guns, till several thousand persons had passed. Yet this was not the procession, though it might well have served for one. At seven-thirty, while this march past was still going on, a gun was fired, and the great bell, which was very close to us, boomed heavily, and a fanfaronade of trumpets and the shrill scream of fifes announced that Li Si had at last left the palace. The cavalry opposite us prepared to receive his majesty by turning tail, a manoeuvre not accomplished without much squealing and fighting. There was a general stir among the spectators, men with arrows in their coats galloped frantically, there was an onslaught on the derby dog, and an attack by men armed with the long wooden paddles which are used for beating criminals on inoffensive portions of the crowd. It is said that there were five thousand servants and officials connected with the palace, and there were nominally six thousand soldiers in Seoul, and the greater part of these took part in the many splendid processions which went to form the royal procession. It would be impossible for a stranger to give in detail the component parts of such a show, the like of which has no existence elsewhere on earth, passing for more than an hour in the bright sunshine, in detachments, in compact masses, at a stately walk or a rapid run, in the full splendour of a barbaric medievalism, or to say what dignitaries flashed by in the kaleidoscopic blaze of colour. The procession of the king was led by the General of the Vanguard, superbly dressed, supported by retainers on his led pony, and followed by crowds of dignitaries, each with his train, soldiers, men carrying aloft frames of arrows reaching nearly across the road, and huge flags of silk brocade surmounted by plumes of pheasant's feathers, servants in rows of a hundred in the most delicate shades of blue, green, or mauve silk gauze over white, halberdiers, grandees, each with a retinue of bannermen, rows of royal bannermen carrying yellow and blue silk flags emblazoned, cavalrymen in imitation gold helmets and medieval armour, and tiger-hunters wearing coarse black felt hats with conical crowns and dark blue coats, trailing long guns. With scarcely a pause followed the president of the foreign office, high above the crowd on a monocycle, a black wheel supporting on two uprights a black platform, 
carrying a black chair decorated with a leopard skin, the occupant of which was carried by eight men at a height of eight feet from the ground. More soldiers, bannermen, and drummers, and then came the chief of the eunuchs, grandly dressed, with an immense retinue and a large number of his subordinates, most of whom up to that time, by their position in the palace and their capacity for intrigue, had exercised a very baneful influence on Korean affairs. The procession became more quaint and motley still. Palace attendants appeared in the brilliant garments of the Korean Middle Ages. Cavalry in antique armor were jumbled up with cavalry in loose cotton frocks and baggy trousers, supposed to be dressed and armed in European fashion, but I failed to detect the flattery of imitation. There were cavalry in black Tyrolese hats with pink ribbon round them, black cotton sacks loosely girdled by leather belts with brass clasps never cleaned, white wadded stockings and hempen shoes. Some had leather saddles, others rode on pack saddles, with the great pad which should go underneath, on the top. Some held on to their saddles, others to their rope bridles, the ponies of some were led by coolies in dirty white clothes. The officers were all held on their saddles, many tucked their old-fashioned swords under their arms, lest carrying them in regulation fashion should make their animals kick. The feet of some nearly touched the ground, and those of others hung only halfway down their ponies' sides. Ponies squealed, neighed, reared, and jibbed, but somehow or other these singular horsemen managed to form ragged lines. Then came foot soldiers with rusty muskets and innumerable standards, generals, court dignitaries, statesmen, some with crimson hats with heavy black plumes, others with high-peaked crinoline hats with projecting wings, others with lofty mitres covered with tinsel gleaming like gold, each with a splendid train. Medieval costumes blazing with color flashed past. There were more soldiers, and this time they carried Snyder rifles. Two Gatling guns were dragged by Yamen runners, who frantically spanked all and sundry with their paddles. Drummers beat their drums unmercifully. Fifes shrieked. There were more dignitaries with fairy-like retinues in blue and green silk gauze, the king's personal attendants in crowds followed in yellow, with bamboo hats trimmed with rosettes. Standard bearers came next, bearing the royal standard, a winged tiger rampant on a yellow ground, more flags and troops, and then the curious insignia of Korean royalty, including a monstrous red silk umbrella and a singular frame of stones. More grandees, more soldiers, more musical instruments, and then come the royal chairs, the first, which was canopied with red silk, being empty, the theory being that this was the more likely to receive an assassin's blow. A huge trident was carried in front of it. After this, borne high aloft by forty bearers clothed in red, in a superb chair of red lacquer, richly tasseled and canopied, and with wings to keep off the sun, came the king, whose pale, languid face never changed its expression as he passed with all the dignity and splendor of his kingdom through the silent crowd. More grandees, servants, soldiers, standard-bearers, arrow-men, officials, cavalry, and led horses formed the procession of the crown prince, who was also carried in a red palanquin, and looked paler and more impassive than his father. The supply of officials seemed inexhaustible, for behind him came a quarter of a mile of grandees in splendid costumes, with hats decorated with red velvet and peacock's feathers and throat lashes of great amber beads, with all their splendid trains, footmen in armor bossed with large nails, drummers, men carrying arrow frames and insignia on poles, 
then the general of the rear guard in a gleaming helmet and a splendid blue crimson and gold uniform propped up by retainers on his handsome pony more soldiers armed with old matchlock guns lastly men bearing arrow frames and standards and with them the barbaric and bizarre splendor of the kurudong was over and the white crowd once more overflowed the mean street quite late in the evening the royal pageant returned by the light of stationary torches with lanterns of blue and crimson silk undulating from the heads of pikes and bayonets this truly splendid display was estimated to cost twenty five thousand dollars a heavy burden on the small resources of the kingdom it is only thus surrounded that the king ever appears in public and the splendor accentuates the squalor of the daily life of the masses of the people in the foul alleys which make up most of the city it must be remembered that the people taking part in the pageant are not men hired and dressed up by a costumier but that they are actual court officials and noblemen in the dress of to-day and that the weapons carried by the soldiers are those with which they are supposed to repel attack or put down rebellion end of section four section five of korea and her neighbors by isabella l bird this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by avai in november two thousand twenty chapter four seoul the korean mecca further difficulties and delays while they pushed my journey into the interior into the hot weather gave me the advantage of learning a little about the people and the country before starting in one sense seoul is korea take a mean alley in it with its mud-walled hovels deep-eaved brown roofs and malodorous ditches with their foulness and green slime and it may serve as an example of the street of every village and provincial town in country places there are few industrial specialties a soul shop of assorted notions represents the shop of every country town the white clothing and the crinoline dress hat are the same everywhere as in seoul whatever of national life there is exists only in the capital strong as is the drift towards london in our own agricultural districts it is stronger in korea towards seoul seoul is not only the seat of government but it is the centre of official life of all official employment and of the literary examinations which were the only avenues to employment it is always hoped that something may be picked up in seoul hence there is a constant permanent or temporary gravitation towards it and the larger proportion of the youths who swing and lounge on sunny afternoons along the broad streets aping the gait of young buns are aspirants for official position gusts of popular feeling which pass for public opinion in a land where no such thing exists are known only in seoul it is in the capital that the korean feels the first stress of his unsought and altogether undesired contact with western civilization and resembles nothing so much as a man awakening from a profound sleep rubbing his eyes half dazed and looking dreamily about him not quite sure where he is seoul is also the commercial centre of a country whose ideas of commerce are limited to huckstering transactions all business is done there all country shops are supplied with goods from seoul all produce not shipped from the treaty ports converges on seoul it is the centre of the great trading guilds which exercise a practical monopoly in certain sorts of goods as well as of the guilds of porters by whom the traffic of the country is carried on the heart of every korean is in seoul officials have town houses in the capital and trust their business to subordinates for much of the year landed proprietors draw their rents and squeeze the people on their estates but are absentees living in the capital 
every man who can pay for food and lodging on the road trudges to the capital once or twice a year and people who live in it of whatever degree can hardly be bribed to leave it even for a few weeks to the korean it is the place in which alone life is worth living yet it has no objects of art very few antiquities no public gardens no displays except the rare one of the cordon and no theatres it lacks every charm possessed by other cities antique it has no ruins no libraries no literature and lastly an indifference to religion without a parallel has left it without temples while certain superstitions which still retain their hold have left it without a tomb leaving out the temple of confucius and the homage officially rendered to his tablet in korea as in china there are no official temples in seoul nor might a priest enter its gates under pain of death consequently the emphasis which noble religious buildings give even to the meanest city in china or japan is lacking there is a small temple to the god of war outside the south gate with some very curious frescoes but i seldom saw any worshippers there the absence of temples is a feature of the other korean cities buddhism which for one thousand years before the founding of the present dynasty was the popular cult has been disestablished and practically proscribed since the sixteenth century and koreans account for the severe enactments against priests by saying that in the japanese invasion three centuries ago japanese disguised themselves as buddhist priests and gained admission to cities putting their garrisons to the sword be that true or false buddhism in korea to be found must be sought as there are no temples so there are no other signs of religion and the hasty observer would be warranted in putting down the koreans as a people without a religion ancestral worship and a propitiation of demons or spirits the result of a timid and superstitious dread of the forces of nature are to the korean in place of a religion both i am inclined to believe are the result of fear the worship of ancestors being dictated far less by filial piety than by the dread that ancestral spirits may do harm to their descendants this cult prevails from the king to the coolie it inspires the costly splendors of the cordong as well as the spread of ancestral food in the humblest hovel on new year's eve the graves within an area of ten miles from the city wall are among the remarkable features of this singular capital the dead have a monopoly of the fine hill slopes and southern aspects a man who when alive is content with a mud hovel in a dingy alley when dead must repose on a breezy hill slope with dignified and carefully tended surroundings the little fine timber which exists in the denuded neighborhood of seoul is owed to the royal and wealthy dead the amount of good land occupied by the dead is incredible the grave of a member of the royal family on a hill creates a solitude for a considerable distance around in the case of rich and great men as well as of princes the grave is a lofty grassy mound often encircled by a massive stone railing with the hill terraced in front and excavated in a horseshoe shape behind a stone altar and stone lanterns are placed in front and the foot of the hill as at the princess's tomb is often occupied by a temple-like building containing tablets with the name and rank of the dead the royal tombs are approached by stately avenues of gigantic stone figures possibly a harmless survival of the practice of offering human and other sacrifices at a burial these figures represent a priest a warrior in armor a servant a pony and a sheep the poorer dead occupy hillsides in numbers resting under grass mounds on small platforms of grass always neatly kept the lucky place for interment is in all cases chosen by the geomancer behind rich men's graves pines are usually planted in a crescent 
the dead population of the hillsides round Seoul is simply enormous. Funerals usually go out near dusk with a great display of colored lanterns, but I was fortunate enough to see an artisan's corpse carried out by daylight. First came four drums and a sort of fife, perpetrating a lively tune as an accompaniment to a lively song. These were followed by a hearse, if it may be called so, a domed and gaudily painted construction with a garland of artificial flowers in the centre of the dome, a white Korean coat thrown across the roof, and four flagstaffs with gay flags at the four corners, bamboo poles, flower wreathed, forming a platform on which the hearse was borne by eight men in peaked yellow hats, garlanded with blue and pink flowers. Bouquets of the same were disposed carelessly on the front and sides of the hearse, the latter being covered with shield-shaped flags of gaudily coloured muslin. The chief mourner followed, completely clothed in sackcloth, wearing an umbrella-shaped hat over four feet in diameter, and holding a sackcloth screen before his face by two bamboo handles. Men in flower-wreathed hats surrounded him, some of them walking backwards and singing. He looked fittingly grave, but it is a common custom for those who attend the chief mourner to try to make him laugh by comic antics and jocular remarks. There are burial clubs in Seoul to which 100,000 cash are contributed, then worth about $33 silver. The first man to die receives 30,000 cash, the second 33,000, and the third 37,000. This man had belonged to one of these, which accounts for an artisan having such a handsome funeral. Mourners dress in straw-coloured hempen cloth, and all wear the enormous hats mentioned before, which so neatly conceal the face that the carrying of the grass-cloth screen is almost the work of supererogation. A mourner may not enter the palace grounds, and as mourning for a father lasts for three years, a courtier thus bereaved is for that time withdrawn from court. Among the curious customs, mainly of Chinese origin, connected with death are the dressing the dying person in his best clothes when death is very close at hand. The very poor are buried coffinless in a wrapping of straw, and are carried by two men on a bier, the nature of the burden being concealed by hoops covered with paper. When Buddhist priests and temples were prohibited in the walled towns three centuries ago, anything like a national faith disappeared from Korea, and it is only through ancestral worship and a form of shamanism practiced by the lower and middle classes that any recognition of the unseen survives, and that is in its most superstitious and rudimentary form. Protestant Christian missionaries, preceded in 1784 by those of the Roman Catholic Church, entered Korea in 1884, almost as soon as the country was opened by treaty, and agents of the American Methodist Episcopal and Northern Presbyterian churches took up their abode in Seoul. They have been followed by representatives of several of the divisions among Protestants, Southern Presbyterians, Canadian Presbyterians, Australian Presbyterians, and Baptists, and in 1890 the first English mission to Korea was founded under Bishop Corfi. A Roman Catholic church and a very large Roman Catholic cathedral with a spire occupy two of the most prominent sites in Seoul. One of the best sites is covered with the buildings belonging to the Methodist Episcopal Mission, schools for girls and boys, a printing press, a union church, and hospitals for men and women, with which dispensaries are connected. The girls' school connected with this mission is one of the most admirable in its organization and results that I have seen. The Presbyterians occupy a lowlier position, but have the same class of agencies at work, and lately the king handed over to them a large hospital in the city, known as the Government Hospital. 
Bishop Corfi's mission occupies two modest sites in modest fashion, all its buildings being strictly Korean. On one side of Seoul, at Nak Tong, it has the community house, where the bishop, clergy, doctor, and printer live and have their private chapel. Also the mission press, and a very efficient hospital for men, admirably nursed by the sisters of St. Peter's Kilburn. On the slope of the British Legation Hill are the English Church of the Advent, a beautiful Korean building, the community house of the Sisters of St. Peter, and the women's hospital buildings, embracing a dispensary, a new hospital, the Dora Bird Memorial, of 18 beds, with a room for a private patient, besides an old hospital to be used only for infectious diseases. These are under the charge of a lady physician and are also nursed by the Sisters of St. Peter, who in both hospitals do admirable work in a bright and loving spirit which is beyond all praise. There are about 75 Protestant and 34 Roman missionaries in Korea, mostly in Seoul. The language has the reputation of being very difficult, and few of this large number have acquired facility in the use of it. The idea of a nation destitute of a religion, and gladly accepting one brought by the foreigner, must be dropped. The religion the Korean would accept is one which would show him how to get money without working for it. The indifference is extreme, the religious faculty is absent, there are no religious ideas to appeal to, and the moral teachings of Confucius have little influence with any class. The Korean has got on so well without a religion, in his own opinion, that he does not want to be troubled with one, especially a religion of restraint and sacrifice which has no worldly good to offer. After nearly twelve years of work, the number of baptized native Protestant Christians in 1897 was 777. The Roman Catholics claim 28,802, and that the average rate of increase is 1,000 a year. Their priests live mostly in the wretched hovels of the people, amidst their foul surroundings, and share their unpalatable food and sordid lives. Doubtless, mission work in Korea will not differ greatly from such work elsewhere among the older civilizations. Barriers of indifference, superstition, and inertness exist, and whatever progress is made will probably be chiefly through medical missions, showing Christianity in action and native agency, and through such schools as I have already alluded to, which leave every feature of Korean custom, dress, and manner of living untouched, while Christian instruction and training are the first objects, and where the gentle, loving, ennobling influence of the teacher is felt during every hour of the day. End of section 5section six of korea and her neighbors by isabella l bird this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by avahi in november two thousand twenty chapter five the sailing of the sampan at a point when the difficulties in the way of my projected journey had come to be regarded as insurmountable owing to the impossibility of getting an interpreter and I had begun to say, if I go, instead of when I go, Mr. Miller, a young missionary, offered his services, on condition that he might take his servant to supplement his imperfect knowledge of Korean. Bishop Corfi provided me with a Chinese servant, Wong, a fine, big, cheery fellow with inexhaustible good nature and contentment, never a cloud of annoyance on his face, always making the best of everything, ready to help everyone, true, honest, plucky, passionately fond of flowers, faithful, manly, always well and hungry, and with a passable knowledge of English. He was a chifu sampan man when Bishop Corfi picked him up, and nothing could make him into a regular servant, but he suited me admirably, and I was grieved indeed when I had to part with him. 
the difficulty about money which then beset every traveller in the interior cost a good deal of anxious planning the japanese yen and its subdivisions were only current in seoul and the treaty ports there were no bankers or money changers anywhere and the only coin accepted was the cash of which at that time three thousand two hundred nominally went to the dollar this coin is strung in hundreds on straw strings and the counting of it and the carrying of it and the being without it are all a nuisance it takes six men or one pony to carry one hundred yen in cash ten pounds travellers through their consuls can obtain from the foreign office a letter to officials throughout the country called a kwanja entitling their bearer to their good offices and especially to food transport and money but as it usually happens that a magistrate advancing money to a foreigner is not repaid by the governor however accurately the sum has been paid in seoul the arrangement is a very odious one to officials and i promised our consul that i would not make use of it for money consequently the boat which i engaged for the earlier part of the journey was ballasted with cash and i took a bag of silver yen and trusted to my usual good fortune which in this case did not altogether fail in addition to this uncouth and heavy burden i took a saddle a trestle bed with bedding and mosquito net muslin curtains a folding chair two changes of clothing korean string shoes and a regulation waterproof cloak besides i took green tea curry powder and twenty pounds of flour i discarded all superfluities such as flasks collapsing cups hand mirrors teapots sandwich tins lamps and tinned soups meats bouillon and fruits the kitchen equipment consisted of a japanese brazier for charcoal a shallow japanese pan and frying pan and a small kettle with charcoal tongs the whole costing under two dollars the table equipment was limited a small mug two plates and a soup plate all in enameled iron and a knife fork and spoon which folded up a knife fork and spoon of common make being reserved for the kitchen tables trays tablecloths and sheets were from thenceforth unknown luxuries i mention my outfit because i know it to be a sufficient one and that every pound of superfluous weight adds to the difficulty of getting transport in korea and in many other countries besides i was encumbered for the first time with a tripod camera weighing sixteen pounds and a hand camera weighing four pounds with the apparatus belonging to them and had to reduce other things accordingly on the whole it is best to trust to the food of the country korea produces eggs and in some regions chickens the chestnuts are good and though the flour which can be got in a few places is gritty and the rice is a bad colour both are eatable and the foreigner always an object of suspicion is less so when he buys and eats native viands and does not carry about with him a number of to koreans outlandish looking utensils and commodities regarding much of the region which i proposed to visit no information could be obtained either from europeans or korean officials and the best map a reduction of a japanese map by sir e sato turned out to be astray mr warner of bishop corfi's mission had ascended the north branch of the han but it is still doubtful whether any european has been up the south and much larger branch which i explored on this journey it was certain only that the country was mountainous and that the rapids were numerous and severe it had also been said earnestly and with an appearance of knowledge by several people that it would be impossible for a lady to travel in the interior and certainly much of what i heard supposing it to be fact was sufficiently deterring but from many similar statements in other countries i knew that a deduction of at least fifty per cent must be made 
On the 14th of April, 1894, when the environs of Seoul were seen through a mist of green, and plum and peach blossom was in the ascendant, and the heliotrope azalea was just beginning to tint the hillsides, and the air was warm and muggy, I left the kind friends who had done much to make my visit to Seoul interesting and agreeable, and went on pony-back through the south gate, passing the temple of the god of war, and over a pine-clothed ridge of Namsan to Han Kang, four miles from Seoul, a little shipping village, where my boat lay, to avoid a rapid which lies between it and Mapu. Up to Mapu, fifty-six miles from Chemulpo, there is a very considerable tidal rise and fall which ceases at the rapid. A limp, silent crowd of men and boys denoted the whereabouts of the boat, from which Mr. Miller's servant, Che On E, emerging with the broad smile with which Orientals announce bad news, informed us that the boat was too small. There were very few to be caught, and I had not seen this one, Mr. Wyers, the legation constable, having engaged her for me, and I went on board at once, with much curiosity, as she was to be my home for an indefinite number of weeks. And small she truly was, only twenty-eight feet overall, by four feet ten inches at her widest part, and with her whole cargo, animate and inanimate, on board, she only drew three inches of water. The roof, which was put on at my request, was a marvel. A slight framework of a ridge pole and some sticks precariously tied together supported some mats of pheasant grass, with the long blades hanging down outside and over the gunwale, which was only twelve inches high. These mats were tied together over the ridge pole and let in a streak of daylight all the way along. At its highest part this roof was only four feet six inches. It was just possible to sit under it without stooping. By putting forked sticks under what by courtesy were called the rafters, they could be lifted a foot from the gunwale to let in light and air. Two or three times in a strong breeze this roof collapsed and fell about our heads. In the fore part of the boat, seven feet long, one boatman paddled or poled, and in the hinder part, four feet long, the other poled or worked an oar. But the fore part was also our kitchen and poultry yard, and the boatman's kitchen. There also were kept faggots, driftwood, and miscellaneous stores, with the food and water in unappetizing proximity. There, too, Wong and Che On E spent their day, and there they all cooked, ate, and washed clothes, and there at night the boatmen curled themselves up and slept in a space four feet by four. The rest of the sampan divided itself naturally by the thwarts. My part, the centre, was originally eight feet by four feet ten inches, but encroachments by no means gradual, constituted it a free coop for sacks, rice bags, clothing, and baskets, till it was reduced to a bare six feet, into which space my bed, chair, saddle, and luggage were packed for five weeks. In the hinder division, seven feet by four feet four inches, Mr. Miller lived and studied, and he, Wong, and Che On E slept. It was scarcely possible for six people and their gear to be more closely packed. Mr. Miller, though not an experienced traveller, cheerfully made the best of everything then and afterwards, and preserved the serenity of his temper under all circumstances. The sampan's crew of two consisted of Kim, her owner, a tall, wiry, picturesque, aristocratic-looking old man, and his hired men, who was never heard to speak except on two occasions, when, being very drunk, he developed a remarkable loquacity. On the whole, they were well behaved and quiet. I saw them in close proximity every hour of the day, and was never annoyed by anything they did. Kim was paid thirty dollars per month for the boat, and his laziness was wonderful. To dawdle along, to start late and tie up early, 
to crawl when he tracked, and to pole or paddle with the least expenditure of labor, was his policy. To pole for an hour, then tie up and take a smoke, to spend half a day now and then on buying rice, to work on my sensibilities by feigning exhaustion, and to adopt every dodge of the lazy man, was his practice. The contract stipulated for three men, and he only took one, making some evasive excuse. But I have said the worst I can say when I write that they never made more than ten miles in a day, and often not more than seven, and that when they came to severe rapids they always wanted to go back. Footnote. I took very careful notes on the Han, but as minute details would be uninteresting to the general reader, and would involve a good deal of apparent repetition, I shall give only the most salient features of a journey which, if it has ever been made, has certainly not been described. End footnote. Mr. Wires busied himself in putting a mat on the floor and stowing things as neatly as possible, and when curtains had been put up, the quarters, though cribbed, cabined, and confined, looked quite tolerable. The same limp, silent crowd looked on till we left Han Kang at midday. In a few hours things shook into shape, and after all the discomforts were not great, possibly the greatest being that the smoke and the smell of the boatman's malodorous food blew through the boat. End of section 6「Section seven of Korea and Her Neighbors by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in November two thousand twenty. Chapter six On the River of Golden Sand. During the five weeks which I spent on the Han, though the routine of daily life varied little, there was no monotony. The country and the people were new and we mixed freely, almost too freely, with the latter. The scenery varied hourly, and after the first few days became not only beautiful, but in places magnificent and full of surprises. The spring was in its early beauty, and the trees in their first vividness of green, red, and gold. The flowers and flowering shrubs were in their glory, the crops at their most attractive stage, birds sang in the thickets, Rich fragrant odours were wafted off on the water, red cattle, though rarely, fed knee-deep in abounding grass, and the waters of the Han, nearly at their lowest, were clear as crystal, and their broken sparkle flashed back the sunbeams which passed through a sky as blue as that of Tibet. There was a prosperous look about the country too, and its security was indicated by the frequent occurrence of solitary farms with high secluding fences standing under the deep shade of fine walnut and persimmon trees. Unlike the bare, arid, denuded hillsides between Chemulpo and Seoul, the slopes along much of the route are wooded, and in many cases forested both with coniferae and deciduous trees, among which there are occasionally picturesque clumps of umbrella pines. The Pinus sinensis and the Abies microsperma abound, and there are two species of oak and three of maple, a platanus, juniper, ash, mountain ash, birch, hazel, sophora japonica, euonymus alatus, tuya orientalis, and many others. The heliotrope, pink and scarlet azaleas, were in all their beauty, flushing the hillsides, and white and sulphur-yellow clematis, actinidia, and a creeping euonymus were abundant. Of the wealth of flowering shrubs, mostly white blossomed, I had never seen one before, either in garden or greenhouse, except the familiar syringa and spiria. The beautiful Ampelopsis veitiana was in its freshest spring green and tender red, concealing tree trunks, depending from branches and draping every cliff and rock with its exquisite foliage, 
and roses, red and white, of a free-growing, climbing variety, having possession even of tall trees, hung their fragrant festoons over the roads. It was all very charming, though a little wanting in life. True, there were butterflies and dragonflies innumerable, and brilliant green and brown snakes in numbers, and at first the Han was cheery with mallard and mandarin duck, geese and common teal. In the rice fields the imperial crane, the egret and the pink ibis, with the deep flush of spring on his plumage, were not uncommon, and peregrines, kestrels, falcons and buzzards were occasionally seen. But the songbirds were few. The forlorn note of the nightjar was heard, and the loud, cheerful call of the gorgeous ringed pheasant to his dowdy mate, but the trilling, warbling, and cooing which are the charm of an English copsewood in springtime are altogether absent, the chatter of the blue magpie and the noisy flight of the warbler being poor substitutes for that entrancing concert. Of beast life, undomesticated, there were no traces, and the domestic animals are few. Sheep do not thrive on the sour natural grasses of Korea, and if goats are kept, I never saw any. A small black pig not much larger than a pug is universal, and there are bulls and ponies about the better class of farms. There are big buff dogs, but these are kept only to a limited extent on the Han, in the idea that they attract the nocturnal visits of tigers. The dogs are noisy and voluble, and rush towards a stranger as if bent on attack, but it is mere bravado, they are despicable cowards, and run away howling at the shaking of a stick. Leopards, antelopes, and several species of deer are found among the mountains bordering the Han, but the beast by preeminence there, as throughout Korea, is the tiger. At first I was very incredulous regarding his existence and depredations. It was impossible to believe that peaceful agricultural valleys surrounded by hills, thinly clothed with dwarf oak shrub, could be ravaged by him, that dogs, pigs, and cattle are continually carried off by him, and that human beings visiting each other at night or belated on the roads are his frequent prey. But the constant repetition of tiger stories, the terror of the villagers, the refusal of Mapu and coolies to travel after dark, the certainty that in several places the loss of life had been recent, and that even in the trim settlement of one son, a boy and child had been seized the day before I arrived, and had been eaten on the hillside above the town, have made me a believer. Possibly some of the depredations attributed to tigers may be really the work of leopards, which undoubtedly abound, and have been shot even within the walls of Seoul. High up the Han, in a very lovely lake-like stretch, there is a village recently deserted because of the persistency with which tigers had carried off its inhabitants. The Korean tiger, judging from its skin, in which the long hair grows out of a thick coat of fine fur, resembles the Manchurian tiger. I have heard of one which measured 13 feet 14 inches, but never saw a skin more than 11 feet 8 inches in length. The tiger hunters form what may be called a brigade or a corps, and may be called on for military service. They were conspicuous objects in the Kurdong, with their long matchlock guns, loose blue uniforms, and conical-crowned, broad-brimmed hats. The tiger appears on the royal standard, and tiger skins are the insignia of high office, the leopard skins indicating lower rank. The Chinese give a very high price for tiger's bones as a medicine, considering them a specific for strength and courage. Tiger hunting as a business seems confined to the northern provinces. On the Han, and specially along its northern affluents, are found three, if not four, species of deer, and the horns, in the velvet of the large deer, Cervus manchuricus, which fetch from forty to sixty dollars a pair, are the prize most wanted by the hunters. Pheasants are literally without number and are very tame, 
I constantly saw them feeding among the crops within a few yards of the peasants at their work. They are usually brought down by falcons, which, when well trained, command as high a price as nine dollars. To obtain them, three small birds are placed in a cylinder of loosely woven bamboo, mounted horizontally on a pole. On the peregrine alighting on this, a man who has been concealed throws a net over the hole. The bird is kept in a tight sleeve for three days. Then he is daily liberated in a room and trained to follow a piece of meat pulled over the floor by a string. At the end of a week he is taken out on his master's wrist and slipped when game is seen. He is not trained to return. The master rushes upon him and secures him before he has time to devour the bird. A man told me that he sometimes got between twenty and thirty pheasants a day, but had to walk or run one hundred li to do it. The season was nearly over, yet I bought fine pheasants on the Han for three pence and four pence each. They were cheaper than chickens. The Han itself, rising in the diamond mountain of Kongwon Do, and formed by a number of nearly parallel affluents, Next to the border river Amnok is the river of Korea, which it cuts nearly across, its eastern extremity being within 25 miles of the Sea of Japan and its western at Chemulpo. I ascended it to within 40 miles of the Sea of Japan and estimate the length of its navigable waters for small, flat-bottomed craft at about 170 miles. A clear, bright stream with a bottom of white sand golden gravel or rock, chiefly limestone, with an average width of 250 yards well sustained to the head of navigation, narrowed at times by walls of rock, or divided by grassy islands in its lower course, full of pebbly shallows over which it ripples gaily, its upper waters abounding in rocky rapids, many of them severe and dangerous, its most marked features, to my thinking, are its absence of affluence after it emerges from the Diamond Mountain, and its singular alternations of shallow with very deep water. It was a common occurrence to have to drag my boat, drawing only three inches, through water too shallow to float her, and at the top of the ripple to come upon a broad, still, lake-like, deep, green expanse, twenty feet deep, continuing for a mile or two. After passing the forks there are forty-six rapids, many of them very severe, before reaching Yongchun, which, for practical purposes, may be regarded as the limit of navigable water. These are a most serious obstacle in the way of navigation, but as there is usually a deep water channel in the middle, sailing junks of twenty-five tons, taking advantage of strong, favourable winds, get up as far as Tanyang. Beyond, boats not twice the size of my sampan must be used, which are only poled and dragged, and as they must keep near the shore, among rocks and furious water, their progress is very slow, not more than seven miles a day. Nevertheless, the Han, with all its difficulties and obstructions, is the great artery of communication for much of Kongwon Do and Kyong Kivi Do, and for the northeast portion of Chung Tong Do. Down it, all the excess produce of this great region goes to Seoul, and nearly all merchandise, salt, and foreign goods come up it from the seaboard to pass into the hands of the Posang or merchant peddlers at various points and through them to reach the market-places of the interior. During the first ten days from Han Kang, there were seventy-five junks a day on an average, bound up and downstream. There is a very large floating population on the Han. There is not a bridge along its whole length, but communication is kept up by forty-seven free ferries provided by government. Not having been able to learn anything about the route or any of its features, I was much surprised to find a very large population, not only along the river, but in the parallel valleys, many of them of great length and extreme fertility, in its neighbourhood. It was only necessary to climb a ridge or hill to see numbers of these, given up to rice culture, 
and thickly sprinkled with farming villages. Along the river banks only, between Han Kang and Yongchun, there are 176 villages. Much of the soil is rich alluvium, from 5 to 11 feet deep, and most prolific, bearing two heavy crops a year, not rice lands, with little or no manure. There is on the whole an air of greater ease and prosperity about the Han Valley than about any other region that I have seen in Korea. Footnote. I am inclined to think that Europeans habitually underestimate the population. The average I obtained is eight to a house, taking seventy houses at random, and this estimate is borne out by General Greathouse, for some years in Korean government service, and Mr. Moffat, a resident and traveller in Korea for seven years, both of whom have given some attention to the subject. It must be understood that a Korean household rarely, if ever, consists of a man, wife, and children only. There are parents and relationly hangers-on, to say nothing of possible servants. End footnote. The people are of fine physique and generally robust appearance. Some of them had evidently attained great age. There were a few sore eyes and some mild skin diseases, both produced by dirt, but there were no sickly-looking people. Infants abounded. Except for a monastery and temple, both Buddhist, not far from Seoul, and the Confucian temples at the magistracies, there were no signs of any other cult than that of demons. There were two shrines containing miriocs, in both cases water-worn boulders chafed into some resemblance to humanity, spirit shrines on heights, and under large trees heaps of stones sacred to demons, tall posts with the tops rudely cut into something suggestive of distorted human faces, painted black and blue, with straw ropes, with dependent straw tassels, like those denoting Shinto shrines in Japan, stretched across the road to prevent the ingress of malignant spirits, and trees with many streamers of rag, as well as worn-out straw shoes hanging in their branches, as offerings to these beings. The dwellings do not vary much, except that the roofs of the better class are tiled. In villages where there is a resident Yangban or a squire noble, his house is usually pretentious and covers a considerable area, but yields in stateliness to the family tomb, always on a hill slope, a great grass mound on a grass platform backed by horseshoe-shaped grass banks and usually by a number of fine pines. In front of the mound is invariably a stone altar on two stone drums, stone posts which support the canopy used when sacrifices are offered to the spirit of the deceased, and stone lanterns. A few of the grander tombs are approached by a short avenue of stone figures of warriors, horses, servants, and sheep. Footnote. Such figures, where they occur, are always spoken of by foreigners as sheep, but I doubt whether this animal appears at any but royal tombs, where it is probably represented as offered in sacrifice by the king. End footnote. The peasants' houses do not differ from those of the poorer classes in Seoul. The walls are of mud, and the floors, also of mud, are warmed by a number of flues, the most economical of all methods of heating, as the quantity of dried leaves and weeds that a boy of ten can carry keeps two rooms above seventy degrees for twelve hours. Every house is screened by a fence six feet high of bamboo or plated reeds, and is usually surrounded by fruit trees. In one room are angpak, great earthenware jars big enough to contain a man, in which rice, millet, barley, and water are kept that is frequently in small houses the women's room. The men's room has little in it but the mat on the floor, pillows of solid wood, and large red and green hat cases ranging from the rafters in which the crinoline dress hats are stowed away. Latticed and paper-covered doors and windows denote a position above that of the poorest. A pigsty, much more substantial than the house, is always alongside of it. 
The villages from about 50 li up the Han from Seoul may all be described as farming villages. Lower down, they export large quantities of firewood and charcoal for the daily needs of a capital, which has left itself without a stick available for fuel in its immediate neighborhood. No special industries exist. The peasants make their rude wooden plows and spades shod with iron, and two villages within forty li of Seoul supply them with their angpaks and culinary utensils of the same coarse ware, which stands fire and serves instead of iron pots. Such iron utensils as are used are imported from Seoul along with salt and foreign piece goods for dress clothes, and are paid for with rice, grain and tobacco. The people are peasant farmers in the strictest sense, most of them holding their lands from the young buns at their pleasure. The proprietor has the right to turn them out after harvest, but it does not seem to be very oppressively exercised. He provides the seed, and they pay him half the yield. Some men buy land and obtain title deeds. In 1894 they paid in taxes on one day's ploughing, so much for barley, beans, rice and cotton, the sum varying. But a new system of collecting tax on the assessed value of the land has come into operation, which renders squeezing on the part of the tax collector far more difficult. Money is scarcely current, business transactions are by barter, or the peasant pays with his labour. His chief outlay is on foreign piece cottons for his best clothes. These are thirty cash per measure of twenty inches, dearer at Yong Wall, the reputed head of navigation, than at Seoul. The population of the Han Valley is not poor, if by poverty is to be understood scarcity of the necessaries of life. The people have enough for themselves and for all and sundry who, according to Korean custom, may claim their hospitality. Probably they are all in debt. It is very rare indeed to find a Korean who has not this millstone round his neck, and they are destitute of money or possessions other than those they absolutely require. They appear lazy. I then thought them so, but they live under a regime under which they have no security for the gains of labor, and for a man to be reported to be making money, or attaining even the luxury of a brass dinner service, would be simply to lay himself open to the rapacious attentions of the nearest Mandarin and his myrmidons, or to a demand from a loan from an adjacent Yangban. Nevertheless, the homesteads of the Han Valley have a look of substantial comfort. Certainly the meals of the men are taken in far greater tidiness than is usually among laborers. The women, as is the fashion with women, eat anyhow and gobble up their lord's leavings. All meals for men are served on small, circular, dark wooden tables, a few inches high, one for each person. Rice is the staple of diet and is served in a great bowl, but besides this there are seldom fewer than five or six glazed earthenware vessels containing savoury, or rather tasty, condiments. Footnote. These remarks apply to every part of Korea which I afterwards saw. End footnote. Chopsticks and small flattish spoons of horn or base metal are used for eating. In the villages, as distinguished from the hamlets, on the Han there are schools, but they are not open to the public. Families club together and engage a teacher, but the pupils are only of the scholarly class, and only Chinese learning in Wen Li is taught, this being the stepping stone to official position, the object of the ambition of every Korean. En Mun is despised, and is not used as a written language by the educated class. I observed, however, that a great many men of the lower orders on the river were able to read their own script. With the exception of two small Buddhist establishments not far from Seoul, priests are non-existent on the Han, nor is there any Christian propaganda, Protestant or Roman, at work, though Roman missionaries were formerly stationed at two points near the forks. Demon worship prevails throughout the whole region. 
the river is frozen for from three to four months in the winter and tends to inundate the lower lands for two months in the summer the bridal tracks which skirt it and diverge from it are infamous the valley has no mails and of course no newspapers the tonghaks rebels or armed reformers were strong in a region immediately to the south of the great bend which showed some dissatisfaction with things as they were and a desire for reform in some minds so far as i could learn the region is not rich in ordinary minerals i could hear nothing of the burning earth though the geological formation renders its existence probable copper and iron are worked not far from the north branch to a limited extent but the han is the river of golden sand and though the height of the gold season is after the summer rains the ori sacra fames even then attracted gangs of men to the river banks and gold in the mountains was a subject on which the koreans were always voluble the attitude of the people was friendly i never saw a trace of actual hostility though on the higher waters of the south branch it was very doubtful whether they had seen a european before their curiosity was naturally enormous and whenever the boat tied up for a day it showed itself by crowds sitting on the bank as close to it as they could get staring apathetically they were frequently timid and snatched up their fowls and hid them when we came in sight but a little friendly explanation of our honesty of purpose and above all the sight of a few strings of cash usually set everything straight a foreigner is absolutely safe during the oft times tedious process of hauling up the rapids when mr miller and the servants were tugging at the ropes i constantly strolled for two or three hours by myself along the river bank and whether the path led through solitary places or through villages i never met with anything more disagreeable than curiosity shown in a very ill-bred fashion and that was chiefly on the part of women when the people understood that they would be paid it was not difficult to procure the little they had to sell at fairly reasonable rates they were disposed to be communicative and showed very little suspicion far less indeed than in parts of korea where foreigners are common my chinese servant was everywhere an object of most friendly curiosity and a centre of pleasurable interest the mercury during april and may ranged from forty two degrees to seventy two degrees and the barometer showed remarkable steadiness there were two heavy rainfalls but the weather on the whole was superb and the atmosphere clear and dry. End of section 7。section 8 of Korea and her neighbors by Isabella L. Bird。this librivox recording is in the public domain。recording by Avai in November 2020。chapter 7。views afloat。a few hours sufficed for settling in our very narrow quarters and by the end of the second day we had shaken down into an orderly routine by dint of much driving kim was induced to start about seven at which hour i had my flour and water stir about the halts for smoking cooking and eating were many and about five o'clock he used to simulate exhaustion a deception to which his lean form and thin face with its straight straggling white hair lent themselves effectively then followed the daily wrangle about the place to tie up kim naturally desiring a village and the proximity of junks with much nocturnal smoking and gossip while my wish was for solitude quiet and a pebbly river bottom and with mr miller's aid i usually carried my point between Kim's laziness and the frequent occurrence of rapids, ten miles came to be considered a good day's journey. The same rapids made any settled plan of occupation impossible, yet on the early stages of the journey, when there were long quiet stretches of water between them, it was pleasant to elevate the roof and have a quiet morning's work till dinner at twelve 
This, it must be confessed, was a precarious meal. Chickens for curry were not always attainable, and were often so small as to suggest the eggshell, and the river fish, which were sometimes got by pouncing on a boy fisherman, were very minute and bony. Chestnuts often eked out a very scanty meal. Wong used to hunt along the river banks for wild onions and carrots, after the stock of the cultivated roots was exhausted, and he made paste of flour and water, rolled it with a bamboo on the top of a box, cut it into biscuits with the lid of a tin, and baked them in the frying pan. Rice fritters, too, he made morning, noon, and night. Afternoon tea of burrows and welcomes tabloids was never omitted, and after tying up came supper, an impoverished repetition of dinner, the whole a wholesome regimen, invariably eaten with appetite. Visiting villages and small towns, only to find the first a collection of mud hovels, and the last mud hovels with the addition of ruinous official buildings and a forlorn Confucian temple, climbing to ridges bordering the Han to get a view of fertile and populous valleys, conversing with and interrogating the people through Mr. Miller and his servant, taking geographical notes, temperatures, altitudes, barometric readings, and measurements of the river, nearly all unfortunately lost in a rapid on the downward journey, collecting and drying plants, photographing and developing negatives under difficulties, all the blankets and waterproofs in the boat being requisitioned for the creation of a dark room, all these occupations made up busy and interesting days. The first two days were spent in turning the flank of the range on which is the so-called fortress of Nam Han, with its priest soldiers, one of the four which are supposed to guard Seoul and offer refuge in times of trouble. On the right bank there are many villages of farmers, woodcutters and charcoal burners, and on the left an expanse of cultivated sandy soil between the mountains and the river, there a broad rapid stream rippling brightly over white sand or golden gravel. After passing the Yangkun Magistracy, a large village with a long street, where a whole fleet of sampans was loading with country produce for the capital, and a number of junks were unloading salt, the Han makes a sharp bend to the south, and after a long rapid, expands into a very broad stream. The valley broadens also, and becomes flat. The hills, absolutely denuded even of scrub, are low and recede from the river. Their serrated black ridges of rock, and their deeply scored, corrugated, flushed sides, which spring had scarcely tinged with green, are forbidding, and though the valley was green with young wheat, that is quite the most monotonous and uninteresting part of the journey. After circumventing the fine fortress summit of Nam Han, the river enters the mountains. From that time up to the head of possible navigation, the scenery in its variety, beauty, and unexpectedness exhausts the vocabulary of admiration. A short distance above Hang Kan is the Buddhist temple of Rieng An Sa, dedicated to the dragon, one of the two Buddhist sanctuaries on the long course of the Han. On the left bank a low stone wall encloses a spot on which a female dragon alighted from heaven in the days of the last dynasty, and where still, in times of flood or drought, sacrifices are offered and libations poured out to heaven. The only other temple is that of Pyok Chol on the right bank of the Han, above Yoju, four days from Seoul. A steep wooded promontory projects into the still, deep, green water, crowned with two brick and stone pagodas. In a wooded dell at the back there are some picturesque and elaborately carved and painted temples and monastic buildings, and a fine bell five centuries old, surmounted by an entanglement of dragons, which, with some medallions on the side, are of very bold design and successful workmanship, 
and the whole is said to have been cast in chung chong do before the japanese stole the arts and artists a pavilion for the temple dramas was occupied for the afternoon by a large picnic of women and children from yoju in one of the monastic courts there is a marble pagoda with some finely executed bas reliefs on its sides claiming a not distant kinship with those of the marble pagoda in seoul the establishment consisted of an abbot nineteen monks and four novices the abbot was the most refined intellectual and aristocratic looking man that i saw in korea with an innate courtesy and refinement of manner rare anywhere he carried the weight of seventy years with much grace and dignity and made us cordially welcome this was the last we saw of buddhism till we reached the diamond mountain six weeks later at the village of tomaknadali where we tied up they make the great purple black jars and pots which are in universal use their method is primitive they had no objection to be watched and were quite communicative the potters pursue their trade in open sheds digging up the clay close by the stock in trade is a pit in which an uncouth potter's wheel revolves the base of which is turned by the feet of a man who sits on the edge of the hole a wooden spatula a mason's wooden trowel a curved stick and a piece of rough rag are the tools efficient for the purpose fifty li higher up a few li from the river are beds of kaolin used in the government pottery and for the finer kinds of porcelain for two days the han was about four hundred yards wide with a very tortuous course abounding in rapids shallows and green islands with great expanses of pure white sand on its left bank and frequent villages of woodcutters and charcoal burners on both on the sixteenth we reached the forks at the village of ma chai there the north branch which was to be afterwards traversed comes down and the south branch in every way more important arrives from the southward between the two there is a pretty wooded island then pink with azalea blossom beyond is a fine stretch of alluvium nearly six feet deep bearing rich crops of barley and wheat but entirely unprotected from the desolations of the river in its annual rise which engulfs every year acres of this prolific soil ten years ago the han altering its course brought down from the top of a steep bank at some distance a huge concrete double coffin nine feet long and sixteen inches thick the great alluvial expanse was made over to the buddhists by the king who receives annually a fixed amount of the produce between kim's laziness and plausibility and the rapids which though not severe were frequent and the food hunt which was a necessity our progress was slow and it was not till the nineteenth of april that we reached yoju the first town of any importance and the birthplace of the late queen it is memorable to me as being the first place where the crowd was obstreperous and obnoxious though not hostile it is humiliating to be a show and to get nothing by it i went out on a rock in the river in the hope of using the prismatic compass in peace and was nearly pushed into the water and when i went up into the gate tower a stamping curious crowd climbing on everything that afforded a point of vantage shook the old fabric so severely that the delicately balanced needle never came to rest the crowd was dirty the streets were foul and decayed and worst of all was the magistrate's yamen to which we had occasion to go and where i found that the kwanja was powerless to obtain even common civility the yamen though finely situated and enclosing in its ground a large and much decorated pavilion for royal use but used as a children's playground was in a state of wreck the woodwork was crumbling beams and rafters were falling down lacquer and paint were scaling off torn paper fluttered from the lattice windows 
plaster hung from the grimy walls the once handsome gate tower was on its last legs in the courtyard some flagstones had subsided others were exalted and audacious ragweed and shepherd's purse grew in their crevices poverty neglect and melancholy reigned supreme within the gates were plenty of those persons who suck the life-blood of korea there were soldiers in tyrolese hats and coarse cotton uniforms in which blue predominated yamen runners in abundance writers officers of injustice messengers pretending to have business on hand and many small rooms in which were many more men sitting on the floor smoking long pipes with writing materials beside them one attendant by no means polite took my kwanja to the magistrate and very roughly led the way to two small rooms in the inner one of which the official was seated on the floor surrounded by a few elderly men we were directed to stand at the opening between the two rooms and behind us pressed as many of the crowd as could get in i bowed low no notice was taken an attendant handed the magistrate a pipe so long that it would have been impossible for him to light it for himself and he smoked mr miller hoped that he was in good health no reply and the eyes were never raised mr miller explained the object of the visit which was to get a little information about the neighbourhood there was only a very curt reply and as the great man turned to one of his subordinates and began to talk to him and rude remarks were circulating we took leave with the usual korean phrases of politeness which were not reciprocated we were told that there are many high young buns in yoju and it seemed natural that the magistrate of a town of only seven hundred houses should not be a man of high rank the story goes that when he came they used low talk to him and ordered him about as their inferior so he lives chiefly in seoul and the man who sat in sordid state amidst the ruins of the spacious and elaborately decorated yamen does his work and divides the spoils and the young bans are left to whatever their devices may be but this is not an isolated case nearly all the river magistrates are mainly absentees and spend their time salaries and squeezings in the capital i had similar interviews with three other magistrates i asked nothing except change in cash for three yen and on each occasion was told that the treasury was empty my kwanja a pompous document from the foreign office was of this use only it procured me a chicken at a high price in a town where the people were unwilling to sell at yoju i saw for the only time either in korea or china the interior of an ancestral temple it is a lofty building with a curved tiled roof and black wood ceiling approached by a roofed gateway opposite the entrance is an ebony stool on which are a brass bowl and incense burner above this is a large altar supporting two candlesticks with candles and above that again an ebony stand on which rests a polished black marble tablet inscribed with the name of the deceased behind that in a recess in the wall with elaborate fretwork doors is his life-sized portrait in chinese style the floor is covered with plain matting in the tablet the third soul of the deceased is supposed to dwell food is placed before it three times daily for three years in the case of a parent and there the relations after the expiration of that period meet all stated seasons every year and offer sacrifice and worship at the large and prosperous looking village of chon yang the people told us that a circus was about to perform and impelled us towards it but finding that it was in the courtyard of a large tiled roof mansion in good repair and of much pretension we were retiring when we were cordially invited to enter and i was laid hold of literally 
by the serving women and dragged through the women's court and into the women's apartments. I was surrounded by fully forty women, old and young, wives, concubines, servants, all in gala dress and much adorned. The principal wife, a very young girl wearing some Indian jewellery, was very pretty and had an exquisite complexion, but one and all were destitute of manners. They investigated my clothing, pulled me about, took off my hat and tried it on, untwisted my hair and absorbed my hairpins, pulled off my gloves and tried them on with shrieks of laughter, and then, but not till they had exhausted all the amusement which could be got out of me, they bethought themselves of entertaining me by taking me through their apartments, crowding upon me to such an extent as they did so that I was nearly carried off my feet. They took me through fourteen communicating rooms, with fine parquet floors, mostly spoiled by being covered in whole or in part with Brussels tapestry carpets of loud and vulgar patterns in hideous aniline dyes. Great mirrors in tawdry gilt flames glared from the tender colouring of the walls, and French clocks asserted their expensive vulgarity in every room. In the outer court a rope was stretched for the rope dancers, and kettle drums and reed pipes gave promise of such music as Koreans love. I was escorted across two other courts surrounded by verandas supported on dressed stone, and with iron railings instead of wood, to an elevated reception room where a foreign table and some tawdry velvet-covered chairs clashed with the tastefulness of the walls and the fine mats bordered with the Greek fret on the floor. French clocks, all keeping different time, were much on evidence. The host, a youth of eighteen, eldest son of the governor of one of the most important governorships in Korea, welcomed us, and seemed anxious to receive us courteously. Wine, soup, eggs, and kimchi, an elaborate sort of sauerkraut, were produced, and had to be partaken of, our host meanwhile smoking an expensive foreign cigar, which gave him an opportunity for the ostentatious display of a showy diamond ring. He was dressed in sea-green silk, and wore a hat of very fine quality. He wanted to see the inside of my camera and to be photographed, for which purpose we retired to the back of the house to avoid the enormous crowd which had collected, and which was becoming every moment more impolite and disorderly. I made him exchange the foreign cigar, vulgar in a Korean's mouth, for the national long pipe. At this juncture some friends came up, hangers-on, who were feasting with him to celebrate his having obtained a good place in a recent examination, and made a rudely worded request for our immediate departure. It was obvious that, after their unmannerly curiosity had been satisfied, our presence, and the courteous treatment extended to us, spoiled their amusement. The ringleader spoke roughly to our host, who turned his back on us and retired meekly to his own apartments, although he is a son of an official of the highest rank and a near relative of the late Queen. We could only make a somewhat ignominious exit, having been truly played out. This rage for French clocks, German mirrors, foreign cigars, chairs upholstered in velvet, and the general foreign tawdriness is spreading rapidly among the young swells who have money to spend, vulgarizing Korean simplicity and setting the example to those below them of an extravagant and purely selfish expenditure. The house, with its many courtyards, was new and handsome, and money glared from every point. I was glad to return to the simplicity of my boat, hoping that with the plain living, high thinking might be combined. Beyond the mountains east of Yoju, the Han passes through a noble stretch of rich alluvium, bearing superb and fairly clean crops, 
and bordered by low, serrated, denuded, and much corrugated ranges, faintly tinged with green. On this gently rolling plain are many towns and villages, among the larger of which are Wonju, Chungju, Chongfyong, and Tanyang, all on or near the river, by which they conveniently export their surplus produce, chiefly beans, tobacco, and rice, and receive in return their supplies of salt and foreign goods. Even at that season of low water, the traffic was considerable. Higher up, the scenery changes. Lofty limestone bluffs, often caverned, rise abruptly from the river, and wall in the fertile and populous valleys which descend upon it, giving place higher up to grand basaltic formation, range behind range, terraces of columnar basalt occasionally appearing. It was a lovely season, warm days, cold nights, brilliant sunshine, great white masses of sunlit clouds on a sky of heavenly blue, distances idealized in a blue veil which was not a mist, flowers at their freshest, every bird that has a note or a cry vocal, butterflies and red and blue dragonflies hovering over the grass and water, fish leaping, all nature awake and jubilant. And every rift and bluff had its own beauty of blossoming scarlet azaleas or syringas, contorted or stately pines, and Ampelopsis vitiana rose pink in its early leafage. There was a note of gladness in the air. Eight days above Seoul, on the left bank of the river, there is a ruinous pagoda built of large blocks of hewn stone, standing solitary in the centre of a level plain formed by a bend of the Han. The people, on being asked about it, said, when Korea was surveyed so long ago that nobody knows when, this was the centre of it. They call it the halfway place. After that, the only suggestions of antiquity are some stone foundations and a few stone tombs among the trees, which, from their shape, may denote the sites of monasteries. Near that pagoda were a number of men very drunk, and there were few days on which the habit of drinking to excess was not more or less prominent. The drunk men celebrated the evening's rest by hard drinking, and the crowd which nightly assembled on the shore when we tied up was usually enlivened by the noisy antics of one or more intoxicated men. From my observation on the Han journey and afterwards, I should say that drunkenness is an outstanding feature in Korea and it is not disreputable. If a man drinks rice wine till he loses his reason, no one regards him as a beast. A great dignitary even may roll on the floor drunk at the end of a meal, at which he has eaten to repletion, without losing caste, and on becoming sober, receives the congratulations of inferiors on being rich enough to afford such a luxury. Along with the taste for French clocks and German gilding, a love of foreign liquors is becoming somewhat fashionable among the young young buns, and willing caterers are found who produce potato spirit rich in fusel oil as old cognac and a very effervescent champagne at a shilling a bottle. The fermented liquors of Korea are probably not unwholesome, but the liking for them is an acquired taste with Europeans. They vary from a smooth white drink resembling buttermilk in appearance, and very mild, to a water-white spirit of strong smell and fiery taste. Between these comes the ordinary rice wine, slightly yellowish, akin to Japanese sake and Chinese samshu, with a faint sickly smell and flavor. They all taste more or less strongly of smoke, oil, and alcohol, and the fusel oil remains even in the best. They are manufactured from rice, millet, and barley. The wine cellar projects a cylindrical basket on a long pole from its roof, resembling the bush formerly used in England for a similar purpose. 
probably one reason that the Koreans are a drunken people is that they scarcely use tea at all, even in the cities, and the luxury of cold water is unknown to them. The peasants drink hot rice water with their meals, honey water as a luxury, and on festive occasions an infusion of orange peel or ginger. The drying of orange peel is quite a business with Korean housewives. There were quantities of it hanging from the eaves of all the cottages. Up to a short distance above this pagoda, the rapids for which the Han is famous, though they made our progress slow, had not suggested serious difficulty, far less risk, but for the remaining fortnight they were torturous rocky channels, through which the river, compressed in width, rushes with great violence and tremendous noise and clatter, or they are successive broken ledges of rock, with a chaos of flurry and foam, varied by deep pools, presenting formidable, and at some seasons insuperable, obstacles to navigation. To all appearance they are far more dangerous than the celebrated rapids of the Yangtze, and the remains of timber rafts and junks attest their destructive properties. They occur at shorter and shorter intervals as the higher waters are reached, till eventually the Han becomes an unbroken rapid or cataract. Kim, though paid handsomely, was far too stingy to pay for any help en route. His ropes were manifestly bought in the cheapest market, and though Wong, my powerful sampan man, worked with both strength and skill, and Mr. Miller and his servant toiled at the tow ropes, and in great exigencies I gave a haul myself, we sometimes made only seven miles a day, and oft times took two hours to ascend a few yards, two poling with might and main in the boat, and three tugging with all their strength on shore. Often the rope snapped when the boat went spinning and flying to the foot of the rapid, sometimes with injury to herself and her contents, sometimes escaping. After a few of such risks I habitually landed, either on a boatman's back or wading in waterproof wellingtons, which caused great wonderment in the lookers-on. The worst rapids were always in the most beautiful places, and the strolls and climbs of three or four hours along the river banks, through fields with bounteous crops, through odorous Spanish chestnut groves, through thickets with their fascinating bewilderments of roses, clematis, and honeysuckle, and past farmhouses with their privacy of bamboo screens and deep shade of blossoming fruit trees, were very delightful. In ten days from Seoul we reach Chongfyong, a town of some pretensions, where in connection with the Yamen is a temple pavilion with a high white chair, facing a table with candlesticks upon it, floor, table, and chair deep in dust, though the building is used regularly for offering prayers and sacrifices for the king. Dust is not noteworthy in Korea, but the paintings in this temple are. On the end walls are vivid groups of six noblemen wearing fine horsehair palace hats with wings, each man holding a piece of folded paper in his hand and listening intently as he bends forward towards the chair. The conception and technique of these paintings are admirable, and the sunset scenes on the back wall, though inferior in execution, are the work of a true artist. Close by is a royal pavilion hanging over the edge of a high bluff above the Han, surrounded by superb elms, some of their trunks from twenty to twenty-three feet in circumference. The view of the fertile valley and of the mountains beyond is very fine, and the decorative woodwork, painted in Korean style, has been very handsome. But the phrase, has been, describes most things Korean, and official squalor and neglect could scarcely go farther. At Chongfyong and elsewhere, the common people, in spite of their overpowering curiosity, were not rude, and usually retired to a respectful distance to watch us eat, 
but from the class of scholars who hang on round all yamens we met with a good deal of underbred impertinence some of the men going so far as to raise the curtain of my compartment and introduce their heads and shoulders beneath it browbeating the boatmen when they politely asked them to desist on the other hand men of the non-cultured class showed us various small attentions sometimes helping with a haul at the ropes at a rapid only asking in return that their wives might see me a request with which i always gladly complied at chongfyong so great was female curiosity that a number of women waded waist deep after the boat to peer under the mats of the roof and one of them scrambling out to a rock for a final stare overbalanced herself and fell into deep water at one point in the very early morning some women presented themselves at the boat having walked several li with a present of eggs the payment of which was to be a sight of me and my poor equipments they having heard that there was a boat with a foreign woman on board the old cambric curtains brought from persia with a red pattern on a white ground always attracted them greatly and the small japanese cooking utensils in thirteen days from seoul we reached tanyang a magistracy prettily situated on the left bank of the han with a picturesque confucian temple on the hill above and a day later entered upon mountainous country of extreme beauty the paucity of tributaries is very marked up to that point except the north branch there are but two one which joins the han at the village of hunan chang on the right bank and is navigable for sixty li as far as the important town of wanju and another which enters two li above the picturesquely situated village of so il on the left bank above tanyang the river forms long and violent rapids alternating with broad stretches of blue quiet water from ten to twenty feet deep rolling majestically making sharp and extraordinary bends among lofty limestone precipices villages on natural terraces occur constantly the lower terrace planted with mulberry or weeping willows hemp is cultivated in great quantities and is used for sackcloth for mourners wear bags and rope in my walks along the river i had several opportunities of seeing the curious method of separating the fibre rude and primitive but effectual at the bottom of a stone paved pit large stones are placed which are heated from a rough oven at the side the hemp is pressed down in bundles upon these and stakes are driven in among them piles of coarse korean grass are placed over the hemp and earth over all well beaten down the stakes are then pulled up and water is poured into the holes left by them this falling on the heated stones produces a dense steam and in twenty-four hours the hemp fibre is so completely disintegrated as to be easily separated a grand gorge three miles long with lofty cliffs of much caverned limestone varied by rock needles draped with amelopsis and clematis and giving foothold to azaleas spirea syringa pear hawthorn climbing roses wisteria cyclamen lycopodium yellow vetches many labiati and much else contains but one village piled step above step in a deep wooded fold of the hills on which millet culture is carried to a great height on slopes too steep to be ploughed by oxen this gorge opens out on slopes of rich soil some of which is still uncultivated the hamlets are small and grow much hemp and each has its hemp pit they also grow urtica nivea from the bleached fibre of which their grass cloth summer clothes are made all these are surrounded with mulberry groves 
the large village of Chamsu Ki, at the head of two severe rapids, in descending which our ropes snapped three times, offered a good example of the popular belief in spirits. It is approached under a tasseled straw rope, one end of which is wound around a fine tree with a stone altar below it. On another rope were suspended a few small bags containing offerings of food. If a person dies of the pestilence, or by the roadside, or a woman dies in childbirth, the spirit invariably takes up its abode in a tree. To such spirits offerings are made on the stone altar of cake, wine, and pork, but where the tree is the domicile of the spirit of a man who has been killed by a tiger, dog's flesh is offered instead of pork. The Chamsu Ki tree is a fine, well-grown elm. Gnarled trees, of which we saw several on hilltops and sides, are occupied by the spirits of persons who have died before reaching a cycle, that is, sixty years of age. A steep cliff above Chamsu Ki is also denoted as the abode of demons by a straw rope and a stone altar. We had some very cold and windy days near the end of April, the mercury falling to 34 degrees, and one night of tempestuous rain. It would be absurd to write of sufferings, but at that temperature in an open boat, with the roof lifting and flapping and threatening to take its departure, it was impossible to sleep. Afterwards, the weather was again splendid. Abrupt turns, long rapids full of jagged rocks, long stretches of deep, still water, abounding in fish, narrow gorges walled in by terraces of basalt, lateral ravines disclosing fine snow-streaked peaks, succeeded each other, the shores becoming less and less peopled, while the parallel valleys abounded in fairly well-to-do villages. Just below a long and dangerous rapid we stopped to dine, and though the place seemed quite solitary, a crowd soon gathered, and sat on the adjacent stones talking noisily, trying to get into the boat, lifting the mats, discussing whether it were polite to watch people at dinner, some taking one side and some another, those who were half tipsy taking the affirmative. Some said that they had got news from several miles below that this great sight was coming up the river, and it was a shame to deprive them of it by keeping the curtains down. After a good deal of obstreperousness, mainly the result of wine, a man overbalanced himself and fell into the river, which raised a laugh, and then followed us good-naturedly up the rapid, one man helping to track, and asking as his reward that his wife might see me, on which I exhibited myself on the bow of the boat. At the village of Pangwa San, built, contrary to Korean practice, on a height of 800 feet, there is a stone platform, on which was nightly lighted one of that chain of beacon fires terminating at Namsan in Seoul, which assured the king that his kingdom was at peace. Footnote. The telegraph has now superseded this picturesque arrangement. End footnote. Another village, Ha Chin, was impressive from the frightful ugliness of its women. After leaving Tanyang, the curiosity increased. People walked great distances to see us, saying they had never seen foreigners, and bringing eggs to pay for the sight, which I paid for, telling the people that we had nothing to show, but extravagant rumours of what was to be seen in the boat had preceded us, and as the people assembled at daylight and generally waited patiently, I always yielded to their wishes, raised the thatch, and made the most of the red and white curtains. In one place I gave them some tea to drink. They had never seen it and thought it was medicine, and on tasting it said, It must be very good for indigestion. End of section 8 Section 9 of Korea and Her Neighbors, 
by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in December 2020. Chapter 8 Natural Beauty The Rapids in superb weather and in the full glory of spring we continued the exploration of the han above tanyang encountering innumerable rapids some of them very severe and horrible to look upon the river valley continually narrowing into gorges rarely admits of hamlets and the population is relegated to lateral and parallel valleys on the 30th of April we tugged and poled the boat up seven long and severe rapids, with deep still stretches of water between them. The flora increased in variety, and the shapes of the mountains became very definite. Among other trees, there were a large, branching Acanthopanax ricinifolia, two species of Euonymus, mistletoe on the walnut and mulberry, the Ras semi alata and Ras vernicifera, pines, firs, the Abies microsperma, the Actinidia pueraria, Eleagnes, Spanish chestnuts in great groves, alders, birches, maples, elms, limes, and a tree infrequently seen, which I believe to be a selcava. Among the flowers there were marigolds, buttercups, scentless white and purple violets, yellow violas, white aconite, ladies' slipper, hawkweed, chamomile, red and white dandelions, gelder roses, wygelias, mountain peonies, martagon and tiger lilies, gentians, pink spirea, yellow day lilies, white honeysuckle, the Iris Rossii, and many others. The day after leaving Tanyang, we entered on the most beautiful part of the river. Great limestone cliffs swing open at times to reveal glorious glimpses through fantastic gorges of peaks and ranges, partly forest-covered, fading in the far distance into the delicious blue veil of dreamland. The river, occasionally compressed by its colossal walls, vents its fury in flurry and foam, or expands into broad reaches twenty and even thirty feet in depth, where pure emerald water laps gently upon crags festooned with roses and honeysuckle, or in fairy bays on pebbly beaches and white sand. The air was full of gladness. The loud call of the fearless ringed pheasant was heard everywhere, bees hummed, and butterflies and dragonflies flashed through the fragrant air. What mattered it that our ropes broke three times, that we stuck on a rock in a rapid and hung there for an hour in a deafening din and a lather of foam, and that we beat the record in only making five miles in twelve hours? The limestone cliffs are much caverned, and near the village of Totam, where they fall back considerably from the river, we explored one cave worthy of notice, with a fine entrance arch forty-three feet in height, admitting into a vault considerably higher with a roof of stalagmites. We ascended this cavern for three hundred fifteen feet, and then had to return for lack of light. Near the mouth a natural shaft and rock ladder give access to a fine upper gallery twelve feet high, only sixty feet of which we were able to investigate. Just above Totam there is another limestone freak on the river bank, a natural bridge or arc, one hundred twenty-seven feet in height and thirty feet wide, below which a fair green lawn slopes up to a height above. The bridge is admirably buttressed and draped with roses, honeysuckle and clematis, and various fantastic specimens of conifere grow out of its rifts. The beauty of the Han culminates at Totam in the finest river view I had then ever seen, a broad stretch with a deep bay and lofty limestone cliffs, between which, on a green slope, 
the picturesque deep-eaved brown-roofed houses of the village are built the grey cliff is crowned with a goodly group of umbrella pines in korea called parasol pines because they resemble in shape those carried before the king guarding the entrance of the bay are three picturesque jagged pyramidal rocks much covered with the ampelopsis vaitiana and of course sacred to demon worship these sentinels are from forty to eighty-three feet high to the southwest the han dark and deep rolls out of sight round a pine-clad bluff among the magnificent ranges of the solarak san mountains masses of partially pine-clothed peaks and pinnacles of naked rock to the northeast the river makes an abrupt bend below superb limestone cliffs and disappears at the foot of solmi san a triplet of lofty peaks totam on its park-like slopes embraces this view and were it not for the rapids and their delays and risks might be a delightful summer resort from seoul there is fertility as well as grandeur for the ridge behind the village abrupt on the riverside falls gently down on the other to a broad well-watered level valley cultivated for rice with extreme neatness and care and which after gladdening the eye with its productiveness for several miles winds out of view among the mountains there and in most parts of the han valley i was much surprised with the neatness of the cultivation it was not what the reports of other travellers had led me to expect and it gives me the impression that the river passes through one of the most productive and prosperous portions of korea the crops of wheat and barley were usually superb and remarkably free from weeds in fact the cleanliness would do credit to high farming in the lothians it was no uncommon thing to find from twelve to eighteen stalks as the product of one grain at the end of april the barley was in ear and beginning to change colour and the wheat was six inches high as a general rule the stones were carefully picked off the land and were used for retaining walls for the rice terraces or piled in heaps steep hillsides were being cleared of scrub and stones for cotton planting and in many instances the cultivation is carried to a height of one thousand feet the cultivators always however living in the holes all the parallel valleys are neatly and carefully cultivated the favourable climate with its abundant but not superabundant rainfall renders irrigation needless except in the case of rice every valley has its streamlet and is barred across by dikes of mud from its head down to the han rice with tobacco beans hemp and cotton being the great articles of export on the whole i was very agreeably surprised with the agriculture of the han valley and doubt not that it is capable of enormous development if the earnings of industry were secure the soil is most prolific heavy crops being raised without the aid of fertilizers after leaving beautiful to tam the rapids become more and more frequent and exasperating and when kim sank down playing upon my feelings by well-simulated exhaustion i feared it would soon become real the ropes broke frequently and the constant scraping and bumping over rocks increased the leakiness of the boat so much that in a lovely reach where crystal water rippled on the white sand i pitched my tent and unloaded and beached the craft for repairs in one strong deep rapid that day the rope parted and the boat swelled down the surges striking rocks as she spun down with such effect as to spoil a number of photographic negatives and soak my bedding at a beautifully situated village of pakami a post bore the following inscription in large characters if any servant of a young ban passing through pakami is polite and behaves well all right but if he behaves badly he will be beaten 
an assertion of independence as refreshing as it is rare. For among the curses of Korea is the existence of this privileged class of young buns or nobles who must not work for their own living, though it is no disgrace to be supported by their relations, and who often live on the clandestine industry of their wives in sewing and laundry work. A young bun carries nothing for himself, not even his pipe. Young bun students do not even carry their books from their studies to the classroom. Custom insists that when a member of this class travels, he shall take with him as many attendants as he can muster. He is supported on his led horse, and supreme helplessness is the conventional requirement. His servants browbeat and bully the people and take their fowls and eggs without payment, which explains the meaning of the notice at Pakami. Footnote. Class privileges are now abolished, on paper at least, but their tradition carries weight. End footnote. There is no doubt that the people, that is, the vast mass of the unprivileged, on whose shoulders rests the burden of taxation, are hard pressed by the young buns, who not only use their labor without paying for it, but make merciless exactions under the name of loans. As soon as it is rumored or known that a merchant or peasant has laid up a certain amount of cash, a young bun or official seeks a loan. Practically it is a levy, for if it is refused the man is either thrown into prison on a false charge and whipped every morning until he or his relations pay the sum demanded, or he is seized and practically imprisoned on low diet in the young bun's house until the money is forthcoming. It is the best of the nobles who disguise their exactions under the name of loans, but the lender never sees principal or interest. It is a very common thing for a noble, when he buys a house or field, to dispense with paying for it, and no mandarin will enforce payment. At Pike Kui Mi, where I paid off my boatmen, the young Ban's servants were impressing all the boats for the purpose of taking roofing tiles to Seoul without payment. Kim begged me to give him some trifle to take down the river, with a few cash as payment, and a line to say that the boat was in my employment, service with a foreigner being a protection from such an exaction. There were two days more of most severe toil in which it was scarcely possible to make any progress. The rapids were frightful, and when we reached a very bad one below the town of Yongchun, Kim, after making several abortive efforts, not, I think, in good faith, to ascend it, collapsed and said he could not get up any higher. At another season boats of light draught can ascend to Yangwol twenty li farther. We had performed a great feat in getting up to Yongchun in early May. There were no boats on the higher waters, and for much of the distance my sampan could hardly be said to be afloat. At Yongchun we were within forty miles of the Sea of Japan. Wind and heavy rain, which raised the river, forbade all locomotion until the following evening, when we crossed the Han and reached the Yongchun Ferry by a pretty road through a village and a wood, most attractive country, with many novelties in its flora. At the ferry, a still expanse of the Han is over ten feet deep, but the roar of another rapid is heard immediately above. A double avenue of noble elms with fine turf underneath them leads to the town, a magistracy of 1,500 people, a quiet marketplace without shops, situated in a rich farming basin of alluvial soil, covered in May with heavy crops of barley and wheat, among which were fields hillocked for melons. The magistracy buildings are large and rambling, with what has been a fine entrance gate, with a drum and other instruments of oral torture for making the deafening din with which the yamen is closed and opened at sunrise and sunset. There are many stone tablets, not spontaneously erected, to worthy officials, a large enclosure in which sacrifices are offered to heaven, 
probably to the spirits of the land, a Confucian temple and a king's pavilion, all very squalid and ruinous. A crowd not altogether polite followed us to the Yamen, where I hoped that some information regarding an overland route to the Diamond Mountain might be obtained. On entering the Yamen precincts, the underling officials were most insolent, and it was only after enduring their unpleasant behavior for some time that we were conducted to a squalid inner room, where a deputy mandarin sat on the floor with a smoking apparatus beside him, a man with a scornful and sinister physiognomy who took not the slightest notice of us, and when he deigned to speak gave curt replies through an underling, while we stood outside the entrance, withstanding with difficulty the pressure of the crowd, which had surged in after us, private interviews being rare in the East. This was my last visit to a Korean yamen. As we walked back to the town, the crowd followed us closely, led by some swells of the literary class. One young man came up behind me and kicked me on the ankle, stepping back and then coming forward and repeating the offence. He was about to give me a third kick when Mr. Miller turned round and very quietly, without anger, dealt him a scientific blow on the chest, which sent him off the road upon his back into a barley field. There was a roar of laughter from the crowd, and the young bully's companions begged Mr. Miller not to punish him any more. The crowd dispersed. The bullies, cowards like all their species, fell far behind, and we had a pleasant walk back to the ferry, where, although we had to wait a long time in the ferry boat, there was no assemblage, and the ferryman and passengers were very civil. Mr. Miller regretted the necessity for inflicting punishment. It was lynch law, no doubt, but it was summary justice, and the perfect coolness with which it was administered would no doubt leave a salutary impression. The ferryman told us that a tiger had carried off a pig from Yongchun the previous night, and said that the walk to our boat through the wood without lanterns was very unsafe. Our boatmen had become alarmed and were hunting for us with torches. The circumstances were eerie, and I was glad to see the lights. Ferries are free. The government provides the broad, strong boats which are used for ferrying cattle as well as people, and the villages provide the ferrymen with food. Passengers who are not poor usually give a small douceur. A gale of wind with torrents of rain set in that night, and the rain continued till the next afternoon, giving me an opportunity of seeing more of the detail of the magnificent cliffs of laminated limestone, which occur frequently, and are the most striking geological features of the Han Valley, continually presenting the appearance of the leaves of a colossal book. Above the Yongchun Rapid, on a steep and almost inaccessible declivity, buttressed by these cliffs, are the remains of a very ancient fortress, the outer wall of which, enclosing the summit of the hill, is 2,500 feet in circumference, 25 feet high on the outside, from 1 to 12 feet on the inside, and from 9 to 12 feet thick. It is so arranged that its two gates, which open on nearly direct descents of 20 feet and are approached by very narrow pathways, could only admit one man at a time. It was obviously incapable of reduction by any force but starvation. No mortar is used in the walls, which are very efficiently built of small slabs of stone, never more than six inches thick. The people have no traditions of its construction, but Mr. Miller, who is familiar with the fortresses of Namsan and Puk Han, thinks that it is of a much earlier date than either. One of the signal fire stations is visible from this point on the river. On the 3rd of May we began the descent of the Han. The worn-out ropes were used for the cooking fire, the poles were stowed away, and paddles took their place. The heavy rains had raised the river a foot, and changed its bright waters into a turbid flood, 
down which we often descended in two minutes distances which had taken two laborious hours on the upward journey flying down the centre of the stream instead of crawling up the sides many small disasters occurred several times the boat was nearly swamped by heavy surges or shivered by striking sunken rocks or losing steerage way spun round and round progressing downwards with many gyrations usually stern foremost amidst billows and foam but kim who was at his best on such occasions usually contrived to bring her to shore bow on at the foot of the rapid on one occasion however in a long rapid in which the surges were high and strong by some mismanagement regarding which the boatman quarrelled for an hour afterwards the sampan shipped such heavy seas from both sides as nearly to swamp her i was all but washed off my camp bed which was on a level with the gunwale a number of sheets of geographical notes were washed away some instruments belonging to the r g s were drowned in their box more than forty photographic negatives were destroyed and clothing bedding and flour were all soaked the rapids were in fact most exciting and their risks throw those of the hu and the yangtze from chengtu to ichang quite into the shade in spite of a delay of half a day at tanyang owing to a futile attempt to get cash for silver and another half day spent in beaching and repairing the boat which had been badly bumped on a rock we did the distance from nangchon to ma chai on the forks in four and a half days or less than a third of the time taken by the laborious ascent the penniless situation became so serious that one day before reaching ma chai i had to decide on returning to seoul for cash the treasuries were said to be empty no one believed in silver or knew anything about it and supplies could not be obtained fortunately we arrived at the market-place of ma kyo a village of one thousand eight hundred fifty people on the market day and the peddlers gladly exchanged cash for thirty-five silver yen at the rate of three thousand and would willingly have changed seventy it took six men to carry the coin to the boat which was once more substantially ballasted ma kyo is the river port of che chon and has an unusually flourishing aspect boasting of many good houses with tiled roofs it exports rice beans and grain from the very rich agricultural country on both sides of the river and imports foreign cottons korean sackcloth and salt cotton is twenty cash the measure of twenty inches dearer at ma kyo than in seoul and at nangchon seventy cash dearer when we reached the forks at ma chai the boatmen who were tired of the trip wanted to go back but eventually they were induced to fulfil their contract and we entered the north branch of the han on a cool glorious afternoon following on a night and morning of wind and rain this north branch also rises in the kumkang san or diamond mountain in the province of kongwon and after a turbulent course of about ninety-eight miles unites with the southern and larger branch of the han about two days journey from seoul for a considerable distance the country which it drains is populous and well cultivated and the hills of its higher reaches provide much of the timber which is used in seoul as well as a large proportion of the firewood and charcoal the timber is made up into very peculiar rafts which come down at high water but even then are frequently demolished in the rapids the river widens out above ma chai and for a considerable distance has an average breadth of four hundred forty yards but as a rule it is shallow and its bottom dangerously rocky and it has incessant rapids full of jagged rocks some of which are very dangerous and so ugly that as i went up them i was truly glad that i had not to descend them many a long hard tug and broken hawser we had 
but succeeded in hauling the sampan seven miles above the limit of low water navigation which is the same distance from the termination of boat traffic at high water i estimate the distance from machai to udkiri where further progress was stopped by an insurmountable rapid at seventy-six miles which took nine days though kim and his man anxious to go home worked much harder than on our earlier trip for the first few days there are villages every quarter of a mile and lateral and parallel valleys then rich in clean crops of barley and wheat the river villages are surrounded by groves of spanish chestnut mulberry cherry persimmons and weeping willows there are deep crateriform cavities now full of trees and abundant vegetation the hills are covered with oak scrub affording cover for tigers which appear to abound the characteristics of the villages and the agriculture hardly vary from those on the south branch except that the potato is more extensively grown the absence of provincial and local peculiarities is a feature of korea an alley in seoul may serve for a village street anywhere else gold in small quantities is found along the river and rumor says that urop so a conical hill near the dangerous rapid of chumyol is rich in it but that the district official prohibits digging higher up a number of men were washing for gold their apparatus consists of a wooden sieve or a gridiron on which the supposed auriferous earth is placed above a deep wooden tray and rocked under water till the heavier stuff passes through to be again rocked in search for the glittering particles the results are placed on the river bank in pieces of broken pottery each watched by a man the earth is obtained by removing the heavy shingle of the river bank and digging up the sand to a depth of about two feet when rock is reached from sixty to one hundred trays are equal to a bushel and a half and the yield of this quantity averages half a thimbleful of gold in a state of fine subdivision these gold washers seldom make more than sixteen shillings per month and only about fifty shillings when working in the best gold fields gold ornaments are rarely seen in korea gold is scarcely if at all used in the arts if arts there are and gold coins do not exist nevertheless as is shown by the customs reports the quantity of gold dust exported chiefly to japan is very far from being despicable although the reefs which presumably contain the metal of which the washings are the proof have not yet been touched the fees paid by the miners to the government vary with the locality gold digging without government authorization is prohibited by law under most severe penalties among the richest gold fields in korea are pyongkang not far from the han and keumsang in pyongan-do not far from the taidong the larger washings collect as elsewhere the scum of the country and riots often occur among the miners i know not on which subject the korean is the more voluble tigers or gold he is proud of korea as a gold producing country and speaks as if its dust were golden sand the groves of spanish chestnuts with which the north han is fringed gave off an overpowering odor their fruit is an important article of diet usually the arable land below the villages is little more than a terrace but on the hillsides above the grain rippled in long yellow waves in the breeze and the hills constantly swing apart and reveal terraced valleys and brown orchard embowered hamlets or slightly receding expose stretches of white sand or heaps of fantastic boulders after two days of severe work we reached the beautifully situated town of ka pyong which straggles along the valley of a small tributary of the han on slopes backed by high mountains which following the usual korean custom 
are without names. The bright green of the wheat fields, varied by the darker green of clumps of conifers and chestnuts, arranged as if by a landscape gardener, and the lines of trees along the river bank were enchanting, but Kabyong does not bear close inspection. The telegraph wire from Seoul to Wonsan crosses the river at Singang Kam, and there is actually a telegraph station at Chunchon, the most important town of that region, at which messages are received and sent about once a month. Chunchon is four miles from the Han on its left bank. It is fortified and has nominally a garrison of 300 men. Having a population of 3,000 and being in the center of a fine agricultural district, it is a place of some trade, as trade is understood in Korea. Just below it, the Han, after running for some distance below a lofty quartz ridge, makes an abrupt turn and penetrates it, the walls of the passage having the regularity of a railway cutting, while the bed of the stream is of pure white quartz. Beyond this singular gateway, the river valley opens out, and the spectacle, rare in Korea, of cattle is to be seen. Indeed, I only once saw cattle feeding elsewhere. The grass is coarse and sour, and hand feeding is customary. It was most pleasant to be awoke in the dewy morning by bellowing of cattle, shouts and laughter of boys, and yelping of dogs, as bulls old and young were driven to the river bank to be tethered in the flowery grass. The frolicsome bull calves, which are brought up in the Korean home and are attended to by the children, who are their natural playmates, develop under such treatment into that maturity of mingled gentleness and stateliness which is characteristic of the Korean bull, the one grand thing remaining to Korea. When full grown, a bull can carry from 350 to 500 pounds. They are fed on boiled beans, cut millet stalks and cut pea holm, and the water in which the beans are boiled. They are led by a rope passed around the horns from a bamboo ring in the nose. The prevailing color is a warm red, and the huge animal in build much resembles the shorthorn. The Korean cow, which is to be seen carrying loads in northern Korea, is a worthy dam of such a splendid progeny. The scenery, though always pretty, becomes monotonous after a few days, and monotonous too were the adventures in the rapids, which were innumerable, and the ceaseless toiling, dragging, and tugging they involved. Reaching Wonchon, a post station on the road to Wonsan, we halted and engaged horses for a land journey at a very high rate, but they and their mapu or grooms turned out well, and as Wong sententiously remarked, if you pay well, you will be served well. The agreement, which I caused to be put into writing, and which I made use of in other journeys, with much mutual satisfaction, was duly signed, and we continued the boat journey. After spending half a day at the prefectural town of Nangchon, where I am glad to record that the officials were very courteous, we ascended the Han to a point above the wild hamlet of Udkiri, on a severe rapid full of jagged rocks. Udkiri is above the head of low water navigation, but in two summer months during the rains, small boats can read Kumunyo, the last village, twenty li higher. It was a wild termination of the long boat journey. An abrupt turn of the river and its monotonous prettiness is left behind, and there is a superb mountain view of saddleback ridges and lofty grey peaks surrounding a dark expanse of water, with a margin of grey boulders and needles of grey rock draped with the amelopsis, a yellow clematis, and a white honeysuckle. It was somewhat sad not to be able to penetrate the grim austerity to the northward, but the rapids were so severe and the water oft-times so shallow that it was impossible to drag the sampan farther, 
though at that time she only drew two inches of water. From Marchai on the forks she had been poled and dragged up forty rapids, making eighty-six on the whole journey. From the thinly peopled solitudes of these upper waters we descended rapidly, though not without some severe bumps, to the populous river banks, where villages are half hidden among orchards and chestnut and mulberry groves, and the crops are heavy, and that abundance of the necessaries of life which in Korea passes for prosperity is the rule. Tarai, a neat, prosperous place of 240 people, among orchards and hillsides terraced and bearing superb crops, is an example of the riverine villages. Its houses are built step above step along the sides of a ravine, down which a perennial stream flows, affording water power for an automatic rice hulling machine. For exports and imports, the Han at high water is a cheap and convenient highway. The hill slopes above the village, with their rich soil, afford space for agricultural expansion for years to come. And not to dwell altogether on the material, there is a shrine of much repute on a fork-like slope near the river. It contains a group of miryoks, in this case stones worn by the action of water into the semblance of human beings. The central figure, larger than life, may even to a dull imagination represent a person carrying an infant, and its eyes, nose, and mouth are touched in with china ink. It is surrounded by phallic symbols and miryoks, which may be supposed to represent children, and women make prayers and offerings in this shrine in the hope of obtaining a much coveted increase in their families, for male children are still regarded as a blessing in Korea, and happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. Kapyong again, a small prefectural town of four hundred houses, one and a half miles from the river, is a good specimen of the small towns of the Han Valley, with a ruinous yamen, of course, with its non-producing mob of hangers-on. It is on the verge of an alluvial plain, rolling up to picturesque hills, gashed by valleys, abounding in hamlets surrounded by chestnut groves and careful cultivation. The slopes above Kapyong break up into knolls richly wooded with conifers and hard-wooded trees, fringing off into clumps and groups which would not do discredit to the slopes of Windsor. The people of a large district bring their produce into the town, and barter it for goods in the market. The telegraph wire to Won San crosses the affluent on which Kapyong is built, and is carried along a bridle path which for some li runs along the river bank. Junks loaded ten feet above their gunwales, as well as four feet outside of them, with firewood, and large rafts were waiting for the water to rise. Boats were being built, and great quantities of the strong rope used for towing and other purposes, which is made from a creeper which grows profusely in central Korea, were awaiting water carriage. Yet Ka Pyong, like other small Korean towns, has no life or go. Its merchants are but peddlers. Its commercial ideas do not rise above those of the huckster, and though poverty, as we understand it, is unknown, prosperity, as we understand it, is absent. There are no special industries in any of the riverine towns, and if they were all to disappear in some catastrophe, it would not cause a ripple on the surface of the general commercial apathy of the country. Similar remarks apply to the prefectural town of Nangchon, where we again wasted some hour, while Kim's rice was first bargained for, and then cleaned. At that point there is a fine deep stretch of the river, 230 yards broad, abounding in fish. From Nangchon we dropped down the Han to a deep and pretty bay, on which the small village of Paik Kuimi is situated, where we halted for Sunday, our last day in the Sampan, 
which had been a not altogether comfortless home for five weeks and a half. End of section 9「Section 10 of Korea and her neighbors」by Isabella L. Bird。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in March 2021. Chapter 9 Korean Marriage Customs Paik Kui Mi was not without a certain degree of life on that Sunday. A young Bun's steward impressed boats for the gratuitous carriage of tiles to Seoul, which caused a little feeble excitement among the junkmen. There was a sick person, and the mutang or female exorcist was engaged during the whole day in the attempt to expel the malevolent demon which was afflicting him, the process being accompanied by the constant beating of a drum and the loud vibrating sound of large cymbals. Lastly, there was a marriage, and this deserves more than a passing notice. Marriage, burial, and exorcism, with their ceremonials, being the outstanding features of Korea. Footnote. The notes on marriage customs which follow were given me by English-speaking Koreans and were taken down at the time. They apply chiefly to the middle class. End footnote. The Korean is nobody until he is married. He is a being of no account, a hobbledehoy. The wedding day is the entrance on respectability and manhood, and marks a leap upwards on the social ladder. The youth, with long abundant hair divided in the middle and plaited at the back, wearing a short, girdled coat and looking as if he had no place in the world, though he may be quite grown up, and who is always taken by strangers for a girl, is transformed by the formal reciprocal salutations which constitute the binding ceremony of marriage. He has received the tonsure, and the long hair surrounding it is drawn into the now celebrated top knot. He is invested with a mangan, a crownless skull cap or fillet of horse hair, without which thereafter he is never seen. He wears a black hat and a long full coat, and his awkward gait is metamorphosed into a dignified swing. His boy companions have become his inferiors. His name takes the equivalent of Mr. after it. Honorifics must be used in addressing him. In short, from being a nobody, he becomes a somebody. A girl, by marrying, fulfills her manifest destiny. Spinsterhood in Korea is relegated to the Buddhist nunneries, where it has no reputation for sanctity. Absolutely secluded in the inner court of her father's house from the age of seven, a girl passes about the age of seventeen to the absolute seclusion of the inner rooms of her father-in-law's house. The old ties are broken, and her husband's home is thenceforth her prison. It is custom. It is only to our thinking that the custom covers a felt hardship. It is needless to add that the young couples do not choose each other. The marriage is arranged by the fathers and consented to as a matter of course. A man gains the reputation of being a neglectful father who allows his son to reach the age of twenty unmarried. Seventeen or eighteen is the usual age at which a man marries. A girl may go through the marriage ceremony as a mere child, if her parents think an eligible, may slip through their fingers, but she is not obliged to assume the duties of wifehood till she is sixteen. On the other hand, boys of ten and twelve years of age are constantly married when their parents for any reason wish to see the affair settled, and a desirable connection presents itself and the yellow hats and pink and blue coats and attempted dignity of these boy bridegrooms are among the sights of the cities. A go-between is generally employed for the preliminary arrangements. No money is given to the bride's father by the bridegroom, nor does the daughter receive a dowry, but she is supplied with a large trousseau, which is packed in handsome marriage chests with brass clamps and decorations. There is no betrothal ceremony, and after the arrangement has been made, the marriage may be delayed for weeks or even months. 
when it is thought desirable that it should take place, but not until the evening before, the bridegroom's father sends a sort of marriage contract to the bride's father, who receives it without replying, and two pieces of silk are sent to the bride, out of which her outer garments must be made for the marriage day. A number of men carrying gay silk lanterns bear this present to the bride, and on the way are met by a party of men from her father's house bearing torches, and a fight ensues, which is often more than a make-believe one, for serious blows are exchanged, and on both sides some are hurt. Death has occasionally been known to follow on the wounds received. If a bridegroom's party is worsted in the melee, it is a sign that he will have bad luck, if the bride's, that she will have misfortunes. The night before the marriage, the parents of the bride and groom sacrifice in their respective houses before the ancestral tablets, and acquaint the ancestors with the event which is to occur on the morrow. The auspicious day having been decided on by the sorcerer, about an hour before noon, the bridegroom on horseback and in court dress leaves his father's house, and on that occasion only a plebeian can pass a young bun on the road without dismounting. Two men walk before him, one carrying a white umbrella, and the other, who is dressed in red cloth, a goose, which is the emblem of conjugal fidelity. He is also attended by several men carrying unlighted red silk lanterns, by various servants, by a married brother, if he has one, or by his father, if he has not. On reaching his destination, he takes the goose from the hands of the man in red, goes into the house and lays it upon a table. Apropos of this emblem, it must be observed that conjugal fidelity is only required from the wife, and is a feminine virtue only. Two women who are hired to officiate on such occasions lead the bride onto the veranda, or an estrade, and place her opposite the bridegroom, who stands facing her, but at some little distance from her. The wedding guests fill the courtyard. This is the man's first view of his future wife. She may have seen him through a chink in the lattice or a hole in the wall. A queer object she is to our thinking. Her face is covered with white powder, patched with spots of red, and her eyelids are glued together by an adhesive compound. At the instigation of her attendants she bows twice to her lord, and he bows four times to her. It is this public reciprocal salutation which alone constitutes a valid marriage. After it, if he repudiates her, he cannot take another wife. The permanence of the marriage tie is fully recognized in Korea, though a man can form as many illicit connections as he chooses. A cup of wine is then given to the bridegroom, who drinks a little, after which it is handed to the bride, who merely tastes it. Afterwards, within the house, a table with a dainty dinner is set before the husband, who eats sparingly. The bride retires to the women's rooms, and the groom rejoices with his friends in the men's apartments. There is no simultaneous banquet. Each guest on arriving is supplied with a table of food. Such a table, in the case of people of means, costs from five to six yen, from ten shillings to twelve shillings and a very cheap wedding costs 65 yen, so that several daughters are a misfortune. During the afternoon, the husband returns to his father's house, and after a time the bride, bundled up in a mass of wedding clothes, and with her eyelids still sealed, attended by the two women mentioned before, some hired girls, and men with lanterns, goes thither also, in a rigidly closed chair, in the gay decorations of which red predominates. There she is received by her father and mother-in-law, to whom she bows four times, remaining speechless. She is then carried back to the house of her own parents, her eyelids are unsealed, and the powder is washed from her face. At five her husband arrives, but returns to his father's house on the following morning, this process of going and returning being repeated for three days, after which the bride is carried in a plain chair to her future home, under the roof of her parents-in-law, where she is allotted a room or rooms in the seclusion of the women's apartments. 
the name bestowed on her by her parents soon after her birth is dropped and she is known thereafter only as the wife of so-and-so or the mother of so-and-so her husband addresses her by the word yabu signifying look here which is significant of her relations to him silence is regarded as a wife's first duty during the whole of the marriage day the bride must be as mute as a statue if she says a word or even makes a sign she becomes an object of ridicule and her silence must remain unbroken even in her own room though her husband may attempt to break it by taunts jeers or coaxing for the female servants are all on the qui vive for such a breach of etiquette as speech hanging about the doors and chinks to catch up and gossip even a single utterance which would cause her to lose caste for ever in her circle this custom of silence is observed with the greatest rigidity in the higher classes it may be a week or several months before the husband knows the sound of his wife's voice and even after that for a length of time she only opens her mouth for necessary speech with the father-in-law the law of silence is even more rigid the daughter-in-law often passes years without raising her eyes to his or addressing a word to him the wife has recognized duties to her husband but he has few if any to her it is correct for a man to treat his wife with external marks of respect but he would be an object for scorn and ridicule if he showed her affection or treated her as a companion among the upper classes a bridegroom after passing three or four days with his wife leaves her for a considerable time to show his indifference to act otherwise would be bad form my impression is that a community of interests and occupations which poverty gives and the embargo which it lays on other connections in korea as in some other oriental countries produces happier marriages among the lower orders than among the higher korean women have always borne the yoke they accept inferiority as their natural lot they do not look for affection in marriage and probably the idea of breaking custom never occurs to them usually they submit quietly to the rule of the belle mere and those who are insubordinate and provoke scenes of anger and scandal are reduced to order by a severe beating when they are women of the people but in the noble class custom forbids a husband to strike his wife and as his only remedy is a divorce and remarriage is difficult he usually resigns himself to his fate but if in addition to tormenting him and destroying the peace of his house the wife is unfaithful he can take her to a mandarin who after giving her a severe beating may bestow her on a satellite the seclusion of girls in the parental home is carried on after marriage and in the case of women of the upper and middle classes is as complete as is possible they never go out by daylight except in completely closed chairs at night attended by a woman and a servant with a lantern and with a mantle over her head a wife may stir abroad and visit her female friends but never without her husband's permission who requires or may require proof that the visit has been actually paid shopping is done by servants or goods are brought to the veranda the vendor is discreetly retiring time which among the leisured classes hangs heavily on the hands is spent in spasmodic cooking sewing embroidering reading very light literature in en mun and in the never-failing resources of gossip and the interminable discussion of babies if a wife is very dull indeed she can with her husband's permission send for actors or rather posturing reciters to the compound and look at them through the chinks of the bamboo blinds through these also many korean ladies have seen the splendors of the kurdong when the korean wife becomes a mother her position is improved girls as being unable to support their parents in old age or to perform the ancestral rites are not prized as boys are yet they are neither superfluous nor unwelcome as in some eastern countries the birth of a girl is not made an occasion for rejoicing 
but that of the first-born son is, and after the name has been bestowed on him, the mother is known as the mother of so-and-so. The first step alone of the first boy is an occasion for family jubilation. Korean babies have no cradles and are put to sleep by being tapped lightly on the stomach. End of section 10 Section 11 of Korea and Her Neighbors by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in March 2021. Chapter 10 The Korean Pony, Korean Roads and Inns. A grey and murky morning darkening into drizzle, which thickened into a day's pouring rain, was an inauspicious beginning of a long land journey, but the crawling up the North Han had become monotonous and change and action were desirable. Being an experienced muleteer, I had arranged the loads for each pony so equitably as to obviate the usual quarrel among the mapu or grooms at starting. The men were not regular mapu and were going chiefly to see the Diamond Mountain. One was well educated and gentlemanly, and the bystanders jeered at him for loading like scholars. They were a family party, and there were no disputes. My first experience of the redoubtable Korean pony was not reassuring. The men had never seen a foreign saddle, and were half an hour in getting it fixed. Though a pony's saddle, it was far too large for the creature's minute body. The girths were half a yard, and the crupper nearly a foot too long. The animal bit, squealed, struck with his fore and hind feet, and performed a singular feat of bending his back into such an inward curve that his small body came quite near the ground. The men were afraid of him, and it was only in the brief intervals of fighting that they dared to make a dash at the buckles. It was tight lacing that he objected to. The Korean pony is among the most salient features of Korea. The breed is peculiar to it. The animals used for burdens are all stallions, from ten to twelve hands high, well formed, and singularly strong, carrying from 160 to 200 pounds 30 miles a day, week after week, on sorry food. They are most desperate fighters, squealing and trumpeting on all occasions, attacking every pony they meet on the road never becoming reconciled to each other even on a long journey, and in their fury ignoring their loads, which are often smashed to pieces. Their savagery makes it necessary to have a mapu for every pony, instead of, as in Persia, one to five. At the inn stables, they are not only chained down to the troughs by chains short enough to prevent them from raising their heads, but are particularly slung at night to the heavy beams of the roof. Even under these restricted circumstances, their cordial hatred finds vent in hyena-like yells, abortive snaps, and attempts to swing their hind legs round. They are never allowed to lie down, and very rarely to drink water, and then only when freely salted. Their nostrils are all slit in an attempt to improve upon nature and give them better wind. They are fed three times a day on brown slush as hot as they can drink it, composed of beans, chopped millet stalks, rice husks and bran, with the water in which they have been boiled. The mapu are rough to them, but I never saw them either ill-used or petted. Dearly as I love horses, I was not able on two journeys to make a friend of mine. On this journey I rode a handsome chestnut only ten hands high. He walked four miles an hour, and in a month of travelling, for much of it over infamous mountain roads, never stumbled, but he resented every attempt at friendliness both with teeth and heels. They are worth from fifty shillings upwards and cost little to keep. Their attendants, the mapu, who are by no means always their owners, or even part owners, are very anxious about them and take very great care of them, seeing to what passes as their comfort before their own. The pack-saddle is removed at once on halting, the animals are well rubbed, and afterwards thick straw mats are bound round their bodies. 
great care is given to the cooking of their food. I know not whether the partial slinging of them to the crossbeams is to relieve their legs or to make fighting more difficult. On many a night I have been kept awake by the screams of some fractious animal, kicking and biting his neighbours as well as he was able, till there was a general plunging and squealing, which lasted till blows and excretions restored some degree of order. After I mounted my steed, he trudged along very steadily, unless any of his fellows came near him, when, with an evil glare in his eyes and a hyena-like yell, he rushed upon them teeth and hoof, entirely oblivious of bit and rider. A torrent of rain fell, and the day's journey consisted in splashing through deep mud, fording swollen streams because the bridges which crossed them were rotten, getting wet to the skin, and getting partially dry by sitting on the hot floor of a hovel called an inn at the noonday halt, along with a steaming crowd of all sorts and conditions of men in clean and dirty white clothes. The road by which we travelled is the main one from Seoul to the eastern treaty port of Wonsan. It passes through rice valleys with abundant irrigation, and along the sides of bare hills. Goods and travellers were not to be looked for in such weather, but there were a few strings of coolies loaded with tobacco, and a few more taking dried fish and dried seaweed, the latter a great article of diet, from one sun to the capital. Pangas, or water pestles for hulling rice, under rude thatched sheds, were numerous. These work automatically, and their solemn thud has a tone of mystery. The machine consists of a heavy log centred on a pivot, with a box at one end and a pestle at the other. Water from a stream with some feet of fall is led into the box, which when full tips over its contents and bears down one end of the log, when the sudden rise, acting on the pestle at the other end, brings it down with a heavy thud on the rice in the hollowed stone, which serves as a mortar. Where this simple machine does not exist, the work is performed by women. Denuded hillsides gave place to wooded valleys with torrents much resembling parts of Japan. The rain fell in sheets, and quite in the early afternoon, on reaching the hamlet of Sarpankori, the Mapu declined to proceed farther, and there I had my first experience of a Korean inn. Many weeks on that and subsequent journeys showed me that this abominable shelter, as I then thought it, may be taken as a fair average specimen, and many a hearty meal and good sound sleep may be enjoyed under such apparently unpropitious circumstances. There are regular and irregular inns in Korea. The irregular inn differs in nothing from the ordinary hovel of the village roadway, unless it can boast of a yard with troughs, and can provide entertainment for beast as well as for man. The regular inn of the towns and large villages consists chiefly of a filthy courtyard full of holes and heaps, entered from the road by a tumble-down gateway. A gaunt black pig or two tethered by the ears, big yellow dogs routing in the garbage, and fowls, boys, bulls, ponies, mapu, hangers-on and travellers' loads make up a busy scene. On one or two sides are ramshackle sheds, with rude, hollowed trunks in front, out of which the ponies suck the hot brown slush which sustains their strength and pugnacity. On the other is the furnace shed with the oats where the slush is cooked, the same fire usually heating the flues of the kang floor of the common room, while smaller fires in the same shed cook for the guests. Low lattice doors filled in with torn and dirty paper give access to a room the mud floor of which is concealed by reed mats, usually dilapidated, sprinkled with wooden blocks which serve as pillows. Farming gear and hat boxes often find a place on the low heavy crossbeams. Into this room are crowded mapu, travellers and servants, the low residuum of Korean travel, for officials and young buns receive the hospitalities of the nearest magistracy, and the peasants open their houses to anybody with whom they have a passing acquaintance. There is, in all inns of pretensions, however, another room known as the clean room, eight feet by six, 
which, if it existed, I obtained, and if not, I had a room in the women's quarters at the back, remarkable only for its heat and vermin, and the amount of angpaks, bundles of dirty clothes, beans rotting for soy, and other plenishings which it contained, and which reduced its habitable portion to a minimum. At night, a ragged lantern in the yard and a glim of oil in the room made groping for one's effects possible. The room was always overheated from the pony's fire. From 80 to 85 degrees was the usual temperature, but it was frequently over 92 degrees, and I spent one terrible night sitting at my door because it was 105 degrees within. In this furnace, which heats the floor and the spine comfortably, the Korean wayfarer revels. On arriving at an inn, the master or servant rushes at the mud, or sometimes matted, floor with a whisk, raising a great dust which he sweeps into a corner. The disgusted traveller soon perceives that the heat is animate as well as inanimate, and the groans, sighs, scratchings, and restlessness from the public room show the extent of the insect pest. But I never suffered from vermin in a Korean inn, nor is it necessary. After the landlord had disturbed the dust, Wong put down either two heavy sheets of oiled paper or a large sheet of cotton dressed with boiled linseed oil on the floor, and on these arranged my camp bed, chair, and baggage. This arrangement, and I write from twenty months' experience in Korea and China, is a perfect preventative. In most inns, rice, eggs, vegetables, and a few Korean dainties such as soup, vermicelli, dried seaweed, and a paste made of flour, sugar, and oil can be procured, but tea never, and the position of the well, which frequently receives the soakage of the courtyard, precludes a careful traveller from drinking aught but boiled water. At the proper seasons chickens can be purchased for about four pence each, and pheasants for less. Dog meat is for sale frequently in the spring, and pork occasionally. The charges at Korean inns are ridiculously low. Nothing is charged for the room with its glim and hot floor, but as I took nothing for the good of the house, I paid 100 cash per night, and the same for my room at the midday halt, which gave complete satisfaction. Travellers who eat three meals a day spend, including the trifling gratuities, from 200 to 300 cash per diem. Millet takes the place of rice in the northern inns. The Korean inn is not noisy unless wine is flowing freely, and even then the noise subsides early. The fighting of the ponies and the shouts and execrations with which the mapu pacify them are the chief disturbances till daylight comes and the wayfarers move on. Travelling after dark is contrary to Korean custom. From this slight sketch, the shadows of which will bear frequent and much intensifying, it will be seen that Korean travelling has a very seamy side, that it is entirely unsuited to the globe-trotter, and that even the specialist may do well to count the cost before embarking upon it. To me, the curse of the Korean inn is the ill-bred and unmanageable curiosity of the people, especially of the women. A European woman had not been seen on any part of the journey, and I suffered accordingly. Sarpang Kori may serve as a specimen. My quarters were opposite to the ponies, on the other side of the foul and crowded courtyard. There were two rooms, with a space under the roof as large as either between them, on which the dripping baggage was deposited, and Wong established himself with his cooking stove and utensils, though there was nothing to cook except two eggs obtained with difficulty and a little rice left over from the boat stores. My room had three paper doors. The unwalled space at once filled up with a crowd of men, women, and children. All the paper was torn off the doors, and a crowd of dirty Mongolian faces took its place. I hung up cambric curtains, but long sticks were produced, and my curtains were poked into the middle of the room. The crowd broke in the doors, and filled the small space not occupied by myself and my gear. The women and children sat on my bed in heaps, examined my clothing, 
took out my hairpins and pulled down my hair, took off my slippers, drew my sleeves up to the elbow and pinched my arms to see if they were of the same flesh and blood as their own. They investigated my few possessions minutely, trying on my hat and gloves, and after being turned out by Wong three times, returned in fuller force, accompanied by unmarried youths, the only good-looking girls ever seen in Korea, with abundant hair divided in the middle and hanging in long pleats down their backs. The pushing and crushing, the odious familiarity, the babel of voices and the odours of dirty clothing in a temperature of eighty degrees were intolerable. Wong cleared the room a fourth time, and suggested that when they forced their way in again they should find me sitting on the bed cleaning my revolver, a suggestion I accepted. He had hardly retired when they broke in again, but there was an immediate stampede, and for the remainder of the evening I was free from annoyance. Similar displays of aggressive and intolerable curiosity occurred three times daily, and it was hard to be always amiable under such circumstances. The Koreans travel enormously, considering that they seldom make pilgrimages. The peddlers, who solely supply the markets, are always on the move, and thousands travel for other reasons, such as their gatherings of ancestral tablets, restlessness, ennui, ku kyong or sightseeing, visits to tombs, place hunting, literary examinations, place keeping and attempting to deprive others of place, litigation and business. The fear of tigers and demons prevents people from journeying by night, which is as well, as the bearers of official passports have the right to demand an escort of torch-bearers from each village. If necessity compels nocturnal travel, the wayfarers associate themselves in bands, swinging lanterns, waving torches, yelling and beating gongs. The dread of the tiger is so universal as to warrant the Chinese proverbial saying, the Korean hunts the tiger one half of the year, and the tiger hunts the Korean the other half. As I have before remarked, the mandarins and yangbans, with their trains, quarter themselves on the magistracies, and eat the fat of the land. Should they be compelled to have recourse to the discomforts of an inn and the food of a village, they appropriate the best of everything without paying for it. Hence the visit of a foreigner armed with a kwanja is such an object of dread that on this land journey I never let it be known that I had one, and on my second journey discarded it altogether, trusting in both to the reputation for scrupulous honesty, which I had once established with my men, to overcome the repugnance which the innkeepers felt to receiving me. The roads along which the traveller rides or trudges at a pace, in either case, of three miles an hour, are simply infamous. There are few made roads, and those which exist are deep in dust in summer and in mud in winter, where they are not polished tracks over irregular surfaces and ledges of rock. In most cases they are merely paths worn by the passage of animals and men into some degree of legibility. Many of the streams are unbridged, and most of the bridges, the roadways of which are only of twigs and sod, are carried away by the rains of early July, and are not restored till the middle of October. In some regions traffic has to betake itself to fords or ferries when it reaches a stream, with their necessary risks and detentions. Even on the six great roads, which centre in the capital, the bridges are apt to be in such a rotten condition that a mapu usually goes over in advance of his horses to ascertain if they will bear their weight. Among the mountains, roads are frequently nothing else than boulder-strewn torrent beds, and on the best, that between Seoul and Chimulpo, during the winter there are tracts on which the mud is from one to three feet deep. These infamous bridle tracks, of which I have had extensive experience, are one of the great hindrances to the development of Korea. Among the worst part of these is that part of the main road from Seoul to Wonsan, which we followed from Sarpang Kori for two days to Sangnangdang, 
where we branched off for the region known as Keung Kang San, or the Diamond Mountain. The earlier part of this route was through wooded valleys, where lilies of the valley carpeted the ground, and over the very pretty pass of Chu Fa, 1,300 feet, on the top of which is a large spirit shrine, containing some coarsely painted pictures of men who look like Chinese generals, the usual offerings of old shoes, rags, and infinitesimal portions of rice, and a tablet inscribed, I, the spirit Song An Chi, dwell in this place. There, as at the various trees hung with rags, and the heaps of stones on the tops of passes, the mapu bowed and expectorated, as is customary at the abodes of demons. More than once we passed not far from houses outside of which the mutang or sorceress, with much feasting, beating of drums, and clashing of cymbals, was exercising the demon which had caused the sickness of some person within. Portions of the expensive feast prepared on these occasions are offered to the evil spirit, and after the exorcism, part of the food so offered is given to the patient, in the belief that it is a curative medicine, often seriously aggravating the disease, as when a patient suffering from typhoid fever or dysentery is stuffed with pork or kimchi. Recently, a case came under the notice of Dr. Jason, so Chai Pil, in Seoul, in which a man, suffering from the latter malady, died immediately after eating raw turnips, given him by the mutang after being offered to the demons at the usual feast at the ceremony of exorcism. There is much wet rice along the route, as well as dry rice, with a double line of beans between every two rows, and in the rice revel and croak large frogs of extreme beauty, vivid green with black velvet spots, the underside of the legs and bodies being cardinal red. These appeared to be the prey of the graceful white and pink ibis, the latter in the intensified flush of his spring colouring. A descent from a second pass leads to the Keumsang Kang, a largish river in a rich agricultural region, and to the village of Pan Pyong, where they were making in the rudest fashion the great cast-iron pots used for boiling horse food, from iron obtained and smelted thirty-three li farther north. On two successive days there were tremendous thunderstorms. The second succeeded, just as we were at the head of a wild glen, by a brief tornado which nearly blew over the ponies and snapped trees of some size as though they had been matchwood. Then came a profound calm. The clouds lay banked in pink illuminated masses on a sky of tender green, cleft by grey mountain peaks. Mountain torrents boomed, crashed, sparkled and foamed, the silent woods rejoiced the eye by the vividness of their greenery and their masses of white and yellow blossom, and sweet heavy odours enriched the evening air. On that and several other occasions I recognized that Korea has its own special beauties, which fix themselves in the memory, but they must be sought for in spring and autumn, and off the beaten track. Dirty and squalid as the villages are, at a little distance their deep-eaved brown roofs, massed among orchards, on gentle slopes, or on the banks of sparkling streams, add colour and life to the scenery, and men in their queer white clothes and dress hats, with their firm tread, and bundled up women, with a shockling walk and long staffs, brought round with a semicircular swing at every step, are adjuncts which one would not willingly dispense with. Before reaching the Pai Kyang Kang, a broad, full river, an affluent of the northern Han, with singularly abrupt turns and perpendicular cliffs of a formation resembling that of the palisades on the Hudson River, we crossed one of the great lava fields described by Consul Karls. This, which we crossed in a northeasterly direction, is a rough oval about forty miles by thirty, a tableland, in fact, surrounded by a deep chasm where the torrents which encircle it meet the mountains. 
its plateau are from sixty to one hundred feet above these streams which are all affluents of the han and are supported on palisades of basalt exhibiting the prismatic columnar formation in a very striking manner in some places the lava which is often covered either with conglomerate or a stiffish clay is very near the surface and large blocks of it lie along the streams it is a most fertile tract and could support a large population but not being suited for rice is very little cultivated and grows chiefly oats millet and beans which are not affected by the strong winds there are two dolmens not far from the pai kyang kang in one the upper stone is from seven to ten feet long by seven feet wide and seven inches deep resting on three stones four feet two inches high the other is somewhat smaller the openings of both face due north after crossing the pai kyang kang there one hundred sixty two yards wide and sixteen feet deep by a ferry-boat of remarkably ingenious construction rendered necessary by the fact that the long bridge over the broad stream was in ruins and that the appropriation for its reconstruction had been diverted by the local officials to their own enrichment we entered the spurs or ribs of the great mountain chain which running north and south divides korea into two very unequal longitudinal portions at the village of tong ku the scenery became very varied and pretty forests clothed many of the hills with a fair blossoming undergrowth untouched by the fuel gatherer's remorseless hook torrents flashed in foam through dark dense leafage or bubbled and gurgled out of sight the little patches of cultivation were boulder strewn there were few inhabitants and the tracks called roads were little better than the stony beds of streams as they became less and less obvious and the valleys more solitary our tergiversations were more frequent and prolonged the mapu drove the ponies as fast as they could walk the fords were many and deep and two of the party were unhorsed in them still we hurried on faster and faster not a word was spoken but i knew that the men had tiger on the brain blundering through the twilight it was dark when we reached the lower village of mari k where we were to halt for the night two miles from the pass of tan pa yong which was to be crossed the next day there the villagers could not or would not take us in they said they had neither rice nor beans which may have been true so late in the spring however it is or then was korean law that if a village could not entertain travellers it must convoy them to the next halting place the mapu were frantic they yelled and stormed and banged at the hovels and succeeded in turning out four sleepy peasants who were reinforced by four more a little farther on but the torches were too short and after sputtering and flaring went out one by one and the fresh ones lighted slowly the mapu lost their reason they trashed the torch-bearers with their heavy sticks i lashed my mapu with my light whip for doing it they yelled they danced then things improved gloriously glared the pine knots on the leaping crystal torrents that we forded reddening the white clothes of the men and the stony track and the warm tinted stems of the pines and so with shouts and yells and waving torches we passed up the wooded glen in the frosty night air under a firmament of stars to the mountain hamlet of upper mari k consisting of five hovels only three of which were inhabited it is a very forlorn place and very poor and it was an hour before my party of eight human beings and four ponies were established in its miserable shelter though even that was welcome after being eleven hours in the saddle end of section eleven section twelve of korea and her neighbors by isabella l bird this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by avai in march two thousand twenty one 
Chapter 11. Diamond Mountain Monasteries It was a glorious day for the pass of Tan Pa Yong, 1,320 feet above Mari Ke, the western barrier of the Keum Kang San region. Mr. Campbell, of Her Britannic Majesty's Consular Service, one of the few Europeans who has crossed it, in his charming narrative mentions that it is impassable for laden animals, and engaged porters for the ascent, but though the track is nothing better than a torrent bed abounding in great boulders, angular and shelving rocks, and slippery corrugations of entangled tree roots, I rode over the worst part, and my ponies made nothing of carrying the baggage up the rock ladders. The mountainside is covered with luxuriant and odorous vegetation, especially oak, chestnut, hawthorn, varieties of maple, pale pink azalea, and yellow clematis, interspersed with a few distorted pines, primulas and lilies of the valley covering the mossy ground. From the spirit shrine on the summit, a lovely panorama unfolds itself, billows of hilly woodland, gleams of water, wavy outlines of hills, backed by a jagged mountain wall attaining an altitude of over 6,000 feet in the loftiest pinnacle of the Keum Kang San. A fair land of promise, truly. But this pass is a rubicon to him who seeks the Diamond Mountain, with the intention of immuring himself for life in one of its many monasteries. For its name, Tan Pa, Crop Hair, was bestowed on it early in the history of Korean Buddhism for a reason which remains. There, those who have chosen the cloister emphasize their abandonment of the world by cutting off the top knot of married dignity or the heavy braid of bachelorhood. The eastern descent of the Tan Pa Ryong is by a series of zigzags, through woods and a profusion of varied and magnificent ferns. A long day followed of ascents and descents, deep fords of turbulent streams, valley villages with terrace cultivation of buckwheat, and glimpses of grey rock needles through pine and persimmon groves, and in the late afternoon, after struggling through a rough ford in which the water was halfway up the sides of the ponies, we entered a gorge and struck a smooth, broad, well-made road, the work of the monks, which traverses a fine forest of pines and firs above a booming torrent. Towards evening, the hills swung open to the light. Through the parting branches there were glimpses of granite walls and peaks reddening into glory. Red streams glowing in the slant sunbeams lighted up the blue gloom of the corniferae. There were glints of foam from the loud-tongued torrent below. The dew fell heavily laden with aromatic odours of pines, and as the valley narrowed again and the blue shadows fell, the picture was as fair as one could hope to see. The monks, though road-makers, are not bridge-builders, and there were difficult fords to cross, through which the ponies were left to struggle by themselves, the mapu crossing on single logs. In the deep water I discovered that its temperature was almost icy. The worst ford is at the point where the first view of Chang An Sa, the Temple of Eternal Rest, the oldest of the Keum Kang San monasteries, is obtained, a great pile of temple buildings with deep curved roofs in a glorious situation, crowded upon a small grassy plateau in one of the narrowest parts of the gorge, where the mountains fall back a little and afford Buddhism a peaceful shelter, secluded from the outer world by snow for four months of the year. Crossing the torrent and passing under a lofty Hong Sal Mun, or Red Arrow Gate, significant in Korea of the patronage of royalty, we were at once among the Chang An Sa buildings, which consist of temples large and small, a stage for religious dramas, bell and tablet houses, stables for the ponies of wayfarers, cells, dormitories, and a refectory for the abbot and monks, quarters for servants and neophytes, huge kitchens, a large guest hall, and a nunnery. 
Besides these, there are quarters devoted to the lame, halt, blind, infirm, and solitary, to widows, orphans, and the destitute. These guests, numbering one hundred, seemed well treated. Between monks, servants, and boys preparing for the priesthood, there may be one hundred more, and twenty nuns of all ages, from girlhood up to eighty-seven years. This large number of persons is supported by the rent and produce of church lands outside the mountains, the contributions of pilgrims and guests, the monies collected by the monks, who all go on mendicant expeditions, even up to the gates of Seoul, which at that time it was death for any priest to enter, and benefactions from the late queen, which had become increasingly liberal. The first impression of the plateau was that it was a woodyard on a large scale. Great logs and piles of planks were heaped under the stately pines, and under a superb Salisburia adiantifolia, seventeen feet in girth. Forty carpenters were sawing, planing, and hammering, and forty or fifty laborers were hauling in logs to the music of a wild chant, for mendicant effort had been resorted to energetically, with the result that the great temple was undergoing repairs, almost amounting to a reconstruction. Of the forty-five monasteries and monastic shrines which exist in the Diamond Mountain, enhancing its picturesqueness and supplying it with a religious and human interest, Chang An Sa may be taken as a fair specimen of the three largest, as it is undoubtedly the oldest, assuming the correctness of a historical record quoted by Mr. Campbell, which gives the date of its restoration by two monks, Yul Sa and Chin Hyo, as A.D. 515, in the reign of Pop Heng, a king of Shilla, then the most important of the kingdoms, afterwards amalgamated as Korea. The large temple is a fine old building of the type adapted from Chinese Buddhist architecture, oblong, with a heavy tiled roof 48 feet in height, with wings, deep eaves protecting masses of richly colored wood carving. The lofty reticulated roof is internally supported on an arrangement of heavy beams, elaborately carved and painted in rich colors. The panels of the doors, which serve as windows and let in a dim religious light, are bold fretwork, decorated in colors enriched with gold. The roofs of the actual shrines are supported on wooden pillars three feet in diameter, formed of single trees, and the panelled ceilings are embellished with intricate designs in colors and gold. In one, Shakyamuni's image, with a distinctly Hindu cast of countenance and a look of ineffable abstraction, sits under a highly decorative reticulated wooden canopy, with an altar before it, on which are brass incense burners, books of prayer, and lists of those deceased persons for whose souls masses have been duly paid for. Much rich brocade, soiled and dusty, and many gone fallons hang round this shrine. The Hall of the Four Sages contains three Buddhas in different attitudes of abstraction or meditation, a picture, wonderfully worked in gold and silks in Chinese embroidery, of Buddha and his disciples, for which the monks claim an antiquity of fourteen centuries, and sixteen lohans with their attendants. Along the sidewalks are a host of demons and animals. Another striking shrine is that dedicated to the lord of the Buddhistic hell and his ten princes. The monks call it the Temple of the Ten Judges. This is a shrine of great resort, and is much blackened by the smoke of incense and candles, but the infernal torments depicted in the pictures at the back of each judge are only too conspicuous. They are horrible beyond conception, and show a diabolical genius in hellish art, akin to that which inspired the creation of the groups in the inferno of the temple of Kuan Yin at Ting Hai on Chusan, familiar to some of my readers. Besides the ecclesiastical buildings and the common guest room, 
There are government buildings marked with the Korean national emblem for the use of officials who go up to Chang'an Sa for pleasure. It was difficult for me to find accommodation, but eventually a very pleasing young priest of high rank gave up his cell to me. Unfortunately, it was next the guest's kitchen, and the flues from the fires passing under it, I was baked in a temperature of 91 degrees, although, in spite of warnings about tigers, the dangers from which are by no means imaginary, I kept both door and window open all night. The cell had for its furniture a shrine of Gautama and an image of Kuan Yin on a shelf, and a few books which I learned were Buddhist classics, not volumes, as in a cell which I occupied later, full of pictures by no means inculcating holiness. In the next room, equally hot and without a chink open for ventilation, thirty guests moaned and tossed all night, a single candle dimly lighting a picture of Buddha and the dusty and hideous ornaments on the altar below. At 9 p.m., midnight, and again at 4 a.m., which is the hour at which the monks rise, bells were rung, cymbals and gongs were beaten, and the praises of Buddha were chanted in an unknown tongue. A feature at once cheerful and cheerless is the presence at Chang An Sa of a number of bright, active orphan boys from ten to thirteen years old, who are at present servitors, but who will one day become priests. It is an exercise of forbearance to abstain from writing much about the beauties of Chang An Sa as seen in two days of perfect heavenliness. It is a calm retreat, that small, green, semicircular plateau which the receding hills have left, walling in the back and sides with rocky precipices half clothed with forest, while the bridgeless torrent in front, raging and thundering among huge boulders of pink granite, secludes it from all but the adventurers. Alike in the rose of sunrise, in the red and gold of sunset, or gleaming steely blue in the prosaic glare of midday, the great rock peak on the left bank, one of the highest in the range, compels ceaseless admiration. The appearance of its huge vertical topmost ribs has been well compared to that of the pipes of an organ, this organ pipe formation being common in the range. Seams and ledges halfway down give root hold to a few fantastic conifers and azaleas, and lower still, all suggestion of form is lost among dense masses of magnificent forest. As I proposed to take a somewhat different route from Yu Chong Sa, the first temple on the eastern slope, from that traversed by my predecessors, the Honorable G. W. Curzon and Mr. Campbell, I left the ponies and baggage at Chang An Sa. The Mapu, who were bent on Ku Kyong, accompanying me for a part of the distance, and took a five days' journey in the glorious Kyom Kang San in unrivalled weather, in air which was elixir, crossing the range to Yu Chom Sa by the An Mun Chai, Goose Gate Terrace, 4,215 feet in altitude and recrossing it by the Qi Cho, 3,570 feet. Taking two coolies to carry essentials, and a Na Myo, or mountain chair with two bearers, for the whole journey, all supplied by the monks, I walked the first stage to the monasteries of Pyo Un Sa and Chiang Yang Sa, the latter at an elevation of about 2,760 feet. From it, the view, which passes for the grandest in Korea, is obtained of the 12,000 peaks. There is assuredly no single view that I have seen in Japan or even in western China, which equals it for beauty and grandeur. Across the grand gorge through which the Chang An Sa torrent thunders, and above primeval tiger-haunted forests with their infinity of green, rises the central ridge of the Kyum Kang San, jagged all along its summit, each yellow granite pinnacle being counted as a peak. 
On that enchanting May evening, when odours of paradise, the fragrant breath of a million flowering shrubs and trailers, of bursting buds and unfolding ferns, rose into the cool dewy air, and the silence could be felt, I was not inclined to enter a protest against Korean exaggeration, on the ground that the number of peaks is probably nearer 1,200 than 12,000, each yellow granite pinnacle being counted as a peak. On that enchanting May evening, when odours of paradise, the fragrant breath of a million flowering shrubs and trailers, of bursting buds and unfolding ferns, rose into the cool dewy air, and the silence could be felt, I was not inclined to enter a protest against Korean exaggeration, on the ground that the number of peaks is probably nearer 1,200 than 12,000. Their yellow granite pinnacles, weathered into silver grey, rose up cold, stern, and steely blue from the glorious forests which drape their lower heights, winter above and summer below, then purpled into red as the sun sank and gleamed above the twilight, till each glowing summit died out as lamps which are extinguished one by one, and the whole took on the ashy hue of death. The situation of Pyo Unsa is romantic on the right bank of the torrent, and is approached by a bridge and by passing under several roofed gateways. The monastery had been newly rebuilt and is one mass of fretwork, carving, gilding, and color, the whole decoration being the work of the monks. The front of the Temple of the Believing Mind is a magnificent piece of bold wood carving, the motive being the peony. Every part of the building which is not stone or tile is carved and decorated in blue, red, white, green and gold. It may be barbaric, but it is barbaric splendor. There too is a temple of judgment with hideous representations of the Buddhist hells one scene being the opening of the books in which the deeds of men's mortal lives are written. The fifty monks of Pyo Un Sa were very friendly and non-impecunious. One gave up to me his own oven-like cell, but repaid himself for the sacrifice by indulging in ceaseless staring. The wind bells of the establishment and the big bell have a melody in their tones such as I have rarely heard, and when at 4 a.m. bells of all sizes and tones announced that prayer is better than sleep, there was nothing about the sounds to jar on the pure freshness of morning. The monks are well dressed and jolly, and have a well-to-do air which clashes with any pretensions to asceticism. The rule of these monasteries is a strict vegetarianism which allows neither milk nor eggs, and in the whole region there are neither fowls nor domestic animals. Not to wound the prejudices of my hosts, I lived on tea, rice, honey water, edible pine nuts, and a most satisfying combination of pine nuts and honey. After a light breakfast on these delicacies, the sub-abbot took me to see his grandmother, a very bright, pleasing woman of eighty, who came from Seoul thirteen years ago, and built a house within the monastery grounds in order to die in its quiet blessedness. There I had to eat a second ethereal meal, and the hospitable hostess forced on me a pot of exquisite honey and a bag of pine nuts. These, the product of the Pinus pinea, which grows profusely throughout the range, furnish an important and nutritious article of monkish diet, and are exported in quantities as a luxury. They are rich and very oily, and turn rancid soon after being shelled. The honey is also locally produced. The beehives, which usually stand two together in cavities in the rocks, are hollow logs with clay covers mounted on blocks of wood or stone. Leaving this friendly hostess and the seven nuns of the nunnery behind, the sub-abbot showed me the direction in which to climb, for road there is none, 
and at parting presented me with a fan. A visit to the Keom Kang San elevates a Korean into the distinguished position of a traveller, and many a young resident of Seoul gains this fashionable reputation. It is not as containing shrines of pilgrimage, for most Koreans despise Buddhism and its shaven mendicant priests, that these mountains are famous in Korea, but for their picturesque beauties, much celebrated in Korean poetry. The broad backbone of the peninsula, which has trended near to the east coast from Pukchong southwards, has degenerated into tameness, when suddenly Keum Kang San, or the Diamond Mountain, with its elongated mass of serrated, jagged, and inaccessible peaks, and magnificent primeval forest, occupying an area of about 35 miles in length by 22 in breadth, starts off from it near the 39th parallel of latitude in the province of Kangwon. Buddhism, which, as in Japan, possesses itself of the fairest spots in nature, fixed itself in this romantic seclusion as early as the 6th century AD, and the venerable relics of the time, when for 1,000 years it was the official, as well as the popular cult of the country, are chiefly to be found in the recesses of this mountain region, where the same faith, though now discredited, disestablished and despised, still attracts a certain number of votaries, and a fair larger number of visitors and so-called pilgrims who resort to the shrines to indulge in Ku Kyong, a Korean term which covers pleasure-seeking, sightseeing, the indulgence of curiosity, and much else. So far as I have been able to learn, there are only two routes by which the Keum Kang San can be penetrated, the one which, after following the bed of a singularly rough torrent, crosses the watershed at Anmun Chai, and on or near which the principal monasteries and shrines are situated, and the Ki Cho, a lower and less interesting pass. Both routes start from Chang'an Sa. The 42 shrines are the headquarters of about 400 monks and about 50 nuns, who add to their religious exercises the weaving of cotton and hempen cloth. The lay servitors possibly number 1,000. The four great monasteries, two on the eastern and two on the western slope, absorb more than 300 of the whole number. All except the high monastic officials beg through the country, alms bowl in hand, the only distinctive features of their dress being a very peculiar hat and the rosary. They chant the litanies of Buddha from house to house, and there are few who deny them food and lodging, and a few cash, or a little rice. The monasteries are presided over by what we should call abbots, superiors of the first or second class according to the importance of the establishment. These Chongsop and Son Tong are nominally elected annually, but actually continue in office for years, unless their conduct gives rise to dissatisfaction. Beyond the confirmation of the election of the Chongsop of those monasteries which possess a red arrow gate by the Board of Rites at Seoul, the disestablished church appears to be quite free from state interference. In the case of restoring and rebuilding shrines, large sums are collected in Seoul and the southern provinces, though faith in Buddhism as a creed rarely exists. On making inquiries through Mr. Miller as to the way in which the number of monks is kept up, I learned that the majority are either orphans or children whose parents have given them to the monasteries at a very early age, owing to poverty. These are more or less educated and trained by the monks. It must be supposed that among the number there are a few who escape from the weariness and friction of secular life into a region in which seclusion and devotion are possible. Of this type was the pale and interesting young priest who gave up his room to me at Chang An Sa, and two who accompanied us to Yu Chom Sa, one of whom chanted 
Namu Amitabu nearly the whole day as he journeyed, telling a bead on his rosary for each ten repetitions. Mr. Miller asked him what the words meant. Just letters, he replied. They have no meaning, but if you say them many times you will get to heaven better. Then he gave Mr. Miller the rosary and taught him the mystic syllables, saying, Now you keep the beads, say the words, and you will go to heaven. Among the younger priests several seemed in earnest. Others make the monasteries, as is largely the case with the celebrated shrines of Kuan Yin on the Chinese island of Putu, a refuge from justice or creditors. Some remain desiring peaceful indolence, and not a few are vowed and tonsured who came simply to view the scenery of the Keum Kang San and were too much enchanted to leave it. As to the moribund Buddhism, which has found its most secluded retreat in these mountains, it is overlaid with demonolatry, and like that of China, is smothered under a host of semi-deified heroes. Of the lofty aims and aspirations after righteousness which distinguish the great reforming sects of Japan, such as the Monto, it knows nothing. The monks are grossly ignorant and superstitious. They know nearly nothing of the history and tenets of their own creed, or of the purport of their liturgies, which to most of them are just letters, the ceaseless repetition of which constitutes merit. Though some of them know Chinese, and this knowledge means education in Korea, worship consists in the mumbling or loud intoning of Sanskrit or Tibetan phrases, of the meaning of which they have no conception. My impression of most of the monks was that their religious performances are absolutely without meaning to them, and that belief, except among a few, does not exist. The Koreans universally attribute to them gross profligacy, of the existence of which at one of the large monasteries it was impossible not to become aware, but between their romantic and venerable surroundings, the order and quietness of their lives, their benevolence to the old and destitute, who find a peaceful asylum with them, and in the main their courtesy and hospitality, I am compelled to admit that they exercise a certain fascination, and that I prefer to remember their virtues rather than their faults. My sympathies go out to them for their appreciation of the beautiful, and for the way in which religious art has assisted nature by the exceeding picturesqueness of the positions and decoration of their shrines. The route from Chang'an Sa to Yu Chom Sa, about eleven miles, is mainly the rough beds of two great mountain torrents. Along this, in romantic positions, are three large monasteries, Pyo Un Sa, Maha Li An Sa, and Yu Chom Sa, besides a number of smaller shrines, with from two to five attendants each, one especially, Po Tok Am Sa, dedicated to Kuan Yin, picturesque beyond description, a fantastic temple built out from the face of a cliff at a height of 100 feet and supported below the centre by a pillar, round which a blossoming white clematis and an Ampelopsis vaichiana, in the rose flush of its spring leafage, had entwined their lavish growth. No quadruped can travel this route farther than Chang An Sa. Coolies, very lightly laden, and chair bearers carrying a Nam Yo, two long poles with a slight seat in the middle, a noose of rope for the feet, and light uprights bound together with a Visteria rope to support the back, can be used, but the occupant of the chair has to walk much of the way. The torrent bed contracts above Chang An Sa, opens out here and there, and above Pyo Un Sa narrows into a gash, only opening out again at the foot of the An Mun Chai. Surely the beauty of that eleven miles is not much exceeded anywhere on earth. Colossal cliffs, upbearing mountains, forests and grey gleaming peaks, rifted to give root hold to pines and maples, 
oft-times contracting till the blue heaven above is narrowed to a strip, boulders of pink granite forty and fifty feet height, pines on their crests and ferns and lilies in their crevices, round which the clear waters swirl before sliding down over smooth surfaces of pink granite to rest a while in deep pink pools where they take a more brilliant than an emerald green with the flashing luster of a diamond, rocks and ledges over which the crystal stream dashes in drifts of foam, shelving rock surfaces on which the decorative Chinese characters, the laborious work of pilgrims, afford the only foothold, slides steeper still made passable for determined climbers by holes drilled by the monks and fitted with pegs and rails rocks with bas-reliefs or small shrines of buddha draped with flowering trailers a cliff with a bas-relief of buddha forty-five feet high on a pedestal thirty feet broad rocks carved into lanterns and altars whose harsh outlines are softened by mosses and lichens, and above, huge timber and fantastic peaks rising into the summer heaven's delicious blue. A description can be only a catalogue. The actuality was intoxicating, a canyon on the grandest scale, with every element of beauty present. This route cannot be traversed in European shoes. In Korean string footgear, however, I never slipped once. There was much jumping from boulder to boulder, much winding round rocky projections, clinging to their irregularities with scarcely foothold, and one's back to the torrent far below, and much leaping over deep crevices and walking tightrope fashion over rails. Wherever the traveller has to leave the difficulties of the torrent bed, he encounters those of slippery sloping rocks, which he has to traverse by hanging on to tree trunks. Our two priestly companions were most polite to me, giving me a hand at the dangerous places and beguiling the way by legends, chiefly Buddhistic, concerning every fantastic and abnormal rock and pool, such as the Myokil Sang, the colossal figure of Buddha referred to before, a pothole in the granite bed of the stream, the wash basin of some mythical bodhisattva, the fire dragon pool and the bathing places of dragons in the fantastic Man Pong Tong grotto of myriad cascades, and the lion stone which repelled the advance of the Japanese invaders in 1592. Beyond the third monastery, the gorge becomes wider and less fantastic, the forest thinner allowing scattered glimpses of the sky, and finally some long zigzags take the traveller up to the open grassy summit of the Anmun Chai, on which plums, pears, cherries, blush azaleas and pink rhododendrons, which had long ceased blooming below, were in their first flush of beauty. To the west, the difficult country of the previous week's journey, grey granite, deep valleys and tiger-haunted forest faded into a veil of blue, and in the east, over diminishing forest-covered ranges, gleamed the blue sea of Japan, more than four thousand feet below. On the eastern descent there are gigantic pines and firs, some of them ruthlessly barked, and the long dependent streamers of the grey-green Lycopodium seaboldi, with which they are festooned, give the forest a funereal aspect. Of this, the peculiar fringed hats are made, which are worn on occasion by both monks and nuns. After many downward zigzags, the track enters another rocky gorge with a fine torrent, in the bed of which are huge potholes, shown as the bathing places of dragons, whose habits must have been much cleanlier than those of the present inhabitants of the land. The great monastery of Yu Chom Sa, with its many curved roofs and general look of newness and wealth, is approached by crossing a very tolerable bridge. The road, which passes through a well-kept burial ground, where the ashes of the pious and learned abbots of several centuries repose under more or less stately monuments, 
was much encumbered near the monastery by great pine logs newly hewn for its restoration which was being carried out on a very expensive scale the monks made a difficulty about receiving us and it was not till after some delay and the production of my kwan ja that we were allotted rooms in the government buildings for the two days of our halt after this small difficulty they were unusually kind and friendly and one of the young priests who came over the anmun chai with us offered mr miller the use of his cell on sunday saying that it would be a quieter place than the great room to study his belief i had hoped for rest and quiet on the following day having had rather a hard week but these were unattainable besides seventy monks and twenty nuns there were nearly two hundred lay servitors and carpenters and all were bent upon ku kyong the first european woman to visit the keum kang san being regarded as a great sight and from early morning till late at night there was no rest the kang floor of my room being heated from the kitchen it was too hot to exist with the paper front closed and the crowds of monks nuns and servitors finishing with the carpenters who crowded in whenever it was opened and hung there hour after hour nearly suffocated me the day being very warm the abbot and several senior monks discussed with mr miller the merits of rival creeds saying that the only difference between buddhists and ourselves is that they don't kill even the smallest insect while we disregard what we call animal life and that we don't look upon monasticism and other forms of asceticism as means of salvation they admitted that among their priests there are more who live in known sin than strivers after righteousness there are many bright busy boys about yu chom sa most of whom had already had their heads shaved to one who had not che on e gave a piece of chicken but he refused it because he was a buddhist on which an objectionable looking old sneak of a priest told him that it was all right to eat it so long as no one saw him but the boy persisted in his refusal at midnight being awakened by the boom of the great bell and the disorderly and jarring clang of innumerable small ones i went at the request of the friendly young priest our fellow traveller to see him perform the devotions which are taken in turn by the monks the great bronze bell an elaborate piece of casting of the fourteenth century stands in a rude wooden clay-floored tower by itself a dim paper lantern on a dusty rafter barely lighted up the white-robed figure of the devotee as he circled the bell chanting in a most musical voice a sanskrit litany of whose meaning he was ignorant striking the bosses of the bell with a knot of wood as he did so half an hour passed thus then taking a heavy mallet and passing to another chant he circled the bell with a greater and ever increasing passion of devotion beating its bosses heavily and rhythmically faster and faster louder and louder ending by producing a burst of frenzied sound which left him for a moment exhausted then seizing the swinging beam the three full tones which end the worship and which are produced by striking the bell on the rim which is eight inches thick and on the middle which is very thin made the tower and the ground vibrate and boomed up and down the valley with their unforgettable music of that young monk's sincerity i have not one doubt he led us to the great temple a vast chamber of imagery where a solitary monk chanted before an altar in the light from a solitary lamp in an alabaster bowl accompanying his chant by striking a small bell with a deer horn the dim light left cavernous depths of shadow in the temple from which eyes and teeth weapons and arms and legs of otherwise invisible gods and devils showed uncannily behind the altar is a rude and monstrous piece of wood carving representing the upturned roots of a tree 
among which fifty-three idols are sitting and standing. As well by daylight as in the dimness of midnight, there are an uncouthness and power about this gigantic representation which are very impressive. Below the carving are three frightful dragons, on whose faces the artist has contrived to impress an expression of torture and defeat. The legend of the altarpiece runs thus. When fifty-three priests come to Korea from India to introduce Buddhism, they reached this place, and, being weary, sat down by a well under a spreading tree. Presently, three dragons came up from the well and began a combat with the Buddhists, in the course of which they called up a great wind which tore up the tree. Not to be outmaneuvered, each priest placed an image of Buddha on a root of the tree, turning it into an altar. Finally, the priests overcome the dragons, forced them into the well, and piled great rocks on the top of it to keep them there, founded the monastery, and built this temple over the dragon's grave. On either side of this unique altarpiece is a bouquet of peonies, four feet wide by ten feet high. The private apartments of this and the other monasteries consist of a living room and very small single cells, each with the shrine of its occupant, and all very clean. It must be remembered, however, that this easy, peaceful, luxurious life only lasts for a part of the year, and that all but a few of the monks must make an annual tramp, wallet and begging bowl in hand, over rough, miry, or dusty Korean roads, put up with vile and dirty accommodation, beg for their living from those who scorn their tonsor and their creed, and receive low talk from the lowest in the land. Just before we left, the old abbot invited us into his very charming suit of rooms, and with graceful hospitality prepared a repast for us with his own hands, square cakes of rich oily pine nuts glued together with honey, thin cakes of popped rice and honey, sweet cake, Chinese sweetmeat, honey, and bowls of honey water with pine nuts floating on its surface. The oil of these nuts certainly supplied the place of animal food during my enforced abstinence from it, but rich vegetable oil and honey soon pall on the palate, and the abbot was concerned that we did not do justice to our entertainment. The general culture produced by Buddhism at these monasteries, and the hospitality, consideration, and gentleness of deportment, contrast very favorably with the arrogance, superciliousness, insolence, and conceit which I have seen elsewhere in Korea among the so-called followers of Confucius. When we departed, all the monks and laborers bade us a courteous farewell, some of the older priests accompanying us for a short distance. After descending the slope by the well-made road which leads down to the large monastery of Sin Kye Sa, at the northeast foot of the Kyom Kang San, we left it for a rough and difficult westerly track, which, after affording some bright gleams of the Sea of Japan, enters dense forest full of great boulders and magnificent specimens of the Felix Mas and Osmunda Regalis. A severe climb up and down an irregular, broken staircase of rock took us over the Ki Cho Pass, 3,700 feet in altitude, after which there is a tedious march of some hours along bare and unpicturesque mountain sides before reaching the well-made path which leads through pine woods to the beautiful plateau of Chang An Sa. The young priest had kept our baggage carefully, but the heat of his floor had melted the candles in the boxes and had turned candy into molasses, making havoc among photographic materials at the same time. End of section 12section 13 of korea and her neighbors by isabella l bird this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by avahi in april 2021 chapter 12 
Along the Coast, Part 1 On leaving Chang An Sa for Won San, we retraced our route as far as Kal Ron Gi, and afterwards crossed the Mak Pai Pass, from which there is a grand view of the Keum Kang San. Much of a somewhat tedious day was spent in crossing a rolling elevated plateau, bordered by high denuded hills, on which the potato flourishes at a height of 2,500 feet. The soil is very fertile, but not being suited to rice, is very little occupied. Crossing the Sai Kal Chai, 2,200 feet in altitude, the infamous road descends on a beautiful alluvial valley, a rich farming country, sprinkled with hamlets and surrounded by pretty hills wooded with scrub oak, which in the spring is very largely used for fertilizing rice fields. The branches are laid on the inundated surface till the leaves rot off, and they are then removed for fuel. In this innocent-looking valley, the tiger scare was in full force. A tiger, the people said, had carried off a woman the previous week, and a dog and pig the previous night. It seemed incredible, yet there was a consensus of evidence. Tigers are occasionally trapped in that region by baiting a pit with a dog or pig, and the ensnared animal is destroyed by poison or hunger to avoid injury to the skin, which, if it is that of a fine animal, is very valuable. A man is not the least ashamed of saying that he has not nerve or pluck for tiger hunting, which in Korea is a dangerous game, for the hunters are stationed at the head of a gorge, usually behind brushwood and sometimes behind rocks, the big game, tigers and leopards, being driven up towards them by large bodies of men. When one realizes that the arms used are matchlocks lighted by slow matches from cords wound round the arm, and that the charge consists of three imperfectly rounded balls the size of a pea, and that, owing to the thickness of the screen behind which the hunters are posted, the game is only sighted when quite close upon them, one ceases to wonder at the reluctance of the village peasants to turn out in pursuit of a man-eater, even though the bones bring a very high price as Chinese medicine. We put up at the only inn in the region. It had no clean room, but the landlord's wife gave up hers to me on condition that I would not keep the door open for fear of a tiger. The temperature was 93 degrees, and to secure a little ventilation and yet keep my promise, I tore the paper off the latticework of the door. Mr. Miller described his circumstances thus. I went to sleep in the yard, but the host would not let me for fear of tigers, so I had to sleep in a room eight feet by ten, with a hot floor, with seven other men, a cat, and a bird. By tearing the paper off a window near my head, I saved myself from death by suffocation, and could have had a good night's rest had not the four horses been crowded into two stalls in the kitchen. They found their quarters so close that they squealed, kicked, bit, and fought all night, and their drivers helped them to make night hideous by their yelling. Nobody slept, and I had my full share of the unrest and disturbance, a bad preparation for an eleven hours' ride on the next day, which was fiercely hot, as were the remaining six days of the journey. The road from this lofty tiger-haunted valley to the sea level at Chung Tai is for the most part through valleys very sparsely peopled. Much forest land, however, was being cleared for the planting of cotton, and the peasant farmers are energetic enough to carry their cultivation to a height of 2,000 feet. On nearly the whole of this journey I estimated that the land is capable of supporting double its present population. At Hoa Chung, a prettily situated marketplace, a student who had successfully passed the literary examination of the Quagga in Seoul, surrounded by a crowd in bright-coloured festive clothing, was celebrating his return by sacrificing at his father's grave. On the various roads, there were many processions escorting village students home, 
from the great competition in the royal presence at the capital, the student in coloured clothes, on a gaily caparisoned horse or ass, with music and flags in front of him, and friends, gaily dressed, walking beside him. On approaching his village he was met with flags and music, the headman and villagers, even the women in gay apparel, going out to welcome him. After this success, he was entitled to erect a tall pole, with a painted dragon upon it, in front of his house. Success was, however, very costly, and often hung the millstone of debt round a man's neck for the remainder of his life. After passing, the student became eligible for official position, the sole object of ambition to an educated Korean. At Hoa Chung we turned eastwards, and took the main road to the coast, attaining an altitude, uncorrected, of 3,117 feet, by continued ascents over rounded hills, which, when not absolutely bare except for coarse, unlovely grasses, only produced stunted hazel bush. After this, an easy ascent among absolutely denuded hills leads up to a spirit shrine of more than usual importance, crowded with the customary worthless ex votos, rags and old straw shoes. At that point, the road makes an altogether unexpected and surprising plunge over the bare shoulders of a bare hill into paradise. This pass of the 99 turns, Chu Chi Chang, deserves its name, the number of sharp zigzags not being exaggerated, as in the case of the 12,000 peaks. It is so absolutely rocky, and so difficult in consequence, that it is more passable in snow than in summer. Its abrupt turns lead down a forest-clothed mountain ridge into a magnificent gorge, densely wooded with oak, Spanish chestnut, weeping lime, abies excelsa, and magnolia, looped together with the white millefleur rose. On the northern side rises Hoang Chong San, a noble mountain and conspicuous landmark much broken up into needles and precipices, and clothed nearly to its summit with forests, of which the Pinus Silvestris is the monarch. The descent of the pass takes one hour and a half, the road coming down upon a torrent fifty feet wide, only visible in glints of foam here and there, amid its smothering overgrowth of blossoming magnolia, syringa, and roses. The filthy, miserable hamlet of Chung Tai, composed of five hovels, all inns, was rather a comfortless close to a fatiguing day. These houses are roofed, as in some other villages, with thick slabs of wood heaped on each other, kept on, so far as they are kept on, by big stones. The forest above on the mountains is a royal reservation, made so by the first king of this dynasty, who built stone walls round the larger trees. I had occasion to notice at Chung Tai, and in many other places, the extreme voracity of the Koreans. They eat not to satisfy hunger, but to enjoy the sensation of repletion. The training for this enjoyment begins at a very early age, as I had several opportunities of observing. A mother feeds her young child with rice, and when it can eat no more in an upright position, lays it on its back on her lap and feeds it again, tapping its stomach from time to time with a flat spoon to ascertain if further cramming is possible. The child is father to the man, and the adult Korean shows that he has reached a desirable stage of repletion by eructations, splutterings, slapping his stomach, and groans of satisfaction looking round with a satisfied air. A quart of rice, which when cooked is of great bulk, is a laborer's meal, but besides there are other dishes which render its insipidity palatable. Among them are pounded capsicum, soy, various native sauces of abominable odors, kimchi, a species of sauerkraut, seaweed, salt fish, and salted seaweed fried in batter. The very poor only take two meals a day, but those who can afford it 
take three and four. In this respect of veracity, all classes are alike. The great merit of a meal is not so much quality as quantity, and from infancy onwards one object in life is to give the stomach as much capacity and elasticity as is possible, so that four pounds of rice daily may not incommode it. People in easy circumstances drink wine and eat great quantities of fruit, nuts and confectionery in the intervals between meals, yet are as ready to tackle the next food as though they had been starving for a week. In well-to-do houses, beef and dog are served on large trenchers, and as each guest has its separate table, a host can show generosity to this or that special friend without helping others to more than is necessary. I have seen Koreans eat more than three pounds of solid meat at one meal. Large as a portion is, it is not unusual to see a Korean eat three and even four, and when people abstain from these excesses, it may generally be assumed that they are too poor to indulge in them. It is quite common to see from twenty to twenty-five peaches or small melons disappear at a single sitting, and without being peeled. There can be no doubt that the enormous consumption of red pepper, which is supplied even to infants, helps this gluttonous style of eating. It is not surprising that dyspepsia and kindred evils are very common among Koreans. The Korean is omnivorous. Dog meat is in great request at certain seasons, and dogs are extensively bred for the table. Pork, beef, fish, raw, dried, and salted, the intestines of animals, all birds and game, no part being rejected, are eaten. A baked fowl with its head, claws, and interior intact being the equivalent of the fatted calf. Cooking is not always essential. On the Han I saw men taking fish off the hook, and after plunging them into a pot of red pepper sauce, eating them at once with their bones. Wheat, barley, maize, millet, the Irish and sweet potato, oats, peas, beans, rice, radishes, turnips, herbs, and wild leaves and roots innumerable, seaweed, shrimps, pastry made of flour, sugar, and oil, kimchi, on the making of which the whole female population of the middle and lower classes is engaged in November, a homemade vermicelli of buckwheat flour and white of egg, largely made up into a broth, soups, dried persimmons, sponge cakes, cakes of the edible pine nut and honey, of flour, sugar, and sesame seeds, onions, garlic, lily bulbs, chestnuts, and very much else are eaten. Oil of sesame is largely used in cooking, as well as vinegar, soy, and other sauces of pungent and objectionable odors, the basis of most of them being capsicums and fermented rotten beans. The magistracy of Tong Chon, where we halted the next day at noon, and where the curiosity of the people was absolutely suffocating, is a town sheltered from the sea, which is within two miles, by a high ridge, and is situated prettily in a double fold of hills, remarkable for the artistic natural grouping of very grand pines. At this point a spell of the most severe heat of the year set in, and the remainder of the journey was accomplished in a temperature ranging from 89 degrees to 100 degrees in the shade, and seldom falling below 80 degrees at night, phenomenal heat for the first days of June. Taking advantage of it, the whole male population was in the fields rice planting. Rice valleys, reaching the unusual magnitude for Korea of from 3 to 7 miles in breadth, and from 6 to 14 miles in length, sloping gently to the sea, with innumerable villages on the slopes of the hills which surround them, were numerous. Among them I saw, for the only time, reservoirs for the storage of water for irrigation. The pink ibis and the spotted green frog were abundant everywhere. The country there has a look of passable prosperity, 
but the people are kept at a low level by official exactions. On this coast of Kong Won Do are the Pal Kyong or Eight Views, which are of much repute in Korea. We passed two of them. Su Chung Dai, the place between the waters, is a narrow strip of elevated white sand with the long roll of the Pacific on the east and the gentle plash of a lovely freshwater lake on the west. This lake of Ma Cha Tong, the only body of fresh water which I saw in Korea, about six miles in length by two in breadth, has mountainous shores much broken by bays and inlets, at the head of each of which is a village half hidden among trees in the folds of the hills, while wooded conical islets break the mirror of the surface. On the white barrier of sand there are some fine specimens of the red-stemmed Pinus silvestris, with a carpet of dwarf crimson roses and pink lilies. Among the mountain forests are leopards, tigers, and deer, and the call of the pheasant and the cooing of the wild dove floated sweetly from the lake shore. It was an idyll of peace and beauty. The other of the eight views is rather a curiosity than a beauty, miles of cream-colored sand blown up in wavy billows as high as the plumy tops of thousands of fir trees which are helplessly embedded in it. During the long hot ride of eleven hours, visions of the evening halt at a peaceful village on the seashore filled my mind, and hope made the toilsome climb over several promontories of black basalt tolerable, even though the descents were so steep that the mapu held the ponies up by their tails. In the early twilight, when the fierce sun blaze was over, in the smoky redness of a heated evening atmosphere, when every rock was giving forth the heat it had absorbed in the day, across the stream which is at once the outlet of the lake and the boundary between the provinces of Kang Won and Ham Gyeong, appeared a large, straggling, grey-roofed village, above high water mark, on a beach of white sand. Several fishing junks were lying in shelter at the mouth of the stream. Women were beating clothes and drawing water, and children and dogs were rolling over each other on the sand, all more or less idealized by being silhouetted in purple against the hot, lurid sky. As the enchantment of distance faded, and Ma Cha Tong revealed itself in plain prose, fading from purple into sober grey, the ideal of a romantic halt by the pure sea vanished. A long, crooked, tumble-down narrow street, with narrower offshoots, heaps of fish offal and rubbish, in which swine, mangy, blear-eyed dogs, and children, much afflicted with skin disease, were indiscriminately routing and rolling, pools covered with a thick brown scum, a stream which had degenerated into an open sewer, down which thick green slime flowed tardily, a beach of white sand, the upper part of which was blackened with fish laid out to dry, frames for drying fish everywhere, men, women, children, all as dirty in person and clothing as it was possible to be, thronging the roadway as we approached, air laden with insupportable odors, and the vilest accommodation I ever had in Korea, have fixed this night in my memory. The inn, if inn it was, gave me a room six feet by eight and five feet two inches high. Ang Paks, for it was the family granary, iron shoes of ploughs and spades, bundles of foul rags, seaweed, ears of millet hanging in bunches from the roof, pack saddles, and worse than all else, rotten beans fermenting for soy, and malodorous half-salted fish, just left room for my camp bed. This den opened on a vile yard, partly dunghill and partly pig-pen, in which is the well from which the women of the house, with sublime song froid, draw the drinking water. Outside is a swamp, which throughout the night gave off sickening odours. 
every few minutes something was wanted from my room, and as there was not room for two, I had every time to go out into the yard. Wong's good night was, I hope you won't die. When I entered, the mercury was 87 degrees. After that, cooking for man and beast, and the kang floor raised it to 107 degrees, at which point it stood till morning, vivifying into revoltingly active life myriads of cockroaches and vermin which revel in heat, not to speak of rats which ran over my bed, ate my candle, gnawed my straps, and would have left me without boots, had I not long before learned to hang them from the tripod of my camera. From nine years of travelling, some of it very severe and comfortless, that night stands out as hideously memorable. The raison d'etre of Ma Cha Tong and the numerous coast villages which exist wherever a convenient shore and a protection for boats occur together is the coast fishing. The fact that a floating population of over 8,000 Japanese fishermen make a living by fishing on the coast near Husan shows that there is a redundant harvest to be reaped. The Korean fisherman is credited with utter want of enterprise, and Mr. Oyezen, in the customs report for one son for 1891, accuses him of remaining content with such fish as will run into crudely and easily constructed traps set out along the shore, which only require attention for an hour or so each day. I must, however, say that each village that I passed possessed from seven to twelve fishing junks which were kept at sea. They are unseaworthy boats, and it is not surprising that they hug the shore. I believe that the fishing industry, with every other, is paralyzed by the complete insecurity of the earnings of labors, and by the exactions of officials, and that a Korean fisherman does not care to earn money of which he will surely be deprived on any or no pretense, and that, along with the members of the industrial classes generally, he seeks the protection of poverty. The fish taken on this coast, when salted and dried, find their way by boat to Wonsan, and from thence over central Korea, but in winter peddlers carry them directly inland from the fishing villages. Salterns on the plan of those often seen in China occur frequently near the villages. The operation of making salt from seawater is absolutely primitive, and so rough and dirty that the whiteness of the coarse product which results is an astonishment. In spite of heavy losses and heavier squeezings, this industry, which is carried on from May to October, is a profitable one. The road beyond that noisome halting place traverses picturesque country for many miles, being cut out of the sides of noble cliffs, or crosses basaltic spurs by arrangements resembling rock ladders, keeping perforce always close to the sea now on dizzy precipices, then descending to firm hard stretches of golden sand, or winding just above high water mark among colossal boulders which are completely covered with the Ampelopsis Vaichiana, the creeper par excellence of Korea. The sea was green and violet near the shore, and a vivid blue in the distance, and on its ripple-less surface fishing boats with grey hulls and brown sails lay motionless, for the rush and swirl of tides, rising and falling as they do on the west coast from twenty-five to thirty-eight feet, are unknown on the east coast, the variation between high and low water being within eighteen inches. It was the hottest day of the year and it was fortunate that the prettily situated market-place of Sio Im had a new and clean inn, in which it was possible to prolong the noonday halt, and to get a good dinner of fresh and salt fish, vegetables, herbs, sauces, and rice, for the sum of two cents gold. There also, being the market-day, Mr. Miller succeeded in obtaining cash for four silver yen from the peddlers. 
after passing over a tedious sandy plain with a reserve of fine firs under which the countless dead of ages lie under great sand mounds held together by nets or branches of trees we reached at sunset my ideal a clean exquisitely situated village of nine houses of which one was an inn where contrary to the general rule we were made cordially welcome footnote a kwanja being an official passport lays a traveller open to the suspicion that like officials he will take the best of everything he can get without paying for it and this dread added to a natural distrust of foreigners led to more or less unwillingness to receive us in many places the mapu having to console the people by asservating that i paid the full price for all i got and that even when i tore a sheet of paper from the window i paid for it End footnote. the nine families at chin pul possessed seven good-sized fishing boats that inn is of unusual construction there is a broad mud platform on which fireplaces and utensils for cooking for man and beast occupy one half and the other is matted for sleeping and eating my room which had no window but was clean and plastered opened on this and as the mercury was at one hundred eleven degrees until three a m owing to the heated floor i sat at the door nearly all night so the dawn and an early start and the coolness of the green and violet shades of the almost tripleless ocean which laved its varied shore of bays promontories and lofty cliffs were very welcome a valley opening on the sea which it took five hours to skirt and cross covered with grain and newly planted rice is literally fringed with villages which look comfortably prosperous in spite of exactions a smaller valley contains about three thousand acres of rice land only and on the slopes surrounding all these are rich lands bearing heavy crops of wheat millet barley cotton tobacco castor oil sesame oats turnips peas beans and potatoes the ponies are larger and better kept in that region and the red bulls are of immense size the black pig however is as small and mean as ever the crops were clean and the rice dikes and irrigation channels well kept good and honest government would create as happy and prosperous a people as the traveller finds in japan the soil being very similar while korea has a far better climate during the land journey from chang an sa to wonsan i had better opportunities of seeing the agricultural methods of the koreans than in the valleys of the han as compared with the exquisite neatness of the japanese and the diligent thriftiness of the chinese korean agriculture is to some extent wasteful and untidy weeds are not kept down in the summer as they ought to be stones are often left on the ground and there is a raggedness about the margins of fields and dikes and a dilapidation about stone walls which is unpleasing to the eye the paths through the fields are apt to be much worn and fringed with weeds and the furrows are not so straight as they might be yet on the whole the cultivation is much better and the majority of the crops far cleaner than i had been led to expect domestic animals are very few and very little fertilizing material is applied to the ground except in the neighborhood of seoul and other cities a fact which makes its exceeding fertility very noteworthy the rainfall is abundant but not excessive and the desolating floods which afflict korea's opposite neighbor japan are as unknown as earthquakes irrigation is only necessary for rice which is the staple of korea except on certain rice lands two crops a year are raised throughout central and southern korea the rice being planted in june or rather transplanted from the nurseries in which it is sown in may and is harvested early in october when the ground is ploughed and barley or rye is sown 
which ripens in May or early June of the next year, after which water is let in, the field is again ploughed while flooded, and the rice plants are set out in rows of clumps, two or four or even six plants in a clump. Where only one crop is raised, the rice field lies fallow from the end of October till the following May. In wheat, barley or rye fields the sowing is in October, and the harvest in May or June, after which beans, peas and other vegetables are sown. Along the great roads, as the crops approach ripeness, elevated watch sheds are erected in the fields as safeguards against depredations. The crops, on the whole, are very fine, and would be immense were it not for the paucity of fertilizing material. Agricultural implements are rude and few. A wooden plowshare with a removable iron shoe is used, which turns the furrows the reverse way to ours. A wooden spade, also shod with iron, is largely used for heavy work. This, which excites the ridicule of foreigners as a gratuitous waste of manpower, is furnished with several ropes attached to the blade, each of which is jerked by a man, while another man guides the blade into the ground by its long handle. The other implements are the same sort of sharp-pointed sharp hoe, which is in use in China, and which in the hands of the eastern peasant fills the place of shovel, hoe and spade, a reaping hook, a short knife, a barrow, and a bamboo rake, which is largely used in the denudation of the hills. Grain, peas, and beans are threshed out with flails, as often as not in the roadway of a village, while the grinding of flour and the hulling of rice are accomplished by the stone quern and the stone or wooden mortar, with an iron pestle worked by hand or foot, the pang a or, as has been previously described, by a mull or water pang a Rice is threshed by beating the ears over a board, and all grain is winnowed by being thrown up in the wind. The pony is not used in agriculture. Ploughing is done by the powerful, noble, tractable Korean bull, a cane ring placed in his nostrils when young, rendering him manageable even by a young child. He is four years in attaining maturity, and is now worth from three to four pounds, his value having been enhanced by the late war and the prevalence of rinderpest in recent years. Milk is not an article of diet. In some districts, ox sleds of very simple construction are used for bringing down fuel from the hills and produce from the fields, and at Seoul and a few other cities, rude carts are to be seen, but ponies, men and bulls are the means of transport for produce and goods, the loads being adjusted evenly on wooden pack saddles or, in the case of small articles, in panniers of plaited straw or netted rope. In the latter, ingenuously made to open at the bottom and discharge their contents, manure is carried to the fields. Both bulls and ponies are shot with iron. The pony carries from 160 to 200 pounds. Sore backs are lamentably common. The breed of pigs is very small. Pigs are always black and loathsome. Their bristles stand up along their backs, and they are lean, active, and of specially revolting habits. The dogs are big, usually buff, long-haired, and cowardly, and caricature the Scotch collie in their aspect. The fowls are plebeian, and for wildness, activity, and powers of flight are unequalled in my experience. Ducks are not very common, and geese are kept chiefly as guards, and for presentation at weddings as emblems of fidelity. The few sheep bred in Korea are reserved for royal sacrifices. I have occasionally seen mutton on tables in Seoul, but it has been imported from Chefu. The villages which make their living altogether by agriculture are usually off the high roads, those which the hasty traveller passes through depending as much on the entertaining of wayfarers as on the cultivation of the land. 
In these, nearly every house has a covered shelf in front, at which food can be obtained, but lodging is not provided, and the villages which can feed and lodge beasts as well as men are few. The fact that the large farming villages are off the road gives an incorrect notion of the population of Korea. End of section 13「Section 14 of Korea and her neighbors」by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avahi in April 2021. Chapter 12 Along the Coast, Part 2 On the slope of a hillside above a pleasant valley lies the town of Anbyong, once judging from the extent of its decaying walls and fortifications and the height of its canopied but ruinous gate towers a large city the yamen and other government buildings are well kept and being in good repair are in striking contrast to those previously seen on the route the main street is however nothing but a dirty alley the town has a diminishing population and though it makes some paper from the Brusonetia papyrifera and has several schools and exchanges rice and beans for foreign cottons at one sun, it has a singularly decaying look and is altogether unworthy of its position as being one of the chief places in the province of Hamgyong. Outside of it the road crosses a remarkably broad river bed by a bridge 720 feet long, so dilapidated that the ponies put their feet through its rotten sorts several times. From Anbyong to Tarimak, a short distance from Namsan on the main road from Seoul to Wonsan, is a long and tedious ride through thinly peopled country and pine woods full of graves. We spent two nights there at a very noisy and disagreeable inn, in which privacy was unattainable and the vermin were appalling. There the host was specially unwilling to take in foreigners, on the ground that we should not pay, a suspicion which irritated our friendly Mapu, who vociferated at the top of their voices that we paid even for the smallest things we got. The swinging season was at hand, each amusement having its definite date for beginning and ending, and in every village swings were being erected on tall straight poles. Wong could never resist the temptation of taking a swing, which always amused the people. At this inn there were some musical performers, who made both night and day wearisome to me, but gave great pleasure to others. I have not previously mentioned my sufferings on the Han from the sounds produced by itinerant musicians, and by the Mutang or sorceress and her coadjutors, but, as has been forcibly brought out in a paper on Korean music by Mr. Halbert in the Korean Repository, the sounds are peculiar and unpleasing, because we neither know nor feel what they are intended to express, and we bring to Korean music not the Korean temperament and training, but the Western, which demands time as an essential. It may be added that the Koreans, like their neighbors the Japanese, love our music as little as we love theirs, and for the same reason that the ideas we express by it are unfamiliar to them. One reason of the afflictive and discordant sounds is that the gamut of Korea differs from the musical scale of European countries, with the result that whenever music seems to be trembling on the verge of a harmony, a discord assails the ear. The musical instruments are many, but they are not carefully finished. Among instruments of percussion are drums, cymbals, gongs, and a species of castanet. For wind instruments there are unkeyed bugles, flutes, and long and short trumpets, and the stringed instruments are a large guitar, a twenty-five-stringed guitar, a mandolin, and a five-stringed violin. The discord produced by a concert of several of these instruments is heard in perfection at the opening and closing of the gates of cities. 
There are three classes of Korean vocal music, the first being the Shi Jo or classical style, andante tremuloso and punctuated with drums, the drum accompaniment consisting mainly of a drum beat from time to time as an indication to the vocalist that she has quavered long enough upon one note. The shijo is a slow process and is said by the Koreans to require such long and patient practice that only the dancing girls can excel in it, as they alone have leisure to cultivate it. One branch of it deals with convival songs, of one of which I give a translation from the gifted pen of the Rev. H. B. Hulbert of Seoul. 1. Twas years ago that Kim and I struck hands and swore, however dry, the lip may be, or sad the heart, the merry wine should have no part in mitigating sorrow's blow or quenching thirst. Twas long ago. 2. And now I've reached the flood tide mark of life. The ebb begins and dark the future lowers. The tide of wine will never ebb. Twill I be mine to mourn the desecrated fane where that lost pledge of youth lays slain. 3. Nay, nay, be gone, the jocund bowl again shall bolster up my soul against itself. What good men hold, canst tell me where red wine is sold? Nay, just beyond that peach tree there, good luck be thine, I'll thither fare. The Korean, prisoned during the winter in his small, dark, dirty, and malodorous rooms, with neither a glowing fireside nor a brilliant lamp to mitigate the gloom, welcomes spring with lively excitement, and demands music and song as its natural accompaniment, song that shall express the emancipation, breathing space, and unalloyed physical pleasure which have no counterpart in our English feelings. Thus a classical song runs. The willow catkin bears the vernal blush of summer's dawn, when winter's night is done. The oriole who preens herself aloft on swaying bough is summer's harbinger. The butterfly with noiseness full full of her pulsing wing marks off the summer hour. Quick boy, thy zither. Does its strings accord? Tis well, strike up. I must have song. The second style of Korean vocal music is the ha chi, or popular. The most conspicuous song in this class is the ararung of 782 verses. It is said that the ararung holds to the Korean in music the same place that rice does in his food, all else being a mere appendage. The tune, but with the trills and quavers, of which there are one or two to each note left out, is given here, though Mr. Halbert, to whom I am greatly indebted, calls it a very weak attempt to score it. The chorus of Ararung is invariable, but the verses which are sung in connection with it take a wide range through the fields of lyrics, epics, and didactics. There is a third style, which is between the classical and the popular, but which hardly deserves mention. To my thinking, the melancholy which seems the motive of most oriental music becomes an extreme plaintiveness in that of Korea, partly due probably to the unlimited quavering on one note. While what may be called concerted music is torture to a western ear, Solos on the flute oft-times combine a singular sweetness with their mournfulness and suggest far-off melodies. Love songs are popular, and there is a tender grace about some of them, as well as an occasional glint of humour, as indicated by the last line of the third stanza of one translated by Mr. Gale. Love Song Farewells a fire that burns one's heart, and tears are rains that quench in part, but then the winds blow in one's sighs and cause the flames again to rise. 
my soul I've mixed up with the wine, and now my love is drinking, into his orifices nine, deep down its spirits sinking. To keep him true to me and mine, a potent mixture is the wine. Silvery moon and frosty air, eve and dawn are meeting. Widowed wild goose flying there, hear my words of greeting. On your journey should you see, him I love so broken-hearted, kindly say this word for me, that it's death when we are parted. Flapping off the wild goose clambers, says she will, if she remembers. Fill the inkstone, bring the water, to my love I'll write a letter. Ink and paper soon will see, the one that's all the world to me, while the pen and I together, left behind, condole each other. The allusions to nature generally show a quick and sympathetic insight into her beauties, and occasional stanzas, of which the one cited is among several translated by Mr. Halbert, have a delicacy of touch not unworthy of an Elizabethan poet. I asked the spotted butterfly to take me on his wing and fly to yonder mountain's breezy side, the tricksy tiger moths I'll ride as home I come. The Korean repository is doing a good work in making Korean poetry accessible to English readers. There was not, however, any flute music at Tarimak. There were classical songs with a direful drum accompaniment and the wearisome repetition of the Aradung, continuing all day and late into the hot night. A few peddlers passed by, selling tobacco, necessaries and children's toys, the latter rudely made and only attractive in a country in which artistic feeling appears dead. There are shops in Seoul, Pyongyang and other cities devoted to the sale of such toys, painted in staring colours and illustrative chiefly of adult life. There are also monkeys, puppies and tigers on wheels, all for boys, and soldiers in European uniforms have appeared during the recent military craze, and boys are very early taught to look forward to official life by representations of mandarin's chairs, red tasseled umbrellas and fringed hats. Girls being of comparatively small account, toys specially suited to them are not many. Japanese lucifer matches, which, when of the cheap sort, seem only slightly inflammable, as I have several times used a whole box without igniting one, were in the stock of the peddlers and are making rapid headway in the towns. But even so near one sun as Tarimak is, the people were still using flint and steel to light chips of wood dipped in sulphur, though the cheap and smoky kerosene lamp has displaced the tall, upright candlestick and the old-fashioned dish lamps there and in very many other country places. From the high road from Seoul to Wonsan, we diverged at Namsan to visit the large monastery of Sokwang Sa, famous as being the place where, in the palmy days of Korean Buddhism, Ataijo, the first king of the present dynasty, was educated and lived. The monastery itself, with its temples, was erected by this king to mark the spot where, 504 years ago, he received that supernatural message to rule, in virtue of which his descendant occupies the Korean throne today. In this singularly beautiful spot, Ataijo's early years were spent in religious exercises, study and preparation, and many of the superb trees which adorn the grand mountain clefts in which Sokwang Sa is situated are said to have been planted by his hands. His regalia and robes of state are preserved in a building by themselves, which no one is allowed to enter except the duly appointed attendant. A bridal track alongside of a clear mountain stream leads through very pretty and prosperous looking country, and over wooded foothills for some miles to the base of a fine mountain range. 
we passed for a length of time through rich and heavily timbered monastic property then the beautiful valley narrowed and by a red arrow gate we entered on a smooth broad road on which the sun glinted here and there through the heavy foliage of an avenue of noble pines a gap now and then giving entrancing glimpses of the deep delicious blue of the summer sky of a grand gorge dark with pines firs and the exotic clayera japonica and zelkava brightened by the tender green of maples and other deciduous trees and by flashes of foam from a torrent booming among great moss-covered boulders then came bridges with decorative roofs abbot's tombstones under carved and painted canopies inscribed stone tablets glorious views of a peaked forest-clothed mountain barring the gorge and as the pines of the avenue fell into groups at its close and magnificent selkavas from whose spreading branches white roses hung in graceful festoons overarched the road a long irregular line of temples and monastic buildings appeared clinging in singular picturesqueness to the sides of the ravine which there ascends somewhat rapidly towards the mountain which closes it an abbot framed in the doorway of a quaint building and looking like a picture of a portly jolly medieval friar welcomed us and he and his monks regaled us with honey water in the large guest hall but simultaneously produced a visitor's book and asked us how much we were going to pay the sum being duly recorded the grasping ways of these monks who fleeced the mapu so badly as to make them say they had fallen among thieves contrast with the friendly hospitality of their brethren of the diamond mountain and can only be accounted for by the contaminating influences of a treaty port from which they are distant only a long day's journey see the sights first and then pay they said the glorious views and the quaint picturesqueness of the monastic buildings clustering on the crags above the cataracts being the site par excellence it was refreshing to turn from the contemplation of the sensual acquisitive greedy faces of most of the monks to nature at her freshest and fairest on one of the loveliest days of early june the interiors of the temples are shabby and dirty the paint is scaling off the roofs and the floors and even the altars were hidden under layers of herbs drying for kitchen use besides the tablet to the first king of the present dynasty in a handsome tablet house the noteworthy sight to be seen is a small temple dedicated to the five hundred disciples sok wang sa is not a holy place and the artist who caricatured the devout and ascetic followers of the ascetic shakyamuni has bequeathed a legacy of unhallowed suggestion to its inmates the five hundred are stone images not a foot in height arranged round the dusty temple in several tiers each one with a silk cap on worn with more or less of a jaunty air on one side of the head or falling over the brow the variety of features and expression is wonderful all eastern nationalities are represented and there are not two faces or attitudes alike the whole display shows genius though not of a high order among the infinite variety one figure has deeply set eyes an aquiline nose and thin lips another a pug nose squinting eyes and a broad grinning mouth one is mongolian another caucasian and another approximates to the negro type here is a stout jolly fellow with a leer and a broad grin suggestive of casks of porter and the archaic london drayman there is an idiot with drooping head receding brow and chin and a vacant stare here again is a dark stage villain with red cheeks and a cap drawn low over his forehead then mr pecksniff confronts one with an air of sanctimoniousness obviously difficult to retain falstaff outdoes his legendary jollity 
and priests and monks of all nations leer at the beholders from under their jaunty caps. It is an exhibition of unsanctified genius. Nearly all the figures look worse for drink, and fatuous smiles, drunken leers, and farcical grins are the rule, the effect of all being aggravated by the varied and absurd arrangements of the caps. The grotesqueness is indescribable and altogether unedifying. It was a great change to get on the broad main road to Wonsan and to see telegraph poles once more. There was plenty of goods and passenger traffic across the fine plain covered with rice and grain, margined by bluffs and dotted with what have obviously once been islands near which Wonsan is situated. Where the road is broad, a high heap of hardened mud runs along the centre, with hardened mud corrugations on either side. Where narrow, it is merely the top of a rice dike. The bridges are specially infamous. In fact, they were so rotten that the Mapu would not trust their ponies upon them, and we forded all the streams. Yet this road, which I found equally bad at the three points at which I touched it, is one of the leading thoroughfares by which goods pass from the east to the west coast and vice versa. Tobacco, copper, salt fish, seaweed, galena and hides from the east, and foreign shirtings, watches, and miscellaneous native and foreign articles from the west. The heat of the sun was but poorly indicated by a shade temperature of 84 degrees, and it was in his full noontide fierceness that we reached a huddle of foul and narrow alleys and irregular rows of thatched shops along the high road which make up the busy and growing Korean town of Wonsan, which, with an estimated population of 15,000 people, lies along a strip of beach below a pine-clothed bluff and ranges of mountains, then green to their summits, but which I saw in December of the same year in the majesty of the snow which covers them from November to May. The smells were fearful, the dirt abominable, and the quantity of wretched dogs and of pieces of bleeding meat blackening in the sun perfectly sickening. This aspect of meat, produced by the mode of killing it, has made foreigners entirely dependent on the Japanese butchers in Seoul and elsewhere. The Koreans cut the throat of the animal and insert a peg in the opening. Then the butcher takes a hatchet and beats the animal on the rump until it dies. The process takes about an hour, and the beast suffers agonies of terror and pain before it loses consciousness. Very little blood is lost during the operation, the beef is full of it, and its heavier weight in consequence is to the advantage of the vendor. Then came a level stretch of about a mile, much planted with potatoes, glimpses of American Protestant mission houses in conspicuous and eligible positions, eligible, that is, for everything but mission work, and the uneven Korean road glided imperceptibly into a broad gravel road, fringed on both sides with neat wooden houses standing in gardens, which gradually thickened into the neatest, trimmest, and most attractive town in all Korea, the Japanese settlement of the treaty port of Wonsan, opened to Japanese trade in 1880 and to foreign trade generally in 1883. Broad and well-kept streets, neat wharves, trim and fairly substantial houses, showing the interior dollishness and daintiness characteristic of Japan, a large and very prominent Japanese consulate in Anglo-Japanese style, the offices of the NYK, the Japan Mail Steamship Company, an abbreviation as familiar to residents in the Far East as P&O, a Japanese bank of solid reputation, customs buildings, of which a neat reading room forms a part, neat Japanese shops where European articles can be bought at moderate prices, a large schoolhouse with a teacher in European dress, and active mannequins and hobbling but graceful women, neither veiled nor muffled up, are the features of this pleasant Japanese colony, 
which is so fortunate as to have no history its progress though not rapid having been placid and peaceful not marred by friction either with koreans or foreigners of other nationalities and even the recent war though it led to the removal of the chinese consul and his countrymen an insignificant fraction of the population had left no special traces except that the enormous wages paid to transport coolies by the japanese had enabled them to gamble with yen instead of cash i was most hospitably received by mr and mrs gale of the american presbyterian mission mr gale's work was the important one of the preparation of a dictionary of the korean language in korean chinese and english which was published in 1897. During the twelve days which I spent at Wonsan, I made a junk excursion in Yonghing or Broughton Bay, in the southwest corner of which the port is situated. It is a superb bay with an area of fully forty square miles, a depth of from six to twelve fathoms, with good holding ground, never freezes in winter, is sheltered by promontories and mountains from the winds of every quarter and its entrance is protected by islands to english readers it is probable that the sole interest of this fine bay lies in the fact that its northern arm port lazarev which was the object of my cruise is the harbour which russia is credited with desiring to gain possession of for the terminus of her trans-siberian railway whether this be so or no, or whether Port Chestakov on the same coast, but sixty miles farther north, is more defensible and better adapted for a naval as well as a terminal port, the time has gone by for grudging to Russia an outlet to the Pacific, and I for one should prefer it on the coast of eastern Korea than on the northern shore of the Yellow Sea. The head of Port Lazarev is about sixteen miles from Wonsan, and is formed by the swampy outlets of the river Dunggan, among the many branches of which lie inhabited, low-lying islands. There are rude but extensive salt works at the shallows in which this noble inlet terminates, after receiving several streams besides the Dunggan. Port Lazarev has, in addition, abundant supplies of water from natural springs the high hills which surround the bay are grassy to their summits but there is very little wood and the villages are small and far between game is singularly abundant pheasants are nearly as plentiful as sparrows are with us the wary turkey bustard abounds there are snipe in the late summer and pigeons plover and water hen are common in spring and autumn, wild fowl innumerable crowd the waters of every stream and inlet, swans, teal, geese, and ducks darkening the air, which they rend with their clamour as the sportsman invades their haunts. A Korean junk does not impress one by its seaworthiness, and it is not surprising that the junkmen hug the shore and seek shelter whenever a good sailing breeze comes on. She is built without nails, iron, or preservative paint, and looks rather like a temporary and fortuitous aggregation of beams and planks than a deliberate construction. Two tall, heavy masts fixed by wedges among the timbers at the bottom of the boat require frequent attention, as they are always swaying and threatening to come down. The sails are of matting, with a number of bamboos running transversely, with a cord attached to each, united into one sheet, by means of which tacking is effected, or rather, might be. Practically, navigation consists in running before a light breeze and dropping the mass of mats and bamboos on the confusion below whenever it freshens, varying the process by an easy pull at the sweeps, one at the stern, and two working on pins in transverse beams amidships, which project three feet on each side. The junk is fitted with a rudder of enormous size, which from its position acts as a keel board. The price is from sixty to eighty dollars. 
this singular craft sails well before the wind, but under other circumstances is apt to become unmanageable. One son has telegraphic communication with Seoul, and, chiefly through the enterprise of the NYK, it is connected by most comfortable streamers with Korean ports and with Vladivostok, Kobe, and Nagasaki, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Chefu, Nuchwang, and Tientsin. Steamers of a Russian line call there at intervals during the summer season. There are no Western merchants or Western residents except the missionaries and the customs staff, and foreign trade is chiefly in the hands of the Japanese. About sixty li from one sun are some large grass-covered mounds, of which the Koreans do not care to speak, as they regard them as associated with an ancient Korean custom, now looked upon as barbarous. During the last dynasty, and more than five centuries ago, it was customary, when people from age and infirmity became burdensome to their relations, to incarcerate them in the stone cells which these mounds contain, with a little food and water, and leave them there to die. In similar mounds, elsewhere in Korea, bowls and jars of coarse pottery have been found, as well as a few specimens of grey celadon. There is nothing sensational about Wonsan. Footnote. In January of 1897, the population of Wonsan was as follows. Japanese, 1,299. Chinese, 39. American, 8. German, 3. British, 2. French, 2. Russian, 2. Danish, 1. Norwegian, 1. Total, 1,357. Estimated Korean population, 15,000. End footnote. It has no booms in trade or land, but keeps the even tenor of its way. It is to me far the most attractive of the treaty ports. Its trim Japanese settlement, from which green hills rise abruptly, backed by fine mountain forms, dignified by snow for seven months of the year, and above all the exquisite caves to the northwest, where the sea murmurs in cool grottoes and beats the pure white sand into ripples at the feet of cliffs hidden by flowers, ferns, and grass, and its air of dreamy repose, a land where it is always afternoon, point to its future as that of a salubrious and popular sanitarium. End of section 14